preface of Life of Dorothea Lind Dix. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. Life of Dorothea Lind Dix by Francis Tiffany. Preface. The question has very naturally been raised why, heretofore, no attempt should have been made at an adequate biography of Dorothea Lynde Dix. In fact, why, except for a few brief accounts of her career, printed in magazines, read before private clubs, or inserted in encyclopedias, no real information is to be had about her. Here is a woman who, as the founder of vast and enduring institutions of mercy in America and in Europe, has simply no peer in the annals of Protestantism. To find her parallel in this respect, it is necessary to go back to the lives of such memorable Roman Catholic women as St. Teresa of Spain or Santa Chiara of Assisi and to the amazing work they did in founding throughout European Christendom great conventual establishments. Why, then, do the majority of the present generation know little or nothing of so remarkable a story? It was from no lack of pressure on the part of admirers and venerators of the character and work of so exceptional a woman that this came about. The invincible obstacle lay in her own positive refusal to permit anything to be written of her. Living to the advanced age of 85, and never pausing in her career of beneficent activity till fully 80, she cherished all the disdain of the heroic soldier setting out on ever-fresh campaigns at the thought of quitting the post of present duty to look after the luster of past laurels. Not in the winning of laurels, but in the succor of human misery, lay the dominating purpose of her life. A woman of great pride and dignity of character, fully conscious, too, of the immensity of the work she had achieved on two continents, she yet shrank in utter aversion from what seemed to her the degradation of mere public notoriety. Two equally strong but totally contrasted natures lay in her. The one, the outcome of a sensitive, suffering temperament, instinctively seeking to shield itself from gall or wound, the other born of the fortitude of a martyr in fronting danger, loneliness, and obloquy in championing the cause of the friendless and ready to perish. To all this must be added a depth of self-abnegating religious faith which made her life one long struggle to prostrate a spirit naturally proud and imperious at the footstool of God in the lowly cry, Not unto me, not unto me, but unto thy name be the praise. As far back as in 1851, Mrs. Sarah J. Hale, then engaged on a book to be titled Lives and Characters of Distinguished Women, applied to Miss Dix for data from which to write an account of her career. To this, as to numberless like appeals, Miss Dix replied in the following strain, so indicative of her persistent feeling in the matter. Quote, I feel it right to say to you frankly that nothing could be undertaken which would give me more pain and serious annoyance, which would so trespass on my personal rights or interfere more seriously with the real usefulness of my mission. I am not ambitious of nominal distinctions, and notoriety is my special aversion. 
My reputation and my services belong to my country. My history and my affections are consecrated to my friends. It will be soon enough when the angel of the last hour shall have arrested my labors to give their history and their results. This period cannot be many years distant. I confess that giving unnecessary publicity to women while they yet live and to their works seems to me singularly at variance with the delicacy and modesty which are the most attractive ornaments of their sex. End quote. For years following, such ardent friends as Honorable Alexander Randall of Annapolis, Maryland, General John A. Dix of New York, and Reverend William G. Elliott, D.D. of St. Louis, importuned her not to suffer such a life story to die with her. Footnote. Though always beginning his letters to her with dear sister, no traceable relationship existed between Miss Dix and General John A. Dix. Miss Dix's admiration, however, was always great for the man who united such varied qualities as those of the pure statesman, the brave soldier, who made the country ring with his, quote, if any man haul down the American flag, shoot him on the spot, end quote. And the Christian scholar who gave the world such devout and beautiful translations of medieval Latin hymns. And footnote. Both Mr. Randall and Dr. Eliot themselves offered to write out a detailed memorial of her career if only she would dictate to them the leading incidents and supply the needful papers. But she had no time nor inclination to turn aside. Years later, however, when extreme old age had rendered the further prosecution of her labors an impossibility, both Mr. Randall and General Dix renewed their entreaties and succeeded in extracting a half-promise from her to make out needful memoranda and reduce the confused mass of her papers to some kind of chronological order. Thus, in June 1878, a letter from General Dix to Mr. Randall bears witness to the earnestness with which they were cooperating towards this mutually desired end. Quote, Seafield, West Hampton, New Jersey, June 25th, 1878. My dear sir, I wrote to Miss Dix, urging her to make full notes of what she had done for the insane. There is no record like hers. I do not accept Howard or Mrs. Fry, and it is due to our country to give a faithful account of the labors of her life. I have pressed this duty on her for years, and trust your solicitations and those of other friends may decide her to perform it. Very truly yours, John A. Dix. End quote. Still later on, Mr. Randall writes urgently to Miss Dix to know what progress has been made toward the fulfillment of the promise given. Quote, how comes on the memoir of Miss Dix? You owe it to our country properly to attend to it yourself. I know you will not charge me with flattery when I say that if any other female in the country had accomplished half as much as you, you would have procured her life to be written or written it yourself. Pardon my plainness and repeated request and urgency in this matter, for I do really think such a life as yours has not filled up its measure of practical good until posterity has the benefit of its example. End quote. Two short extracts from replies of mystics to such letters of Mr. Randall's as the above will suffice to show how baffling to her mind was this whole biographical matter. Quote, Boston, Mass., October 13, 1870. 
I assure you of my respect for your opinions, and desire to accept and act upon your request, if I can feel quickened to this burthensome undertaking. There is, I think, great difficulty in writing of oneself. It is almost impossible to present subjects where the chief actor must be conspicuous and not seem to be or really be egotistical. Then much of my work has been where neglects and omissions demanded remonstrance and persistent efforts for reforms and amended usages, implying much wrong on the part of others, who must be at the least noticed as blameworthy through either habitual negligence or willful wrong. End quote. Quote, Trenton, New Jersey, May 10th, 1880. I have found myself pressed under the obligation of a promise to yourself, at once honorable to fulfill, and yet most difficult and oppressive to carry forward. It is impossible for anyone to realize how painful it is to rouse from within a half-century's painful past, embracing every form and condition of distress, suffering, misery, and adversity. Language seems to lose force in words to define weakly what has been and now is in the present hour as in the expired years. I cannot, my valued friend, bring into order suitably for a brief memoir any written details that seem to me fitly to convey to any reader what cannot be realized, because there is no relative standard of contrast or comparison. The whole of my years, from the age of ten to the present, differ essentially from the experience and pursuits of those around me." End quote. Yet one more ground of reluctance on the part of Miss Dix to having any record of her life given to the world must here in conclusion be noted. It was one frequently emphasized by her, and is too characteristic alike of the pity of her heart and of her habitual way of looking on her own exceptional history to be omitted. Such an account, she feared, would exert an unhealthy influence in inducing romantic young women to think it their mission to undertake some work of a similar kind. No, let them fall in love, marry, and preside over a happy home, she would say. It will be a thousand times better for them. She, who had never known the meaning of home, even in childhood, who had led a lonely and wandering life, who had carried ever in her heart an unsatisfied yearning after those closer ties which unite human beings in the heaven of tender family relations. She, too, who, in her redeeming career of half a century, had sounded all the depths of human misery— and knew how stern the conflict and cruel the wounds inevitable in a lifelong struggle to secure redress felt, as none who had not shared the like experience could feel, that nothing short of an irresistible call from God should induce anyone to embark on such a work. The result of these persistent solicitations was that toward the very close of her life, when well-nigh helpless with disease, Miss Dix made faltering attempts to reduce her papers to order. She was then too feeble for the task, and they were left in a state of great confusion. Shortly before her death, however, she gave to her trusted friend and executor, Mr. Horace A. Lamb of Boston, her full consent that if such remained his final judgment, the papers might be used in the preparation of a memoir of her life and work. Unfortunately, in what must be regarded as a mistaken sense of the duty of self-effacement, she had previously issued positive commands to her many friends to destroy her own private letters. 
A few of these friends happily refused to obey the injunction, and to their pious care for her memory it is alone due that any vivid picture can at this date be drawn of her. The writer of her biography would take this occasion to express his sense of great personal obligation to Miss Augusta I. Appleton of the Boston Athenaeum and to Miss Catherine H. Stone for their patient and discriminating labor in reducing the original chaos of the papers to any kind of manageable order. Also, to the superintendents of insane asylums in many quarters of the United States and of Canada, especially to Dr. John S. Butler, Dr. John W. Ward, Dr. Charles H. Nichols, and Dr. Horace A. Butolph, to Daniel Hack Took, M.D., F.R.C.P., of Hanwell, England, and to William Rathbone, Esquire, M.P. of Liverpool, as well as to numerous private friends of Miss Dix. He would here record his cordial thanks for constant courtesy and invaluable aid. F. T. Cambridge, Mass., February 16th, 1890. End of Preface Chapter One of Life of Dorothea Lind Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Birth and Ancestry. Though by ancestry and subsequent education a Massachusetts woman, Dorothea, christened Dorothy Lind Dix was born April 4th, 1802, in the state of Maine. Her birth occurred during a temporary stay of her parents in the town of Hampton, on the Penobscot River, one, in fact, of the very many places in which her father, who was of an unstable and wandering turn of mind, appears for a short time to have lived. Indeed, this instability of character on the part of Joseph Dix, the father, together with the frequent changes of residence and occupation it involved, makes it impossible to trace with any precision the various stages of the early childhood of his later so remarkable daughter. Glimpses of this childhood are lighted on at various spots in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, as well as in Worcester and Boston, Massachusetts. So painful, however, to the subsequent woman always remained the memory of its bitterness that in no hour of the most confidential intimacy could she be induced to unlock the silence which to the very end of life she maintained as to all the incidents of her early days as throwing light on the development of character in a woman of the ultimate stamp of mystics it becomes necessary to hint at least at the peculiar nature of the trials to which she was so early subjected there were the trials that inevitably follow in the track of a shiftless aimless and wandering life poverty lack of public respect the absence of permanency of relation with schools churches and a circle of endeared and sympathetic friends among the abnormal tendencies of the father was one of subjection to states of fanatical religious excitement during which he became wholly engrossed in writing and issuing tracts the supreme importance of which to the world's salvation outweighed in his mind every question of the material maintenance and needful education of his family these tracts the little dorothy then twelve years old and for the time being in worcester massachusetts was to save expense set so continuously to pasting and stitching together that in her revolt at the hateful task 
so this seemingly authentic story has come down, she ran away from Worcester and put herself under the protection of her grandmother, then resident in Boston. A proud, ambitious, and high-spirited child, her paternal grandmother living in considerable wealth and dignity, she appears to have suffered much the same misery of humiliation at being cut off from advantages of education and kept at menial tasks which charles dickens so painfully analyzes in the picture he draws of his own boy apprenticeship in the blacking factory thus the acute sensitiveness of fibre and high sense of personal dignity so characteristic of the mature woman were manifest from the very start very early in life then was the self-reliant and indomitable nature of the child rudely awakened to the necessity of resolutely fronting the world and fighting her way on her own resources in seeking refuge in her grandmother's house she saw the only chance open to her of securing a fit education she had at this time a much younger brother born ten years later than herself toward whom she felt the duty would surely devolve on her of becoming protectress and child mother the first step to the possibility of this lay in achieving independence for herself a conviction increased in strength when in the following year another brother was born break through these trammels of poverty and humiliation she must force her way out to some pecuniary basis she must eager for knowledge ambitious for more refined and intellectual social opportunities loaded down already with a premature sense of responsibility thus early had the iron entered her soul and the conviction been developed in her of the reality and sharpness of the battle of life from what ancestral source then it is natural to ask had descended to the child this self-reliant will this indomitable resolve to open up for herself a career of her own, together with so high wrought a sense of moral obligation. All the more natural is it to ask this question, seeing that her immediate parents were lacking in energetic fiber. Very common is it to notice that salient family traits overleap one entire generation, only to reappear in renewed force in the generation following. Emphatically was this the case in the instance before us. The paternal grandfather and grandmother of Dorothea were persons of very marked characteristics, characteristics which in a more refined and spiritualized shape and enlisted in the service of an impassioned idea took higher through kindred shape in the grandchild. These furnished the vigorous native stock into which evolving providence was to engraft scions capable of more sweetly perfumed flowers and of fruit of a richer flavor. Dr. Elijah Dix, the grandfather, was born August 24th, 1747, in Watertown, Massachusetts, of sound old New England stock, but poor, as were most children of large families in the colonial days, he had his own way to make in the world. Struggling doughtily for such desultory education as he could secure, his aspirations were none the less high and to be satisfied with nothing short of fitting himself for one of the learned professions, as in those days theology, law, and medicine were, perhaps we should now think somewhat humorously, termed. A college career he could not compass, effecting, however, an arrangement with Dr. John Green, an eminent practitioner in Worcester. He spent with him three years, 
engaged in compounding medicines and studying the theoretical part of the profession. And after supplementing this term with two more years under William Greenleaf, druggist of Boston, he began practice in 1770 as physician and surgeon in Worcester. The characteristics of the young man eminently fitted him for worldly success. Strong in body, courageous and self-asserting in temperament, ambitious of power and position, nothing daunted him. And yet, along with these qualities, whose aggressive excess rendered him highly unpopular, he united a large degree of public spirit and of far-sighted practical judgment. As he rose to position and could make his influence felt, he was the first man in Worcester to advocate by precept and example the planting of shade trees for the adornment of the town. A remarkable idiosyncrasy of taste, it was thought, at a period in our colonial history when in the weary struggle of the early settlers with the primeval forests, a tree was looked upon as as natural an enemy of man as a bear or an Indian. He was further a zealous promoter of all means of opening up the country for freer trade and social intercourse, as notably in the instance of the Worcester and Boston Turnpike. Those were the days when the title of Pontifex Maximus meant something, and was not worn as an idle badge of honor by emperors and popes. As an instance, moreover, of his sturdy honesty, it may be stated that, at the end of the Revolutionary War, he crossed the ocean to settle his financial accounts with his former associate in medical practice, Dr. Sylvester Gardiner and to pay over what he considered fairly the due of his partner. This Dr. Gardner had, at the outbreak of disturbance with the mother country, taken the royalist side, and so been forced, as a refugee, to flee the colony. As a staunch patriot, Dr. Dix might have felt himself entirely absolved from handing over a penny to one whom it was only needful to stigmatize as a traitor. As an honest man, however, he did not feel himself thus absolved. Returning home from England with a large collection of books, surgical instruments, and chemical apparatus, Dr. Dix now engaged in the sale of such articles pursued his medical practice, and projected with great ardor the plan of an academy. In spite, however, of acknowledged ability and public spirit, his dictatorial ways made him so unpopular with his fellow citizens that a plot was laid to drive him out of town, or at any rate to subject him to personal violence. Suspecting what was on foot, he, at the first sign of practical action, proved himself entirely equal to the emergency. One evening, a man called at his house to summon him to the sick bed of a pretended patient, living several miles out of town, and on the road to whose house, as later appeared, an attacking party had placed itself in ambush. The sturdy doctor promptly expressed his professional willingness to go, taking the precaution, however, to throw open the window and call out in stentorian tones to his manservant, "'Bring round my horse at once. See that the pistols in my holsters are double-shotted. Then give the bulldog a piece of raw meat and turn him loose to go along.'" It is needless to say that the friend of the imaginary sick man folded his tents like the Arabs and silently stole away. With the view of opening up to himself a still wider field of activity, Dr. Elijah Dix, in 1795, seven years before the birth of Dorothea, removed to Boston, 
where he established a drug store on the south side of Fannel Hall and further founded in South Boston chemical works for refining sulfur and purifying camphor. Successful in these enterprises, his indomitable energy next sought vent in large land speculations in the state of Maine, in which state he purchased immense tracts, buying in one instance 20,000 acres for the site of a single projected farming village and becoming founder of the towns of Dixmont and Dixfield, the settlers in which obtained the titles to their farms from him. This diversion of interests on the part of Dr. Elijah Dix henceforth necessitated his making frequent journeys to Maine to see after his property there, on one of which visits he died. His death occurred on June 7, 1809, and his body was interred in the burial ground near Dixmont Center. Thus easily is the birth of his granddaughter Dorothea in Hamden, Maine, accounted for. Hamden lies at but a short distance from Dixmont, and was then the only town in the section of sufficient size to furnish decent quarters. No doubt Dr. Elijah Dix had attempted to make his son Joseph his agent for overseeing and disposing of the main lands. The salient traits, then, of the character of Dr. Elijah Dix were indomitable energy and spirit of initiative in new enterprises, fertility of resource, dogged honesty, large public spirit, and a masterful temperament that would ride over obstacles no matter at what cost of personal popularity. Though but seven years old when her grandfather died, Dorothea always retained a vivid remembrance of what she saw of him in Boston in her childhood, particularly of his fondness for driving her around with him in his chaise, and of talking with her in his strong and racy way. He stood out on the one bright spot in her earliest memories, implanting in her mind a lifelong admiration for his robust and picturesque qualities. Indeed, of the many great asylums for the insane which she was later instrumental in founding, the only one she ever permitted to be associated with her own name was Dixmont Hospital in Pennsylvania a concealed tribute to her grandfather as founder of the town of Dixmont, Maine. After the death of Dr. Elijah Dix, his widow lived on in Boston, occupying the, for those days, quite stately house which went by the name of the Dix Mansion. It was in the large garden surrounding this house that from some chance seed sprang the celebrated Dick's pear, one of those Melchizedek's in pomology, without father and without mother, which, like the far-famed Seckel, originated from the start an illustrious family of its own. Here, then, continued to reside the widow of Dr. Elijah Dix, who was destined to survive her husband twenty-eight years dying only at the late date of April 29th, 1837. As one whose personal qualities and peculiar position as head of the house exercised in many ways a marked influence on the development of her granddaughter, it is necessary briefly to speak of her prominent characteristics. Dorothy Lind, born May 23rd, 1746, and married October 1st, 1771, to Dr. Elijah Dix, was the daughter of Joseph Lind, who, after the burning of Charleston, Mass., by the British troops, sought refuge with his wife and children in Worcester. Already far advanced in life, when, at the age of twelve, her granddaughter became a member of her family, Madame Dix was a typical example of the New England Puritan gentlewoman of the period. Dignified, precise, 
inflexibly conscientious, unimaginative, and without trace of emotional glow or charm. For generations, indeed, it had been the outcome of the Puritan training of New England to produce a class of mothers unflinchingly nerved, if need be, to die at the stake for their children, but whom no threat of penal fires would have betrayed into the weakness of kissing them good night. And as these mothers duly advanced to the dignified stage of grandmothers, the tendency became ever more sharply accentuated. Indeed, for simple emotional love, as a fountain leaping up in sallies of playful tenderness, the majority of the parents of those now far away days in which Madame Dix had received the earliest stamp of the chilled steel parental die shared no more sympathetic a response than a mill engineer for the poetry of the charming cascades of the stream he seeks to utilize for grinding the corn and weaving the cloth of the people. To save waste of available power and to divert the full emotional flow into a strong banked prosaic raceway, from which the full head could be turned on to the practical work of making the jackets and knitting the socks of the young, of training them to habits of rigid industry, the exacting iron diligence over the school lessons, and of inculcating the dogmas of the catechism in a way to make them a salutary terror for life, this seemed the only aspect of the divine quality of love which could be reconciled with a severe sense of duty and saved from the fatal danger of degenerating into luxurious and enervating sentimentalism. There were good sides to this extreme, and there were very bad ones. It ensured a Spartan discipline of education which put bark and iron into the blood, but it steadily atrophied, and as years advanced, actually ossified the lovelier and sunnier capacities of affection, opening up an impassable abyss between old age and the sensitive, clinging heart of childhood. To Madame Dix, then, and to the old Dix mansion, the child Dorothea owed, on the one hand, a debt of lasting obligation, and on the other, years of acute suffering and heart starvation. When she sought refuge from the unendurable humiliation of her life in Worcester, it was to her grandmother's house that she came, and here she secured the advantages of several years of school education. It was a grim and joyless home, but nonetheless it was a home in which she was trained to habits of unremitting diligence. No waste of time was permitted, no task allowed to be done in a slipshod way. Here was a child, the grandmother felt, who would have her own way to make in the world, and who, as early as possible, would have to become the mainstay of her family. She must fit herself, then, for some occupation by which she could win her bread. It would be cruelty to bring her up with any other idea. In all this, Madame Dix unquestionably felt that she was fulfilling the whole law of love, and doing unto another as she at least ought to desire that another should do unto her. Still, to the child who was immature enough to crave a little play, a little petting, and a little romance, the process seemed, no doubt, very chilling and severe. In later life, people come to be grateful for many things which in childhood looked only hard and cruel. The day was to arrive when Miss Dix, in her watchful supervision of vast institutions for the relief of human misery, institutions in which failure in the minutest detail of organization might lead to the most tragic results, was to prove the invaluable benefit of this minute and rigid training. 
stern and unrelenting as it was, the grandmother had, after all, an ideal of her own as to the thoroughness with which every piece of work should be done, which was a true ideal. Indeed, there still lives in Massachusetts a lady who, after the school was later on established in the old Dick's mansion, as will soon be recounted, describes as one of the most indelible memories of her own childhood days how, as an especial reward for excellence in moral conduct, she herself was allowed the unusual privilege of making an entire shirt under the Radamanthan eye of Madame Dix. The sense of moral responsibility precipitated on the poor child was literally crushing, as now first the startling revelation broke on her mind of the eternal distinction between the right way and the wrong way in the minutest particulars, of the thousands of stitches entering into the awe-inspiring structure not one must differ from another to a degree that could be detected by a micrometer. The one and only immutably correct way of cutting and fitting the neckband seemed far more out of the range of mortal possibility than the camel's passage through the eye of a needle. And yet to this day the lady frankly admits that well-nigh fatal as the strain proved at the time, the benefit was lifelong of having thus been made to do at least one piece of work thoroughly well. Indeed, she still speaks of the experience in the same vein of enthusiastic gratitude in which here and there a veteran scholar descants on the intellectual bark and iron put into him by the inexorable discipline of the classics, and the heroic days when, in the eyes of the Latin master, a misplaced particle in a sentence was as unpardonable a sin as was, in the eyes of Madame Dix, a misplaced stitch in a shirt. Meanwhile, the passionate, craving heart of the child had to get along as best it could. She had her bread, though it was often wet with salt tears. She had shelter, education, and oversight. The oversight no doubt bestowed in her what was felt to be absolute fidelity to the clearest sense of duty. But as for a warm breast and loving arms in which to nestle and confide, this the kind heavens did not grant her. In bitter intensity of grief, would she at times in later life break out over this irremediable loss in her childhood days. I never knew childhood, she would passionately exclaim, and it was true. To become independent in means, to educate herself for a position that would command support and respect, to be able to get her two younger brothers under the same roof with her, and enact the part of child-mother to them. This early developed into the indomitable purpose of her life. There was, in those days, but one career of independence a growing girl could look forward to, the vocation of the teacher. Happily, preparation for this calling was in the line of the deepest instincts of her nature. These were at that time thirst for knowledge and longing to exert direct moral influence. The first authentic date of any attempt at teaching on the part of the ardent young girl is her opening a school for little children in Worcester, Mass. in 1816-17. to 17. She was then 14 years old and so girlish in look that, as she herself tells the story, she thought it necessary to put on long skirts and lengthen the sleeves of her dress so as to command due respect by a more adult appearance. There still lives in Worcester one of those pupils who vividly recalls the child teacher as tall for her age, easily blushing, at once beautiful and imposing in manner, but inexorably strict in discipline. 
the skirt and sleeves of a grown woman were, this lady thinks, in no way necessary to secure for the young girl absolute ascendancy over her pupils. She bore the stamp of authority from the start. Herself brought up in a stern school, she had at that date little idea of any government but the government of will. Indeed, it is always characteristic of very young people, abruptly forced to play the role of maturity and experience, that they overdo things. They show this fault in teaching their younger brothers and sisters at home, and they fall into it in a still more pronounced way when, on taking charge of a school, they think it incumbent on them, as perhaps it is, to assert themselves from the outset. Thus, the impression left on the minds of the little girls and boys in Worcester by their fourteen-year-old teacher, so far from being that of a half-grown girl they could venture to trifle with, was that of one of whom they stood in fear. In truth, now first manifested itself the instinctive consciousness of a nature born to rule, and seizing the first swift and ready way into what a furnace of pain and affliction that nature was to be baptized before it could be duly refined and tempered, through what years of lonely wrestlings, battle with disease, submission of an iron will to the counsels of a holier might it was to pass before she should become fitted to rule as justly and yet imperially as she finally came to rule. All this lay happily hidden from her in the womb of the slowly unfolding future. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Frances Tiffany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Begins Teaching in Boston. For several years after the experiment with the child's school in Worcester in 1816-17, to 17, Miss Dix appears to have lived with her grandmother in Boston, her leisure devoted to carrying on her own studies and preparation for opening a school for older pupils. Though then but a town of 40,000 inhabitants, Boston was already giving signs of an intellectual ferment in theology, philanthropy, philosophy, and literature, which was to inaugurate a new epoch in the spiritual history of New England. The day of provincialism was passing away. Higher ideals of God and of human destiny were breaking in, and young and ardent minds, emancipating themselves from the cramping traditions of the past, already felt that the long, weary sojourn in the wilderness was over, and that, standing at last on Pisgah, they could overlook a veritable land of promise. None entered more earnestly into certain phases of the spiritual rebirth or hailed more rapturously its prophets of the type of Channing than did mystics. Not probably before the year 1821 did she resume the actual work of teaching, beginning with classes of day pupils in a little house of her grandmother's in Orange Court, and only by degrees, raising the standard till the modest beginning finally developed into a combined boarding and day school in the Dix mansion itself, to which children were sent from the most prominent families in Boston, as well as from towns as far away as then was Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Later on, she was to have her younger brothers with her under the same roof and was to become practical mistress of the Dix mansion. The increasing infirmities of the grandmother now kept her largely confined to her own room, and added care of no slight nature. 
thus by degrees were devolved upon the never strong young woman the duties of housekeeper, teacher, motherly elder sister, and matron of the boarding pupils, together with the necessity of carrying on her own as yet imperfect intellectual training, duties which she assumed with unflinching spirit. Fond of responsibility, ambitious of success, and on fire with an ideal of what a teacher might prove, for time and for eternity, to the children committed to her care, she took no thought of flesh and blood. Seemingly, responsibilities so arduous as these would have been enough to satisfy the most exacting conscience. In Miss Dix's case, however, there was one imperious element of her nature which they altogether failed to content. More and more evident will it grow, as this narrative proceeds, that the sense of pitiful compassion for the ignorant, degraded, and suffering was the strongest element in her being. She would work for herself now, for work she must. She would work for her younger brothers till they were ready to go forth and do for themselves. But the moment she should stand free, then beyond all things the nearest and dearest of God's privileges to her would be the championship of the outcast and ready to perish." Soon, therefore, besides the school already taxing to exhaustion her strength, she establishes another in a room over the stable of the Dick's mansion for poor and neglected children. How pitifully she had to plead for permission to do this comes out touchingly in the following letter, so full of the spirit of merciful humanity than first beginning its struggle with that older, inflexible temper of Puritanism, which had submissively waited on adult conversion to repair in an hour the results of years of indifference and neglect. The letter is without date, but belongs early in the school-keeping days. Quote, My dear grandmother, had I the saint-like eloquence of our minister, I would employ it in explaining all the motives and dwelling on all the good, good to the poor, the miserable, the idle, and the ignorant, which would follow your giving me permission to use the barn chamber for a schoolroom for charitable and religious purposes. You have read Hannah Moore's life, you approve of her labors for the most degraded of England's paupers. Why not, when it can be done without exposure or expense, let me rescue some of America's miserable children from vice and guilt? Do, my dear grandmother, yield to my request, and witness next summer the reward of your benevolent and Christian compliance. Your affectionate granddaughter, D. L. Dix. End quote. Like the feeble beginnings in another upper chamber in Judea, this early attempt at stretching out a helping hand to outcast children was to lead on to far reaching results. The little barn school proved the nucleus out of which, years later, was developed the beneficent work of the Warren Street Chapel, from which, as a center, spread far and wide a new ideal of dealing with childhood. Their first was interest excited in the mind of Rev. Charles Bernard, a man of positive spiritual genius in charming and uplifting the children of the poor and debased with all the love of St. Vincent de Paul in his heart, and a fund of originality and devising happy ways and means, the words of Jesus, Suffer the little children to come unto me, were the very breath of his life. And when the children gladly responded, it was not to find themselves tormented with rigid catechizing and a cast-iron drill, but to be taken into open arms of love, 
and to be ushered into a new world of beauty and freedom. In the year 1823, Miss Dix began a correspondence to be continued at intervals for fifty years with a dear friend, Miss Anne Heath of Brookline, Mass., but for the preservation of which no adequate picture could be drawn of the early womanhood of the young teacher. It is to an endeared few alone that personalities of the inborn reticence of Miss Dix are ever able to reveal their inner life. And yet so very great is oftentimes the contrast between the maturer bearing of characters marked by commanding practical ability and the life of the same persons in the romantic period of youth, that but for some such revelation the hiding place of their power would go unsurmised. Indeed, the standing marvel of psychological history lies in the imperceptible steps by which so often the sighs and tears of sentimental feeling lead on to the masterly self-control and disciplined strength of advancing years. These letters furnish, then, but one more illustration of the fact that a certain even perilous excess of sensibility will be found at the root of all natures that ever achieve anything high and heroic in life. Emphatically did all this hold true of the youth of the subject of this biography. Self-repressed and self-mastered as later on she outwardly fronted the world, inwardly her soul was in those days full to the brim of passion and heartbreak of poetic enthusiasm and religious exultation in truth for some years to come the chief faults of her character are directly traceable to this her demands on herself her demands on her friends her demands on her pupils were out of all bounds she herself must be pure spirit, taking no counsel of flesh and blood. Her friends must be incarnations of every attribute of intellect and every grace of soul. In her pupils she must detect, in embryo at least, the prophecy of the coming ideal mothers and saintly helpers of the world. And so the inevitable reaction from such overwrought expectations was subjection to hours of bitter dissolution and even of passionate, unjust censure of average, commonplace mortality. As tending to foster excess of sentimental feeling, it is here of importance to note the habit, in those days indulged in by young women, of voluminous effusive correspondence with one another. Their letters, without date and without distinct reference to anything in time or space that would enable a future bewildered biographer to affix to them a local habitation and a name, wandered off into realms of purely subjective poetry, philanthropy, philosophy, and religion. And yet, what intensity of inward life these letters reveal. Anything was enough to start one of them. The death of an infant. A peculiarly beautiful sunset. A new volume of poetry. An inspiring or heart-searching passage in the sermon of the previous Sunday. And then would they roll on through literally continental sheets of paper, to all the length and with all the volume of the Mississippi. Far easier is it to give an idea of the character of these letters by example than by description. The method of illustration by extracts is of course exposed to the danger of conveying entirely erroneous impressions of brevity. Nonetheless, it may impart a sense of the spirit of these copious interchanges of thought and feeling. First, then, let the following serve as a commentary on the intensity 
with which poetry was in those days read by passionate young women. Those days of comparatively few books, in which a new poet was a fresh visitant from the celestial sphere. The L. E. L., to whom reference is made, is Letitia Elizabeth Landon, a young Englishwoman, whose strains of tender melancholy and romantic sentiment were marked by a degree of real power, which under severer training might have given her a permanent place in literature. The letter from which the extract is made was written to Miss Heath near midnight, presumably in 1823. Quote, Dear Annie, You say I weep easily. I was early taught to sorrow, to shed tears, and now, when sudden joy lights up or any unexpected sorrow strikes my heart, I find it difficult to repress the full and swelling tide of feeling. Even now, though alone and with no very exciting cause of joy or grief, I am paying my watery tribute to the genius of L. E. L. Oh, Anne, she is a poetess that expresses all the genius and fire of Byron, unalloyed with his gross faults. All the beautiful flow of words which fall like music on the air from the pen of Moore, without his little less than half-concealed consciousness, all the simplicity of Wordsworth without his prosiness and stiffness. Finally, in the words of her reviewer, if she never excels what she already has written, we can confidently give her the assurance of what the possessor of such talents must earnestly covet, immortality. The improvisatress will soon be published in this country, and then Anne prepare for the enjoyment of this rich feast. I worship talents almost. I sinfully dare mourn that I possess them not. It is not that I may win the world's applause that I would possess a mind above the common sphere, but that I might revel in the luxury of those mental visions that must hourly entrance a spirit that partakes less of earth than heaven. I shall try to feel and to act better, but I cannot cease to lament. Good night, Thea. End quote. No one can read a letter like this, crude as it is in expression, a letter written at midnight, her only hour of leisure, by a young woman who, in ill health, was bearing so exhausting a burden without feeling the fierce pulse-beat of an inspiring nature, which read poetry not for pastime, but for dear life, not for the diversion of an idle hour, but for refuge in a realm of ideality and for solace to its passionate yearning after a wider, richer experience. Again and again, in this correspondence with Miss Heath, there breaks out the cry of loneliness and heart hunger. The strain of each day's work, in itself severe enough, was made all the more exhausting by the additional tasks a mind incapable of rest was forever imposing on itself. Rising before the sun and going to bed after midnight, steadily bent on supplementing the defects of an imperfect early education, at work on textbooks like her Science of Common Things, which ultimately went through sixty editions, and the fundamental data of which she had to learn as she wrote them down. Inevitably there set in that physical exhaustion of body and brain out of which no further response is to be had but by plying whip and spur. There was no joy in the house, no refuge in a merry, loving home circle, no leisure from ever pursuing cares. Thence the hungry void in her heart which led her often to write in a strain like this. Quote, Anne, 
my dear friend, if ever you are disposed to think your lot an unhappy one or your heart desolate, think of her whose pathway is yet more thorny and whose way is cheered by no close connections. You have an almost angelic mother, Anne. You cannot but be both good and happy while she hovers over you, ministering to your wants and supplying all that the fondest affection can provide. Your sisters, too, they comfort you. I have none. End quote. As early as 1824, it was becoming doubtful whether the young teacher would have health enough to permit of her carrying through the scheme on which she had embarked with such energy. Symptoms of lung congestion, with tendency to hemorrhage, were becoming marked. Her voice, remarkable through later life for purity, sweetness, and depth, was growing weak and husky. She was fast contracting a stoop of the shoulders, and her frequent attitude, as she stood to conduct her classes, was that of supporting herself with one hand holding on to the desk and the other pressed hard to her side as though to repress a sharp pain. Over the future hangs a veil which mortal eyes may not essay to penetrate. She now writes her friend, Miss Heath. But we may trust in the Lord and be of good courage. Of good, of heroic courage, she always was. It was never her will that flinched, but only the body that from time to time dropped prone to the ground. Indeed, it is scarcely without a half pathetic smile that one can read such self-reproachful goadings of an already overtaxed mind and body as this. Quote, there is in our nature a disposition to indulgence, a secret desire to escape from labor, which, unless hourly combated, will overcome and destroy the best faculties of our minds, and paralyze our most useful powers. Protracted ill health is often suffered to become the ally of this hidden disposition, and there is hardly anything so difficult to contend with and conquer. I have often entertained a dread lest I should fall a victim to my besieger, and that fear has saved me so far. End quote. Nonetheless, even she was before long forced to yield, and for the next two or three years to spend her time largely in efforts to establish her health. The sharpest pang of this necessity lay in the separation it involved from the charge of her younger brothers, of one of whom she writes to Miss Heath, quote, Oh, Anne, if that child is but good, I care not how humble his pathway through life. It is for him my soul is filled with bitterness when sickness wastes me. It is because of him I dread to die. I know I should have more faith. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is the betrayer. End quote. Happily for the future of Miss Dix, she had by this time won the respect and love of several very influential people in Boston. Chief among these was the celebrated divine, Dr. William Ellery Channing, who evidently clearly understood alike the admirable and the dangerous points in her nature, and frankly counseled her. Quote, I look forward to your future life, he on one occasion wrote, not altogether without solicitude, but with a prevailing hope. Your infirm health seems to darken your prospects of usefulness, but I believe your constitution will yet be built up, if you will give it a fair chance." You must learn to give up your plans of usefulness as much as those of gratification to the will of God. We may make these the occasion of self-will, 
vanity, and pride as much as anything else. May not one of your chief dangers lie there? The infirmity which I warn you of, though one of good minds, is an infirmity. It is said that our faults and virtues are sometimes so strangely interwoven that we must spare the first for the sake of the last. If I thought so in your case, I would withhold my counsel, for your virtues are too precious to be put to hazard for such faults as I might detect. End quote. One fortunate outcome of this relation with Dr. Channing was an invitation to undertake the education of his children for six months of the spring and summer of 1827. This happily removed her from the bleak climate of Boston to the softer air and charming scenery of Narragansett Bay, where, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, at the distance of a few miles from Newport, his birthplace, Dr. Channing had a country seat. Her duties were light, she could be much in the open air, and at last her passion for hero worship found satisfaction in close intimacy with an actual human being so exalted in intellect and saintly in character that the more nearly she came in contact with him, the deeper grew her veneration. Already no mean proficient in botany, and with a lively interest in all departments of natural history, the flowers, seaweeds, shells, and general marine life of the beautiful region exercised a fascination over her that drew her away from inward conflict and gave a healthier objective tone to her mind. When the engagement terminated in October, Dr. Channing wrote her, quote, You have no burden of gratitude laid upon you, for we feel that you gave at least as much good as you received. We will hear no more of thanks, but your affection for us and our little ones we will treasure up among our precious blessings. I wish to say to you that if you should think another summer's residence on Rhode Island would be beneficial to you, Mrs. Channing and myself would be glad to engage your services for our children. I dare not urge the arrangement, for I have an interest in it. For several successive winters, now, pulmonary weakness compelled Miss Dix to seek refuge from the severe winter climate of New England, in Philadelphia, and in Alexandria, Virginia. She kept herself busy with reading of a very multifarious kind, poetry, science, biography, and travel besides eking out the scanty means she had laid by from her teaching by writing stories and compiling floral albums and books of devotion. The effect of illness was rarely to depress her spirits. Indeed, it must here be emphasized as a marked characteristic of her at once heroic and devout nature that suffering not only rallied to the front her powers of resistance, but actually induced a state of high spiritual exaltation. Throughout her whole future career, this will be strikingly apparent. Very interesting is it, then, to read in the two following extracts from letters written while away in the South to Miss Heath, her own clear recognition of this constitutional trait. Quote, Dear Annie, I am never less disposed to sadness than when ill and alone. Sometimes I have fancied that it was the nature of my disease to create a rising, elastic state of mind. But be that as it will, I speak solemnly, the hour of bodily suffering is to me the hour of spiritual joy. It is then that most I feel my dependence on God and his power to sustain. It is then that I rejoice to feel that, though the earthly frame decay, 
the soul shall never die. The discipline which has brought me to this has been long and varied. It has led through a valley of tears, a life of woe. It is happiness to feel progression and to feel that the power that thus aids is not of earth. End quote. Again, as presenting a vivid picture of how quickly any vision of sublimity or beauty, whether in the physical or the moral world, would lift her above bodily suffering into a state of transport and adoration. The following extract from a letter of this period is highly characteristic. Quote, Last night, dear Annie, I could not sleep, and after several restless hours rose at one o'clock, wrapped myself warmly in my flannel gown, and was in search of my medicine when the remarkable clearness of the sky drew me to my window. There was Orion with his glittering sword and jeweled belt, Aldebaran, the fiery eye of Taurus, Saturn with his resplendent train of attendants, and the sweet Pleiades. There, too, flamed Canicula and Prussian, beneath whose rival fires the beautiful star of evening had long since sunk from view. Leo, with his glorious sickle, followed in the train, and thousands on thousands of starry lamps lent their brightness to light up the vast firmament that canopied the silent earth. Silent, for sleep had exerted its restoring influence upon all save the sick and sorrowing. I turned reluctantly again to seek my weary couch with feelings of gratitude to my God for all his past goodness and humble trust in his future care, I laid my head on my pillow, and though I could not sleep, could meditate. End quote. A more striking piece of unconscious self-portraiture could hardly be quoted than this. The image of that frail young woman rising on a cold winter night from her bed, exhausted with coughing and the sharp pain in her side, to seek her medicine, and suddenly finding relief in the sublime pageant of the midnight heavens, and in the adoration of the God whose glory it declared, this image, indelibly stamped on the mind, will give the keynote to a life that was destined to be a perpetual rising from pain and weariness to the beholding of a vision so transcendent in promised blessing for humanity as to inspire her with fairly supernatural strength. But not yet was her day of stern training over. Still farther must she learn to endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ still farther to school an impatient and indomitable will to wait on the ordination of a higher power. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Frances Tiffany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. The Island of St. Croix In alternation between summers spent with the family of Dr. Channing in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, intermittent attempts at teaching, as in the then famous Fowl Monitorial School, and winters passed in more southern latitudes, the years went by, till, in the autumn of 1830, Miss Dix was invited by Dr. Channing to accompany his household as instructress of his children to the tropical island of St. Croix, in which he was himself to seek the recuperation of his greatly impaired health. The party sailed in the schooner Rice Plant from Boston, November twentieth, 1830, 
reaching their destination after a short and prosperous voyage. St. Croix, one of the West India Islands, belonging to Denmark, enjoyed in those days such repute for salubrity of climate as to be much sought as a refuge by delicate and consumptive patients from the United States. Twenty-three miles long by six in width, and crowned by the eminence of blue mountain rising to a height of eleven hundred feet the proportion of land to the surrounding extent of the ocean made residence on it almost like being at sea a visit to the tropics had been looked forward to by miss dix with intense delight now she would see with her own eyes an utterly new flora and fauna a literal paradise of trailing vines palms bananas rare birds shells and marine plants indeed it seems here the most fitting place again to call attention to that vivid interest in all the branches of natural history which unquestionably would have asserted itself as the dominant passion of her mind had it not been overmastered by the still stronger passion for consecrating herself to the relief of human suffering all through life the prospect of snatching an hour from pressing cares for the criminal and the insane to devote to studying in its native habitat a new plant new seaweed or new shellfish or for observing anything before unseen in a bay of fundy tide or a remarkable geological formation excited in her an enthusiasm nothing could call her off from but the cry of human misery what she might have achieved had her indomitable energy been permanently turned in the direction of natural science, it is impossible to say. Certain it is, there would have been no crater, however deep and sulphurous, into which her courage would have shrunk from descending. No marsh, however malorious, that would have hidden from her the secret of its most secluded moss or peat flower. Arriving now in the actual tropics, and with all her northern energy on the alert for fresh achievement, Miss Dix unexpectedly found herself brought face to face with a lesson in human nature, which began a modification of character in her it took years to work out. So far in life, the uncompromising champion of the power of the human will to rise superior to circumstances of every kind, great was her dismay and mortification at finding herself for a time the passive victim of a purely physical environment. Before this date, indeed, stern experience had forced her to admit the indisputable fact that the lungs might become inflamed and a sharp, burning pain transfix the side. But this only meant that one could no longer use the voice for teaching. One could still study, write, master fresh knowledge, meditate, and pray but now she had to succumb utterly to an invisible and intangible foe on which she could get no purchase to simple tropical climate pain could be fought but languor an utter languor of desire and will which blunted every weapon she had been used to wield and made the arm nerveless to grasp it here was something which baffled her utterly. Indeed, of this entirely new phase of experience, Miss Dix speaks feelingly in a letter to her friend, Mrs. Samuel Torrey, to whom she writes, quote, Another letter from you, my dear friend, impels me to take up my pen. I think that this incitement would not have been needed, 
had I been under any other influence than this before-named languor. Our darling Mary says, how changed Miss Dix is. She always used to be busy, and now she only says, don't talk to me, and throws herself on the bed twenty times a day. I am also the unfortunate subject of Dr. Channing's jests. My dear, he says to Mrs. C., where can Miss Dix be? But I need not ask, doubtless very busy as usual. Pray, what is that I see on yonder sofa? Some object shrouded in white? Oh, that is Miss Dix after all. Well, well, tell it not in Gath. How are the mighty fallen? All this I bear, but I am rising above it in more than one sense. I am really getting well, or well over this vexatious no disease that does nothing, thinks nothing, is nothing. It is of interest here, to ask what was the impression made on a mind so sympathetic with human suffering, and so resolute to champion its cause, by this her first actual contact with African slavery. Judging from her letters, it was an experience not at all uncommon with persons of her peculiar type of character. Arriving in the tropics from the bleak north, with a mind long strained to the highest tension in the pursuit of moral ideals, the abysmal gulf that opened up between the careless, dancing, morally irresponsible Africans and any class of human beings she had up to this time ever fallen in with seems to have dizzied her in all her previous standards of judgment." Like northern people in general, on their first acquaintance with far southern life, she too was completely carried away with the fascination of a spontaneity, grace, and spirit of pure physical light-heartedness, of which the north affords scarcely a trace. The rigid New England schoolmistress element in her nature is for a time thawed and dissolved away giving place to an opposite extreme. Morality is still to her the glorious crown of humanity in Massachusetts, but as for St. Croix and among the Negro slaves, is it to be rationally looked for there? Quote, you have no idea, she writes to her friend, Mrs. Torrey, how interesting the Negroes are here. They have not, what we are used to seeing in the descendants of Africans at the north, coarse features and clumsy gait and rough voices. They are, in general, handsome, much above the generality of the whites, with very fine figures, and graceful beyond anything I have ever seen. Their voices in conversation are musical, and their manners respectful. Sometimes their accents, especially those of the children, are soft and plaintive, touching the heart. For all this, they are in reality cheerful and happy. They are the most graceful dancers imaginable. They never make a false step, and there is a hardiness simplicity, and ease with which they sustain their favorite amusement that draws the spectator into the most lively enjoyment of the exhilarating scene. I cannot regard these subjective beings as responsible for any immoralities. Taking into consideration all the circumstances in which they are placed— I would by no means teach them the distinctions of right and wrong. I should not enlighten them, only to ensure a tenfold wretchedness here, and perhaps not make any progress in aiding them to be happier hereafter. They are not free agents. Their managers, overseers, 
and too often their owners are very corrupt, and the slaves are within and under their control. End quote. Later on, however, it is clear from Miss Dix's letters that this peculiar fascination exerted on tense New England minds by their first contact with pure physical gaiety of temperament is fast wearing away, and that her old moral standards are again powerfully reasserting themselves. She is manifestly triumphing, as she said she soon should, over this vexatious no disease that does nothing, thinks nothing, is nothing, and now writes in the following strain to Mrs. Torrey. Quote, Your view of slavery corresponds with my own. Disguise thyself as thou wilt, still slavery, still thou art a bitter draught. And human nature will not wear thy chains without cursing the ground for the enslaver's sake. His gold shall perish with him would seem to be the mildest language of justice. But whatever be the form, or however remote the time, sure am I that a retribution will fall on the slave merchant, the slave holder, and their children to the fourth generation." As I regard the hundreds around me for life subjected to bondage, I am tempted to ask when they commit a fault, do these men sin or their masters? These beings, I repeat, cannot be Christians. They cannot act as moral beings. They cannot live as souls destined to immortality. Who, then, shall pay the awful price of their soul's redemption? Who but those who have hidden from them the bread of life, and sealed up from them the fountains of living waters, who have darkened the dark mind and obscured the clouded powers of thought? Oh, for a Jeremiah to cry, Woe, woe, ere total destruction cometh, Oh, for the inspirations of an Isaiah to pierce the hardened with the arrows of timely repentance. No blessing, no good, can follow in the path trodden by slavery. No door of mercy opens for him whose soul is stained by unnumbered sins committed by others through his agency. End quote. It has been of importance to dwell on this personal experience of the enervating effect wrought by tropical languor on the most exceptional energy of northern will, because it is very evident that the winter spent on the island of St. Croix and the full year or more of languishing illness she later on was to go through with in Liverpool, England, wrought in Miss Dix a gradually developing modification of view. These were the first great experiences that fixed her attention on a class of positive phenomena lying largely outside the control of the human will, through the clear recognition alone of which it became possible to her to allow more largely for physical and moral imperfections and infirmities. Her standard of judgment was rendered by them less an absolute and immutable procrust's bed, on which all alike must be stretched and cut to a uniform pattern. Toward herself, indeed, and the demands she through life made on her own flesh and blood, she remained inexorable. But she came finally to see that she differed from others, and that she was a being apart, with a law of her own to obey. Gradually, though only gradually, the disposition lessened in her to insist on her own almost superhuman standard of self-sacrifice as the rule, or even possibility for others. And so at last, when she had sounded the awful depths of her own great mission of mercy, 
and paid the full tribute of the blood money exacted, it came to be with her as with that kindred spirit Elizabeth Fry, whose daughters have recorded in the biography they wrote of her, quote, she would have shrunk from urging the same course on others. She feared her daughters and other young women generally undertaking questionable or difficult public offices. She laid great stress on the outward circumstances of life, how and where providentially placed, the opportunities afforded, the powers given. She did not consider this call to be general or to apply to persons under an administration different from her own. End quote. How complete, however, was, in Miss Dix's own case, the triumph over tropical languor, there is ample evidence in the journals and notebooks she brought back with her to New England. They show an exhaustive study of all the physical features of the island and embrace full catalogues of its native and cultivated plants, trees, and crops, of its marine flora and fauna. So valuable were, moreover, the collections of specimens she laboriously made that presence of portions of them to such scientific men as Professor Benjamin Silliman, Audubon, and others brought her the most cordial letters of thanks and praise. Besides, while at St. Croix, she evidently did a large amount of reading. Very characteristic, is it, as one turns the pages of these notebooks, now yellow with the time stain of sixty years, to see how diligently she wrote out full extracts from the saints and sages of all periods and all lands, whose words bore on the right conduct human life. These extracts are from Hindu, Persian, Greek, and Christian sources. Though herself the most orthodox of the earlier type of Unitarianism, her inner life was of too genuine a strain to resist the witness of the spirit, in whatsoever land or under whatsoever dispensation it was breathed abroad. In a letter to the writer of this biography, Mrs. Mary C. Eustace, the daughter of Dr. Channing, records in the following words her own recollections of Miss Dix at the time of the winter in St. Croix and of the summers at her father's country seat in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Quote, she was tall and dignified, but stooped somewhat, was very shy in her manners, and colored extremely when addressed. This may surprise you, who knew her only in later life, when she was completely self-possessed and reliant. She was strict and inflexible in her discipline which we, her pupils, disliked extremely at the time, but for which I have been grateful, as I have grown older and found how much I was indebted to that iron will from which it was hopeless to appeal, but which I suppose was not unreasonable, as I find my father expressing great satisfaction with her tuition of her pupils. I think she was a very accomplished teacher, active and diligent herself, very fond of natural history and botany. She enjoyed long rambles, always calling our attention to what was of interest in the world around us. I hear that some of her pupils speak of her as irascible. I have no such remembrance. Fixed as fate, we considered her. We all became much attached to her, and she was our dear and valued friend, and most welcome guest in all our homes. She was a very religious woman, without a particle of sectarianism or bigotry. At the little Union Meeting House, which adjoined Oakland, our place on Rhode Island, Miss Dix always had the class of troublesome men and boys 
who succumbed to her charm of manner and firm will. Later on, after the death of her grandmother, she was a constant visitor at our house. She delighted to drop in unexpectedly, and then suddenly receiving a letter from a poor soldier at Fort Adams, would start off at a moment's notice to right his wrong and persuade the government to improve the arrangements for the comfort of the men. End, quote. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: The Model School and Its Penalty. Returning home from St. Croix in the late spring of 1831, Miss Dix, in the ensuing autumn, entered seriously on the work of establishing the kind of model boarding and day school for girls which should satisfy the high-wrought ideal that filled her mind. Once again, she found herself settled in the old Dix mansion, her now well-grown brothers with her, and health sufficiently improved to warrant, she felt, any degree of prodigal expenditure of precious life force. Flinging herself with her old intensity into the work, rising before the sun and rarely in bed till after midnight, no long time passed before she made her mark and secured from prominent families in Boston and from distant places as many pupils as she could take in charge. Health or no health, there were two grand objects she was now indomitably set on effecting. First, she would achieve pecuniary independence. To the full, she appreciated the value of a moderate competence to anyone who would be free to carry out self-chosen plans in life. The misery and humiliation entailed by impracticality and shiftlessness had been from childhood burned into her soul. Thus, from the outset, she showed herself a superior business manager. Generous to the last extreme in giving away money, her school containing always a number of non-paying pupils, and a charity school in addition being largely maintained by her, she nonetheless held tenaciously to the idea that the money she gave away should be her own money. To the end of life she entertained a sovereign contempt for people who got their living out of benevolent enterprises, and selfishly foisted themselves in the holy name of charity, as an added burden on the community. Along, however, with this determination to secure personal independence, there went the resolve to subordinate every desire for leisure and exemption from pain to working for what she deemed the highest good of her pupils. No heart of the day shared more fully than hers the enthusiastic faith of that great awakening in Massachusetts, which, fostered especially by the glowing visions of the future for humanity, of the preaching of Dr. Channing, was prophesying the advent of a new day in education and reform. The dignity of human nature, its power under God, to rise to heights never before dreamed of but in the visions of saints, this had been Dr. Channing's inspiring battle cry. In all this, her own ardent aspirations had been still farther stimulated by the flaming eloquence of Dr. Channing's colleague, Rev. Ezra Stiles Gannett, a man equally ready with herself to trample the body underfoot and live a daily sacrifice in infirmity and pain to the cause he fervidly cherished. For the realization of these prophetic hopes, 
the place of all others for work now seemed to Miss Dix, the school. She did not yet know herself for the commanding powers that were slumbering in her. Coming events alone were to reveal these, but in the school could be gathered together the children unspotted from the world, and in the susceptible soil of their natures could be sown the seed of the coming glorious harvest. Nonetheless, it must be frankly admitted that she could never fully enter into the experience of average children, their exuberance of purely animal life, their suffering under concentration and restraint, their utter immaturity of intellect and conscience. To themselves, they seemed here on earth to enjoy the fun life was made for. To her, to prepare to become the mothers, teachers, daughters of charity of the world. Alas, she had never been an average child herself. She had been premature child mother, premature battler with the stern problem of life. And so out of the lack of this essential experience was to grow the one grave drawback to the character of the influence she exerted in the school. Great and salutary as was that influence, and as it is, even to this day, recognized to have been by the decided majority of her pupils who are still living. The arrangements of the school writes a former pupil of it, were very primitive. No desks for the girls, only a long table through the middle of the room at which we sat for meals and at which it was very inconvenient to write. The studies, as was common in those days, embraced a rather limited range of subjects. Spelling, arithmetic, and composition were rigorously and accurately taught as well as geography and history, while a French teacher gave the only instruction in any other language but English, unless exception be made in favor of a little elementary Latin. Perhaps far more than in most schools of the period, attention was paid to the teaching of physics and natural history. The main stress, however, was laid on the formation of moral and religious character. Here lay the overpowering consideration with the teacher. No mere acquisition of knowledge was of any value in her eyes in comparison with a longing to dedicate it to the service of humanity. In this respect, the conduct of the school was well-nigh monastic. Unceasing effort was paid to leading the children to the formation of habits of introspection. The kingdom of good and of evil within, the probing its depths, and the recognition of the eternal distinction between the two. This was to her the one shape of knowledge that made the turning point of the soul in time and in eternity. And so, on the mantel shelf of the study room, there lay always a certain shell, a kind of ear of God, into which, daily if possible, letters were to be dropped, recording the results of careful self-examination. Letters to which Miss Dix would sit up till after midnight writing answers. Moreover, to this was later on added a Saturday evening provision for private interviews of the most solemn and searching nature between pupils and teacher, a kind of Protestant version of the Roman Catholic system of the confessional. That too great strain was thus put on the sensibilities and conscience of the more earnest children by this close spiritual touch with so morally exacting a nature, there can be little question. And yet, in reply to minute inquiries from the writer of this biography, the majority of the still living pupils insist that, while overstimulated at the time, 
they were none the less spiritually revolutionized by these seasons of close personal contact, and that to her they owe the best they have ever done in life. Others, however, seem to retain none but painful and even bitter memories of their early relation with one the stress of whose immense demand was farther accentuated by the inevitable bodily penalties of exhaustion, sleeplessness, and pain entailed on her by overstrain. Among the miscellaneous papers left behind after the death of Miss Dix, there are large bundles of child letters of this period, which throw a varied, sometimes amusing and sometimes pathetic, light on the working of this system of education, the Shell Post Office Department of it especially. These letters are but straws, indeed, but straws show how the wind blows or the current sets, and so have a value greater than their own. Here, then, is one of them, from a little girl, highly pleased, evidently, at the prospect of spiritual treasures in store for her. The italics so freely used in these letters are retained as too indicative of emphatic states of mind to be spared. Quote, Please write me a note, dear teacher. I send you the paper in hopes that you will. Do please. The casket is ready. Please fill it with jewels. Your child, Molly. End quote. Next comes a letter from a youthful aspirant manifestly bent on putting bark and iron into a flagging will. Quote, you know, dear Miss Dix, that I told you just now that I could not do my composition. And isn't it singular I just read in Martha's letter Borodil's quotation from Mr. Gannett's sermon? An iron will can accomplish everything. Dear Miss Dix, I will have this iron will, and I will do and be all you expect from your child. End quote. A third example summons vividly before the mind a little girl so actually seething with ambition to succeed that the power of language fails and has to be eked out with a bristling abatis of exclamation points. Quote, Auntie, sweet, very dear, sweet Auntie, you asked me just now who I was writing to. I did not answer you on purpose. Auntie, Auntie, do you think I shall, shall get my Bible? I want to be a good girl so. Don't you want me to? I know you do, 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 Auntie. Now, Auntie, I want to be good very much. And I'll tell you what. Let you and I never speak together, but write little notes all the time. Tomorrow morning, I want to find a little note on my pillow, if you are not busy. Goodbye, dear Auntie. End quote. Surely this last letter gives evidence of a child nature much more enthusiastically stimulated than overawed by the Shell post office system. The two next, however, are characteristic specimens of the more pathetic ones, of which there were many. 1. Quote, you wished me to be very frank with you and tell you my feelings. I feel the need of someone to whom I can pour forth my feelings. They have been pent up so long. You may perhaps laugh when I tell you I have a disease, not of body, but of mind. This is unhappiness. Can you tell me of anything to cure it? If you can, I shall indeed be very glad. I am in constant fear of my lessons. I am so afraid I shall miss them. And I think that if I do, I shall lose my place in the school, and you will be displeased with me. End quote. 2. Quote. 
I thought I was doing very well until I read your letter. But when you said that you were rousing to greater energy, all my self-satisfaction vanished. For if you are not satisfied in some measure with yourself and are going to do more than you have done, I don't know what I shall do. You do not go to rest until midnight, and then you rise very early. End quote. These juvenile effusions sufficiently indicate the varied nature of the effect produced by Miss Dix's personality and methods on children of different temperaments. To them may be added an extract from a letter written nearly sixty years later. Quote, I was in my sixteenth year, 1833, writes to Miss Dix's biographer, Mrs. Margaret J. W. Merrill of Portland, Maine, when my father placed me at her school. She fascinated me from the first, as she had done many of my class before me. Next to my mother, I thought her the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She was in the prime of her years, tall and of dignified carriage, head finely shaped and set, with an abundance of soft, wavy brown hair. End quote. For a period of five years, the school continued in full tide of success, the unflinching will of Miss Dix dragging her frail body through the weariness and suffering involved. At last, however, in the spring of 1836, she broke down utterly. Hemorrhages recurred. The old pain in the side seemed fixed as though a splintered lance were there, and her exhausted nerves would respond no farther. She had achieved her cherished ends, though at a fearful cost. Her labors had secured for her the independence of a modest competence. She had made a home for, educated, and embarked in the world her younger brothers. She had won a position of dignity and respect as a teacher, and had set a stamp never to be effaced on a large number of young minds. Footnote. Charles W. graduated at the Boston Latin School, 1832, died on the western coast of Africa in 1843, on board the ship he commanded. Joseph became a prosperous merchant in Boston. End footnote only it looked as though she had been self-slain in the process. She herself, however, looked back with no relentings on the physical and moral excesses of her past. The stake for which she had played seemed to her eminently an honorable one, and to have been necessitated by the stern conditions thrust on her by her lot in life. A spirit of martyr exultation sustained her in the consciousness that she had never flinched till she fell helpless to the ground. Summing up, then, the impression left by a careful study of the life of Dorothea L. Dix to the age of thirty-three, it seems inevitable to say that it was at once a life devout and heroic in purpose, and a life marred by willful overstrain. A hectic fever had long been running in her blood, which raised to a perilous intensity the self-sacrificing impulses and the moral and religious ardor of her temperament. She had as yet learned no law of limit. Dr. Channing had put his finger on the very spot when he wrote her, The infirmity of which I warn you, though one of good minds, is an infirmity. Later, she was to learn a very different lesson, but it was a lesson that always came hard to her personally, tenderly and pitifully, as she was brought to recognize its import in the case of others. Still, even in the midst of these needful strictures, let it in simple justice be borne in mind that we are here dealing with a nature of extraordinary capacity, force, and fire, 
thus far set to tasks that gave no scope to its splendid energies. The mental and moral powers which, after once they had found their adequate field of action, were to sweep irresistibly before her the legislatures of more than twenty great states of the Union, which were again and again to carry by storm the Senate and House of Representatives of the Federal Congress in Washington, and which, in Europe, were to win a like triumph in the British Parliament, and to revolutionize the lunacy legislation of Scotland, mental and moral powers of such an order had so far been set only to the petty task of teaching disciplining and stimulating twenty or thirty average children it was like seeking to dwarf into the hull of a little launch a marine engine powerful enough to drive an ocean steamship in the teeth of the roughest gales across the atlantic End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 In Liverpool, England So complete was the state of prostration in which Miss Dix was left by the collapse of her powers in the spring of 1836, that her physicians insisted on the abandonment of every thought, present or prospective, of further schoolkeeping. It had become a question of life or death. The immediate necessity was entire change of scene and climate. To this end, a sea voyage to England was prescribed, where she should spend the summer, and in the autumn seek the milder climate of the south of France or of Italy. Provided, accordingly, with letters of introduction from Dr. William E. Channing and other influential persons, she set sail from New York for Liverpool, April 22nd, in company with Mr. and Mrs. Frank Schroeder and Mr. and Mrs. Farrar, friends who watched over her on the voyage with all care and tenderness. It was her intention, on landing, to spend several months in England, and later on to rejoin the Farrars somewhere on the continent. Once again was all choice of plans taken out of her hands. After her arrival in Liverpool, it became clear that she was in too suffering a condition for either travel or sightseeing, and forlorn enough would now have been her situation but for the providential kindness of new-made English friends. Fortunately, among the letters of introduction from Dr. Channing was one to the family of Mr. William Rathbone of Liverpool, a merchant of wealth and high standing, a prominent Unitarian, and identified with every good cause of benevolence and reform. Calling upon the stranger invalid at the hotel where she lay ill, Mr. and Mrs. Rathbone at once insisted on her removal to their own residence, Greenbank, some three miles outside the city, and to this charming place, and to the hearts of the family she was now taken. It was certainly, with no thought of remaining there longer than a few weeks, that Miss Dix became an inmate of the Rathbone household. In reality, with short intervals of change, it was to be for full eighteen months. Frequent hemorrhages set in, and so great was the exhaustion attendant upon them that much of her time had to be spent in bed or on her lounge. And yet, to the end of her days, this period of eighteen months stood out in her memory as the jubilee year of her life, the sunniest, the most restful, and the tenderest to her affections of her whole earthly experience. To the strenuous invalid, nursed in the school of stern self-abnegation, there was nothing in the scripture maxim, 
it is more blessed to give than to receive, which she did not thoroughly endorse and gladly practice. By nature, however, it came very hard to her, as always in the instance of overpoweringly active and self-helpful characters, to reverse this maxim and recognize that the day surely comes to every poor, worn, and weary mortal when it should with equal devoutness be acknowledged how much more blessed it is to receive than to give. But during the whole year of 1836 to 37, Miss Dix, as her letters show, evidently lived on the mountaintop of this reversed beatitude, it was the one only long holiday she ever knew in life. She threw off care and ceased to plan. She lovingly resigned herself and her shrouded future into the hands of God, while her heart overflowed with gratitude for the love with which she found herself cherished by the whole devoted household. The storm and stress period of her life seemed over and spite of illness perhaps even more on its very account the ardent and romantic fervor of affection so deep-seated underneath her self-controlled exterior together with her native delight in refinement culture and social charm now found free vent it is accordingly in the following happy state of mind that we find her writing october first 1836, to her friend, Mrs. Samuel Torrey of Boston, quote, You know I am ill. You must imagine me surrounded by every comfort, sustained by every tenderness that can cheer, blessed in the continual kindness of the family in which Providence has placed me. I, with no claims but those of our common nature." Here I am, contracting continually a debt of gratitude which time will never see cancelled. There is a treasury from which it will be repaid, but I do not dispense its stores. I write from my bed, leaning on pillows in a very oriental luxury of position, one which I think will soon fall into a fixed habit." End quote. Not, however, without the persistent application of strong counter-irritants on the part of her Puritan grandmother in Boston, was Miss Dix allowed to surrender herself to this blissful state of nirvana. The bare elements of the situation shocked every sense of propriety in the rigid old lady, who had herself been brought up in the inflexible early New England creed that the one and only befitting posture for a triumphant Christian consumptive to die in was sitting bolt upright in a straight-backed chair, maintaining so long as consciousness survived a clear two inches of space between the person and any terrestrial proffer of support. To her, then, it seemed simply incredible, an outright moral fall, that a granddaughter of her own should actually consent to stay on month after month in a strange household, where she could render no kind of equivalent in service for the trouble and expense to which she must be subjecting everybody. Little could the primitive old lady take it in, that the very reason why the grateful invalid at Greenbank was so luxuriating in her life there grew out of the fact that now for the first time in her experience her nature was blossoming out in an atmosphere of free, spontaneous love. Only natural, then, is it to find her writing back to her grandmother in Boston in a strain that shows how deeply her feelings had been hurt. Quote, I have felt the obligation to my friends in England so exclusively my own that it was not less surprising than painful to know you indulged so much solicitude on that point. There is a danger, perhaps, of my getting a little spoiled by so much caressing and petting, 
but I must try to do without it if I get better. So completely am I adopted into this circle of loving spirits that I sometimes forget I really am not to consider the bonds transient in their binding. End quote. Likewise, to her Boston friend, Mrs. Samuel Torrey, she writes in a similar strain, quote, You know all my habits through life have been singularly removed from any condition of reliance on others, and the feeling, right or wrong, that aloneness is my proper position has prevailed since my early childhood, no doubt nourished and strengthened by many and quick following bereavements. End quote. At the time of Miss Dix's first visit to England, communication between Europe and America was a very different thing from what it is now. The day of steamships lay still in the future, and not yet was the Atlantic turned into a simple ferry across which boats ply daily at stated hours of departure and arrival. Sometimes eighteen days sufficed to bring letters, while at others two full months must pass without the relief of any intelligence from home. Miss Dix's experience was destined to be the common one of those abroad. Before very long, news of the inevitable changes wrought by death began to arrive. Thus, September 28, 1836, Mrs. H. S. Hayward of Boston writes to inform the invalid of the sudden death of her mother in Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire. Quote, the remembrance of duties so faithfully performed and the consciousness that you could have done nothing more had you been at home will be a comfort to you. Your mother's departure was so unexpected that even those in the room were totally unprepared. No sickness nor suffering, but a sudden summons to go to her rest after a life of suffering from a lingering disease. End quote. The intelligence of her mother's death was the opening afresh of an old wound in the heart of Miss Dix, awakening once more the sense of passionate grief she cherished throughout life at never having known in childhood the blessedness of a happy and loving home, a grief rendered all the intenser now through daily communion with scenes of domestic joy. For long years, one additional reason for the excessive overstrain she had subjected herself to had grown out of the necessity of contributing to the maintenance of her mother. He would have been a bold prophet who should in those days have bade the suffering invalid look forward to well nigh fifty years of such extraordinary achievement as to amaze all who came in contact with her. As late as January 25th, 1837, nearly nine months after her arrival in England, she writes her friend Miss Heath, quote, I have been very ill from the middle of November till the past week, but have just now less pain in the side, diminished cough, and on the whole an accession of strength. This week, for the first time since September, the physician gave me permission to walk about the room several times daily. It is ten days since the last spitting of blood, and altogether I am quite comfortable, at least, I may say, happy and grateful for the manifold blessings of my condition. End quote. Later on, however, in Miss Dix's stay in England, the improvement of her health grew steadily more marked, and during the last part of her sojourn at Greenbank, as well as on the occasion of visits to other friends, she was able to enjoy a good deal of social intercourse with people of intellectual and moral superiority. On the privilege of this, she writes enthusiastically to Miss Heath, quote, Of my English friends, 
I should find language too poor to speak the just praise and the excellence which shines in their characters and lives. Your remark that I probably enjoy more now in social intercourse than I have ever before done is quite true. Certainly, if I do not improve, it will be through willful self-neglect. Before closing the narrative of this special episode in the life of mystics, it seems needful to add that an untrue impression would be left on the mind unless emphatic attention were once again called to the sharpness of the pang it had cost her to renounce her chosen career in Boston. The thought that any should suppose she had weakly surrendered when the fiery test came to her was nothing short of torture. Accordingly, when, as months on months of rest went by without recuperation, her dearest home friends wrote to her expressing wonder that she was not already well their words seemed to her little short of a moral insult quote, i wish she wrote to mrs samuel torrey my home friends expressed and felt less surprise at my not being restored by a mere voyage I thought they knew me well enough to count more upon the resolution I could exercise in keeping up when very ill than to have been so deceived in supposing I would have laid down all my absorbing and interesting duties so quietly if the conviction had not been too clear to admit a doubt that no effort could longer be sustained." I feel it was right to go on as long as I did, and right to pause only where and when I rested. End quote. It is hard, under the actual circumstances of the case, to read this characteristic letter without recalling Browning's poem of the heroic boy who, wounded to death, still clung to his horse's mane till he had dashed up to Napoleon with the news that Radisbon had been stormed. Quote, so tight he kept his lips compressed, scarce any blood came through. You looked twice ere you saw his breast, was all but shot in two. You're wounded. Nay, his soldier's pride, touched to the quick, he said. I'm killed, sire and his chief beside, smiling, the boy fell dead. End quote. Before the return to America, the intelligence of still another death was to reach Miss Dix. It was that of her grandmother, at the advanced age of ninety-one. This meant, of course, the breaking up of the only place she could look upon as home. I feel the event she wrote in reply, as having divided the only link, save the yet closer one of fraternal bonds, which allies me to kindred. Miss Dix returned home sometime in the autumn of 1837, after an absence of over 18 months. While her health had greatly improved, it still had not sufficiently to admit of her spending the winter in the severe climate of New England. Happily, through the will of her grandmother, a bequest had now come to her, enough with the earnings of her days of teaching to provide a competency for the moderate wants of a single woman. She was thus made mistress of her own time, and could for the rest of her days have consulted simply the exigencies of health in the choice of a place of residence, and have felt free to follow the strong bent of her social and intellectual tastes. The first necessity now, however, was to find a milder climate for the coming winter. This she sought partly in Washington, D.C., and partly at Oakland, near Alexandria, Virginia. But the winter proved an unhappy one to her. Her mind was in a restless state. The same ill health that had forced her to give up the school in which the chief interest of her life had centered 
now forbade her even thinking of resuming it. She had parted her moorings and was adrift on the world. Nor was this all. In England she had tasted the sweets of a new and fascinating experience. She had basked in a sunny atmosphere of sympathy and love and had shared a life far fuller of charm and intellectual stimulus than any to which she had previously been accustomed. New England, on her return, seemed to her raw, provincial, hard, and ugly, as indeed in those earlier days it was. There seemed no place for anyone who was not fitted into some regular groove of work. Work was the one and only refuge, and what work was there now for her? All this inward sense of restlessness and pain found poignant expression in her letters at this period. Quote, I was not conscious, she writes from Washington, February 24, 1838, to her friend Miss Heath, that so great a trial was to meet my return from England till the whole force of the contrast was laid before me. Then, I confess, it made an impression which will be ineffaceable. Perhaps it is in myself the fault chiefly lies. I may be too sensitive. I may hunger and thirst too eagerly for that cordial, real regard which exists not in mere outward forms or uttered sounds, I may be too craving of that rich gift, the power of sharing other minds. I have drunk deeply, long, and oh, how blissfully, at this fountain in a foreign clime. Hearts met hearts, minds joined with minds. And what were the secondary trials of pain to the enfeebled suffering body when daily was administered the soul's medicine and food? Yes, beloved, ever too dearly beloved ones, we are divided. And what but the deepness of sorrow, what but the weight of grief would rest on my soul if the future, the glorious future, the existence that knows no death, no pain, nor separation, were not seen in the long vista through which faith and hope are the angelic conductors. But there are duties to be performed here. Life is not to be expended in vain regrets. No day, no hour comes, but brings in its train work to be performed for some useful end. The suffering to be comforted, the wandering led home, the sinner reclaimed. Oh, how can any fold the hands to rest and say to the spirit, Take thine ease, for all is well. End, quote. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Life of Dorothea Lind Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The Older Theories of Insanity. The concluding words of the last chapter, Oh, how can any fold the hands to rest and say to the spirit, Take thine ease, for all is well, proved prophetic. Before very long were her compassionate heart and dauntless will to be brought face to face with an abyss of human misery in the condition of the helpless and outcast insane throughout the land, so appalling in the scenes it opened up that from that day forward till extreme old age had left her helpless there was to be for her no more folding the hands. Take thine ease, for all is well. Nay, much is most hideous, a scandal to self-called Christianity, a heartbreak to anyone with a trace of pity. 
such was henceforth the haunting cry of reality ceaselessly sounding in her ears with its demand woe woe if thou dost not champion these outcast and miserable ones never was a redeeming work entered on with a clearer devouter belief in a direct call from on high or a more unhesitating answer here am i send me great characters never appear isolated from all sympathetic surroundings they are more than extraordinarily forceful individualities they are individualities lifted on the crest of some great tidal wave of humanity did they come forward as simple innovators their work would soon be brought to naught for lack of historic backing it is to their high degree of receptibility to their sympathetic power of forecasting and co-working with forces then in the air that they owe their power of achieving such seemingly miraculous results all important is it therefore before specifically entering on the narrative of the life work in behalf of the insane to which dorothea l dix now made haste to dedicate herself with the self-sacrifice of a martyr and the religious fervor of a saint to review as briefly as possible while yet with needful fullness and circumstantiality the exact state of things prevailing in new england fifty years ago thus only can the reader grasp a clear conception alike of the point of departure and of the goal toward which everything must be made to tend it is a review which must necessarily embrace the previous condition of theological thought and feeling in new england together with the strange but very practical bearing of this thought as well as on the administration of penal law as on the theory and treatment of a certain type of mysterious and awful disease such review must further seek to contrast with all this the growing influence of a new and different order of ideas finally gathering head and making themselves felt with revolutionary power in all her rationality in all her enthusiasm of humanity in all her glowing faith in the birth of a new epoch in human history miss dix was the incarnation of the sanguine and prophetic spirit of her time throughout the whole earlier epoch of new england history the two grand forces which had wrought together for the education of the people had been politics and religion the necessity of laying the foundation of the state in what had been a previous wilderness and of fostering its steady progress toward maturity had demanded a constant exercise of practical sagacity and devoted patriotism and yet all this so needful work had been regarded but as temporal and material in its nature and as strictly subsidiary to something higher in comparison with the overwhelming realities of the supernatural world the claims of the present world were to be weighed but as dust in the balance to maintain in the minds of the community a high-wrought and imaginatively vivid sense of this eternal distinction had been the unremitting aim of the powerful theological system of calvinism that dominated the great majority of the people a system moreover whose dogmas had been enforced by a class of preachers of commanding intellectual power and rare elevation of character here then was an iron-linked system of theological thought which embodied elements in it fitted to produce as it did produce many and noble spiritual results in its favor must it be said 
that it had disciplined the mind to close reasoning on the profoundest subjects. It had put energy into the will. It had led to the scorn of sloth and ease, and had substituted for those the stern sense of duty. It had developed, moreover, in a select class of finely tempered souls, a rapt and mystic piety. But along with these great advantages, it had nonetheless always carried in its breast other elements, whose inevitable tendency was to narrow, harden, and well-nigh annihilate the tenderer and more compassionate qualities of human nature. So vastly more frequently and incisively had the righteous wrath of God been emphasized than his redeeming love, that, logically enough, the majority of men and women had been led to cultivate and morally approve in themselves the same inverted relation between these two attributes which they worshipped in their deity. Inevitably, then, were the penal statutes of such communities inexorably severe. The prisoner, an outcast from the heart of God, became equally an outcast from the heart of society. The little he might be called on to suffer in the jail from moldy bread and filthy water, from foul air and swarming vermin, seemed so as nothing in comparison with the awful fate awaiting him in eternity, as scarcely to be worthy of consideration. Nor was it practically different with the view taken of the condition of the actually insane. Nay, in certain respects it was worse. The terrible superstitions of the Middle Ages, which had always sought the explanation of insanity and the idea of diabolic possession, and had seen in its frenzies of imprecation, filthiness, and blasphemy simply the masterpiece of Satan, still hung like a lurid cloud over the human mind. Slowly, slowly only were the conceptions outgrown which, in the days of the Salem witchcraft, had rendered possible the spectacle of an outbreak of superstitious terror powerful enough to transport to a pitch of frenzy not merely the ignorant populace, but many of the foremost judges and divines of the land. Such crazy fancies of hysteric women as would today be treated with diet, sedatives, and change of air were in those days treated spiritually with the terrific anathemas of the church, and judiciously, or by mob law, with drowning in the river or the hangman's noose. Of course, as time went on, and enlightenment grew greater, the virulence of these middle-age superstitions steadily abated, though ever lingering in the background. Practical common sense began to make some headway. Still, the real king, who was finally to dethrone these imaginary supernatural terrors, had not yet seated himself on the throne. The old theory of insanity lingered on, because no new theory half as plausible had demonstrated its divine right of succession. Nor yet had human reason come to the full consciousness of itself, through the study of those physical laws of nature whose immutable dictum is the one and only basis of authority. And so, with the gradual decadence of the power of the old theological conceptions over the imagination, there came at first another theory of insanity, which was but a partial modification of the earlier one, and which preserved many of its worst features. Insanity was pure mental and moral, not physical perversion. It was the outbreak of the animal, violent, filthy, blasphemous, and murderous elements of the fallen human soul, elements which had culpably been permitted to get the upper hand of the higher attributes. 
It was thus a fury of the mind, not a fury of the inflamed and congested body acting on the mind. One thing at least was certain of it. It turned men and women into tigers and jackals. It made it impossible to appeal to their reason, and thus put them outside the category of human beings. Iron cages, chains, clubs, starvation must still remain the only fit instrumentalities through which to dominate menageries of such wild beasts. Not that a certain amount of crude and barbarous medical prescription, of purgings, bleedings, and emetics, did not go along with all this. Still, the whole realm of the subtler relations between mind and body was as yet a terra incognita. And so the insane were inevitably looked upon with a strange and cruel blending of repulsion, personal fear, and despair of any methods but those of physical coercion. With the beginning, however, of the nineteenth century, and with steadily accumulating force as its years rolled on, a great change began to come over New England, and especially Massachusetts, a change which was rapidly to put this state in the intellectual van of her sister states of the Union. More frequent and intimate mental communication with Europe brought the minds of aspiring young men and women into contact with the literature, the art, the science, the philosophy of the older world. An intellectual ferment was thus set on, and through it what may accurately enough be entitled the Renaissance Period of New England the transition from lingering medievalism to rising modern conceptions, now showed vital signs of drawing on. The day came of fervid reformers in theology, like Channing and Emerson, in public education, like Horace Mann, in practical charity, like Dr. S. G. Howe, in the rational treatment of insanity, like Dr. Woodward of Worcester. Such, then, was the condition of things in New England during the formative period in which the mind of Miss Dix was coming to its maturity. On no one had one especial class of the ideas of the new awakening, not so much its literary and aesthetic as its religious, philanthropic, and scientific ideas taken a stronger hold than on her. She had drunk in with passionate faith Dr. Channing's fervid insistence on the presence in human nature, even under its most degraded types, of germs, at least, of endless spiritual development. But it was the characteristic of her own mind that it tended not to protracted speculation, but to immediate embodied action. Give her a seed thought, and she made haste to plant it, water it, and watch it grow, flower and fruit. Though mummy wheat, buried three thousand years in an Egyptian tomb, her first instinctive impulse was to furnish it here and now with soil and sun, and see what could be made to germinate. In other words, she delighted in positive forces, and loved to co-work with them, and see them justify themselves in practice. The harder the conditions under which they were called upon to do this, the greater the triumph. As soon, therefore, as Miss Dix's attention became directed to the pitiable condition of the insane, it was not mere sentimental compassion over their sufferings, deeply and tragically even as this affected her, that engrossed her mind, but the immediate constructive question, what class of positive forces, philanthropic, medical, legislative, judiciary, can be summoned into the field to cope with this awful problem? 
that is, she proceeded at once to master the whole question of insanity, its origin, its stages of development, its relation of body and mind, its treatment, its legal and moral rights, and to put herself abreast with the most advanced thought on the subject. Here was the shriveled and desiccated mummy wheat of humanity, which, as soon as she encountered it, she yearned to see it raised in resurrection from the tomb in which for ages it had been buried. What, then, it now becomes necessary to pause and ask, was the distinctive character of the new thought which, at this particular period, was kindling the humane and scientific enthusiasm of the more advanced minds of Europe and America on the whole matter of insanity. A clear understanding alone of this will serve to put the reader in possession of the inspiring creed of which Dorothea L. Dix was now to become the fervid apostle. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: The Breaking of a New Day. In attempting a brief sketch of the history of the treatment of insanity in the past, it is not necessary here to harrow the mind with circumstantial details of the frightful forms of exorcism practiced by the church throughout the Middle Ages, to the end of driving the devils out of their supposed victims, nor of the medicines, as loathsome as those brewed from newts and toads in the cauldron of Macbeth's witches, which were habitually administered, nor of the chains, whippings, bleedings, and duckings, which were thought necessary to physically weaken or subdue with terror the more violent outbreaks of fury. The seemingly unaccountable thing is that it should have been at so late a day in the history of civilization that, except in the rarest instances, anything more rational began to be believed in. Of this, let a simple example suffice, that of Bethlehem Hospital in London, popularly known as Old Bedlam. Up to so late a date as 1770, this famous hospital was still regarded as the rare show of the city, superior even in the attractions it offered the pleasure-seeker, to a bull baiting or a dog fight. No more diverting entertainment could be devised by the average citizen for guests visiting him from the country than to take them for a hearty laugh to Bedlam, to see the madmen cursing, raving, and fighting. There was to be had on show St. Paul or Julius Caesar chained to the wall, or Semiramis or Joan of Arc ironed to the floor while the general throng, left more at liberty, were guarded by brutal keepers, ready on the slightest provocation to knock them senseless with heavy clubs. The annual fees derived from this public entertainment amounted to several hundred pounds. No one seems to have felt any pity for the poor wretches. The abyss which opened up between them and ordinary humanity was too deep and wide for any sympathetic imagination to span. A madhouse was a menagerie, nothing more, and it was as legitimate to look through the bars at one class of wild beasts as at another. Think farther of the system of medical practice that, at as late a date even as 1815, and then detailed before the committee of the House of Parliament by one of the visiting physicians, Dr. T. Monroe, was still pursued at Bedlam. Patients, said Dr. Monroe, 
are ordered to be bled about the latter end of May, according to the weather. And after they have been bled, they take vomits once a week for a certain number of weeks. After that, we purge the patients. That has been the practice invariably for long years before my time, and I do not know of any better practice. Then, as to the matter of simple protection from the inclemency of the weather, even in the new building, says Sidney Smith, Edinburgh Review, 1815-16, to the windows of the patient's bedrooms were not glazed, nor were the latter warmed. What this must have meant, throughout the chill fogs and freezing nights of a London winter, to poor wretches chained down to their beds for the night, it needs no words to portray. The wild beast theory of insanity, which had succeeded to the diabolical possession theory, still reigned unbroken in the great majority of hospitals. Strangely enough, it was first in Paris, and at the height of the frenzy of the French Revolution, when the excitement of the times had filled the wards of the asylums with the most violent patients, that the great moral genius appeared, who was destined to inaugurate a complete revolution in the theory and treatment of insanity a revolution ordained to prove historically quite as effective in the overthrow of the old dynasty of force and terror that had reigned in these institutions as was that of the jacobins in the overthrow of the old dynasty of french monarchism individual liberty had been the fierce cry raised by the jacobins who forthwith proceeded to secure it for themselves and their own ideas by fire and slaughter. Individual liberty, the most of it possible, was equally the cry of the gentle, merciful, far-seeing Dr. Philippe Pennell, on receiving, in 1792, the appointment of superintendent of the Bicitra, the asylum for incurable insane males. Off with these chains, away with these iron cages and brutal keepers. They make a hundred madmen where they cure one. There is another and better way. The insane man is not an inexplicable monster. He is but one of ourselves, only a little more so. Underneath his wildest paroxysms there is a germ, at least, of rationality and of personal accountability. To believe in this, to seek for it, stimulate it, build it up, here lies the only way of delivering him out of the fatal bondage in which he is held. With unflagging persistency did Pennell now urge these humane convictions on the commune, and seek to get authority to try the effect of his scheme on at least one-fourth of his patients. The idea seemed to those he argued with as wildly visionary, as a deliberate proposal to go out to the Jardin des Plantes and fling wide the gratings to the jaguars and tigers confined there. At last, however, he persuaded the ferocious Couthon to go with him to the Bicetra and consider the problem on the spot. They were greeted in the gloomy prisons by the yells and execrations of three hundred maniacs, mingling the clanking of their chains with the uproar of their voices. Already had Couthon had long and familiar experience in dealing with the most savage elements of society. But before the proposition now made him, he utterly quailed. After looking over the patients, he said to Pennell, Citizen, are you crazy yourself that you would unchain such beasts? Permission, however, to try the mad experiment, was finally given, some of the first results of which will be found recorded in the following abridgment of a portion of a memoir 
read by the son of Pennell before the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. Quote, Near the close of the year 1792, M. Pennell, having repeatedly importuned the government to issue a decree permitting him to unchain the maniacs at the Bicetra, went in person to solicit what had been refused to his written representations. With courage and resolution, he urged the removal of this cruel abuse. At length, M. Couthon, member of the commune, yielded to the importunate arguments of Pennell, and consented to meet him at the hospital, to witness these first experiments, as well as to assure himself that this was not a stratagem to give liberty to political offenders. Coutin proceeded himself to question the patients, but received only abuse and execrations, accompanied by terrible cries and the clanking of chains. Retreating from the damp and filthy cells, he exclaimed to Pennell, Do as you will, but you will be sacrificed to this false sentiment of mercy. Pennell delayed no longer. He selected fifty who he believed might be released from their chains without danger to others. The fetters were removed, first from twelve, using the precaution of having prepared strong jackets closing behind with long sleeves, which could be used if necessary. The experiments commenced with an English captain, whose history was unknown. He had been in chains forty years. As he was thought to be one of the most dangerous, having killed, at one time, an attendant with a blow from his manacles, the keepers approached him with caution. But first Pinnell entered his cell unattended. Ah, well, Captain, I will cause your chains to be taken off. You shall have liberty to walk in the court if you will promise to behave like a gentleman and offer no assault to those you will meet. I would promise, said the maniac, but you deride me. You are amusing yourself at my expense. You all fear me once free. I have six men, replied Pennell, ready to obey my orders. Believe me, therefore, I will set you free from this duress if you will put on this jacket. The captain assented. The chains were removed and the jacket laced. The keepers withdrew without closing the door. He raised himself but fell. This effort was repeated again and again. The use of his limbs, so long constrained, nearly failed. At length, trembling, and with tottering steps, he emerged from his dark dungeon. His first look was at the sky. Ah, cried he, how beautiful! The remainder of the day he was constantly moving to and fro, uttering continually exclamations of pleasure. He heeded no one. The flowers, the trees, above all the sky, engrossed him. At night he voluntarily returned to his cell, which had been cleaned and furnished with a better bed. His sleep was tranquil and profound. For the two remaining years which he spent in the hospital, he had no recurrence of the violent paroxysms, and often rendered good service to the keepers in conducting the affairs of the establishment. The patient released next after the captain was Chavinge, a soldier of the French guards, who had been chained ten years and had been peculiarly difficult of control. Pennell, entering his cell, announced that if he would obey his injunctions, he should be chained no longer. He promised, and following every movement of his liberator, executed his directions with alacrity and address. Never in the history of the human mind was exhibited a more sudden and complete revolution. 
He executed every order with exactness, and this patient, whose best years had been sacrificed in a gloomy cell, in chains and misery, soon showed himself capable of being one of the most useful persons about the establishment. He repeatedly, during the horrors of the revolution, saved the life of his benefactor. On one occasion he encountered a band of San culottes who were bearing Pinel to the Lantern, owing to his having been an elector in 1789. With bold and determined purpose he rescued his beloved master, and caused that life to be spared, which had been so great a blessing to the insane in France. In the third cell were three Prussian soldiers, who had been for many years in chains, but how or for what they had been committed none knew. They were not dangerous, and seemed capable of enjoying the indulgence of living together. They were terrified at the preparations for their release, fearing new severities awaited them. Sunk into dementia, they were indifferent to the freedom offered. An aged priest came next. He fancied himself to be the Messiah taunted once with the exclamation that if in truth he was Christ, he could break his chains, he answered with solemnity, Frustra tentas dominum tum. Religious exaltation had characterized his life. On foot, he had made pilgrimages to Rome and Cologne. He had made a voyage to the Western world to convert savage tribes. This ruling idea passed into mania, and returning to France, he declared that he was Christ the Savior. He was arrested on the charge of blasphemy and taken before the Archbishop of Paris, by whose decree he was consigned to the Bicetra as either a blasphemer or a madman. Loaded with heavy chains, he for twelve years bore patiently sarcasm and cruel sufferings. Pinel had the happiness to witness his recovery in less than a year and to discharge him from the hospital cured. In the short period of a few days, Pinel released from their chains more than fifty maniacs, men of various ranks and conditions, merchants, lawyers, priests, soldiers, laborers, thus rendering the furious tractable and creating peace and contentment to a wonderful degree, where long the most hideous scenes of tumult and disorder had reigned. End quote. It was in 1796, only four years after Pennell's first experiment in the Bicetra, and entirely independently of any knowledge of his work, that a precisely similar reform was inaugurated in England, this time not by a physician, but by a member of the Society of Friends, William Tooke, a merchant of ample fortune and great benevolence and force of character. In building with his own means the retreat at York, and retaining the absolute control of its policy in his own hands, he prepared a suitable place for a fair trial of the new method he proposed. It was by no mere chance, as men call chance, that this great reform in England sprang from the mind and heart of a member of the Society of Friends. The leading tenet of the Quakers— faith in the power of absolute reason, and the identification of absolute reason with the immediate divine presence in the soul, was one that logically led to just such an experiment as this, as likewise to invincible faith in its success. No other religious sect in Christendom had accumulated and transmitted through inheritance to their children so great a mass of testimony as to the power of gentleness, patience, 
and inward self-control to evolve rational order out of chaos of warring human passions. William Tuke had the moral greatness to see with perfect clearness and to pursue with heroic persistence one luminous conviction, namely, that precisely the same moral and physical regimen which has proved itself the only power adapted to quicken, mature, and firmly establish the elements of reason and self-government in ourselves and our children is the sole regimen that can be trusted to do the like for the feebler and more sorely beset elements of the same essential reason in these poor afflicted ones. Quote, His feeling that something should be done had been strengthened by a visit he had paid to St. Luke's Hospital, where he saw the patients lying on straw and in chains. He was distressed with the scene, and could not help believing that there was a more excellent way. One day, in the family circle, conversation turned on the name that should be given to the proposed institution. The retreat, quickly replied the good wife. What's in a name? Everything at times. It was at once seen that feminine instinct had solved the question, and the name was adopted to convey the idea of what such an institution should be, namely, a place in which the unhappy might obtain a refuge, a quiet haven in which the shattered bark might find the means of reparation or of safety. In person, writes a contemporary of William Tuke. He hardly reached the middle size, but was erect, portly, and of a firm step. He had a noble forehead, an eagle eye, and a commanding voice, and his mien was dignified and patriarchal. Like all pioneers in the struggle of human progress, he had to encounter his full share of ridicule obloquy and opposition in the end however he triumphed and the retreat at york became a beacon light of the world shining through the dark night of one of the gloomiest chapters of human history philippe pinel and william tuke these then were the two original minds that inaugurated a new epoch in the history of the treatment of insanity, an epoch as revolutionary in character within this especial realm as that of the Copernican system in the realm of astronomy. It implied an absolute reversal of all previous conceptions, the substitution, in the place of restraint and force, of the largest possible degree of liberty, the abandonment of the whole previous idea of brute subjection for that of the emancipation of the reason and the enhancement of the sense of personal responsibility. Each one of these remarkable men achieved his task uninformed of the action of the other. Quote, it is no new thing says the eminent American alienist, Dr. Pliny Earle, in commenting on this singular coincidence, for inventions, discoveries, and innovations upon traditionary practices to originate almost simultaneously in more than one place, showing that they are called for by the times, that they are developments of science and humanity necessary evolutions of the human mind in its progress toward the unattainable perfect rather than what may be termed a gigantic and monstrous production of one original genius. Happily, the most characteristic mark of distinction between the last hundred years and the centuries which preceded them lies in the rapidity with which new ideas— even the most revolutionary, spread, provided only they can justify themselves before the tribunal of reason. 
such proved true of the startling innovation wrought by Pennell and Tuke. By 1838, Dr. Gardner Hill, house surgeon of Lincoln Asylum, England, ably seconded by Dr. Charlesworth, had asserted the principle of the entire abolition of mechanical restraint and had to a very large extent carried it out, though personally falling a victim to the bitter opposition he encountered alike from commissioners and his own medical brethren. But immediately followed the remarkable career of Dr. John Connolly, who at Hanwell, on a much larger scale and with far greater success, came to the rescue of the cause. To Connolly, says the Edinburgh Review, April 1870, belongs a still higher crown, not merely for his courage in carrying out a beneficent conception on a large scale and on a conspicuous theater, but for his genius in expanding it. To him, hobbles and chains, handcuffs and muffs were but material impediments that merely confined the limbs. To get rid of these, he spent the best years of his life. But beyond these mechanical fetters, he saw there were a hundred fetters to the spirit, which human sympathy, courage, and time only could remove. The dire instruments of coercion formerly in constant use, Dr. Connolly remanded to a room in the asylum and there constituted a museum of them, a chamber of horrors, which the enlightened physician of today contemplates with practically the same feelings which would be excited in him by a visit to the old dungeons and instruments of torture of the Inquisition. And yet, so recently had the possibility of such a change been dreamed of that Dr. Connolly relates that he himself had formerly witnessed humane English physicians daily contemplating insane patients bound hand and foot and neck and waist in illness, in pain, and in the agonies of death without one single touch of compunction or the slightest approach to the feeling of acting either cruelly or unwisely. They thought it impossible to manage insane people in any other way. End quote. A footnote. After five years' experience, wrote Dr. Connolly, I have no hesitation in recording my opinion that, with a well-constituted governing body, animated by philanthropy, directed by intelligence, and acting by means of proper officers, entrusted with a due degree of authority over attendance, properly selected, and capable of exercising an efficient superintendence over patients. There is no asylum in the world in which all mechanical restraint may not be abolished not only with perfect safety, but with incalculable advantage. Tuke's History of the Insane in the British Isles It may be that this is too ideal a statement of what is possible under any but the rarest combination of circumstances. Dr. Connolly was a man of positive genius in his calling and of a magnetism and spirit of consecration that carried all before him. At any rate, it was in the right direction. End footnote. Is it, then, exaggeration to characterize the absolute change of base inaugurated by the labors of Pennell and Tuke as a Copernican revolution in the realm of the theory and treatment of insanity? The beginning of the 19th century saw in the whole United States but four insane asylums, of which only one had been entirely built by a state government. They were, in the order of the dates of their foundation, those of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1752, 
of Williamsburg, Virginia, the first state asylum, 1773, of New York, 1791, of Baltimore, Maryland, 1797. In 1813, attention was attracted to Tuke's work in England by certain Philadelphia friends who, collecting funds, opened in 1817 a hospital in which the insane might see that they were regarded as men and brethren. One year later, witness the foundation of the McLean Asylum at Somerville, Massachusetts, the asylum which established the character and principles of treatment which have become universal with us, and especially the principle of state supervision. Later on, the retreat at Hartford, Connecticut, opened in 1824, and the asylum at Worcester, Mass., in 1830 became conspicuous examples of the practical application of the new scientific and humane ideas inaugurated by Pennell and Tuke. There were giants on the earth in those days, says in his paper on progress in provision for the insane, Dr. W. W. Godding of the Government Insane Asylum for the Army and Navy in Washington, D.C., Dr. Godding had been speaking of the memorable list of men in the United States who at that early date had already been attracted by genius and character to the development of the new system. Brigham, Butler, Woodward, Ray, Walker, Bell, Stribling, Gray, Kirkbride. Here, enlisted with consecrated intelligence and humanity under the new banner was a chosen band who were destined before very long to carry the fame of american asylums all over europe and for a time at least to keep them ahead of any in the world none the less one indispensable spiritual power in the land was still lacking it was that of a fervid apostle of the new creed of one animated with the requisite inspiration and fire to lead a crusade against the almost universal ignorance superstition and apathy which still reigned over nearly the whole of the states of the union of a mind and heart in fine powerful enough to rally thousands and tens of thousands to the deliverance from the hand of the infidel of what should seem to her no less than the holy sepulchre of crucified humanity. This imperative demand was now to be answered in the person of Dorothea Lynde Dix. End of chapter 7「Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix」by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. The Descent into Inferno. It was on March 28, 1841, that Miss Dix was first brought face to face with the condition of things prevailing in the jails and almshouses of Massachusetts, which launched her on her great career. The story, repeated in so many scattered notices of her life, runs that, on coming out of church one Sunday, she overheard two gentlemen speaking in such terms of indignation and horror of the treatment to which the prisoners and lunatics in the East Cambridge, Massachusetts jail were subjected, that she forthwith determined to go over there and look into matters herself. The occurrence of the incident is perfectly possible, but the important fact of the case is given in the following extract from a letter of Rev. John T. G. Nichols, D.D., of Sacco, Maine. Quote, While a member of the theological school in Cambridge, writes Dr. Nichols, 
I was one of a body of students who took the East Cambridge House of Correction in charge for Sunday school instruction. All the women, twenty in number, were assigned to me. I was at once convinced that not a young man, but a woman should be their teacher. Consulting my mother, I was directed by her to Miss Dix for further counsel. On hearing my account, Miss Dix said, after some deliberation, I will take them myself. I protested her physical incapacity, as she was in feeble health. I shall be there next Sunday, was her answer. After the school was over, Miss Dix went into the jail. She found among the prisoners a few insane persons with whom she talked. She noticed there was no stove in their room and no means of proper warmth. The jailer said that a fire for them was not needed and would not be safe. Her repeated solicitations were without success. At that time, the court was in session at East Cambridge, and she caused the case to be brought before it. Her request was granted. The cold rooms were warmed. Thus was her great work commenced. Of course, I claim not a particle of credit. I was simply the instrument of the good providence to open the door for this angel of mercy to come in. Quote. It was thus that, in the East Cambridge jail, Miss Dix was first brought into immediate contact with the overcrowding, the filth, and the herding together of innocent, guilty, and insane persons, which at that time characterized the prisons of Massachusetts, and the inevitable evils of which were repeated in even worse shape in the almshouses. Her first act, as has been seen, was the practical one of enforcing mercy by law, through insisting that, in a climate where in winter the thermometer frequently registers zero and below, a fire of some sort should be provided for shivering wretches who in their frenzy often tore the clothes off their backs, casting about her for help. She soon succeeded in enlisting the aid of that ever-loyal friend of humanity, Dr. S. G. Howe, and through him that of the afterwards famous philanthropist and statesman Charles Sumner. Close beside her, too, stood Reverend Robert C. Waterston. At Miss Dix's solicitation, Dr. Howe himself made a careful examination, the result of which was printed in an article in the Boston Daily Advertiser of September 8, 1841, an article, of course, fiercely attacked, as is generally the case when abuses are pointed out. Later on in the controversy, Dr. Howe appealed for corroboration to Charles Sumner, who had accompanied him on his visit. To this, Mr. Sumner replied, quote, My dear Howe, I am sorry to say that your article does present a true picture of the condition in which we found these unfortunates. They were cramped together in rooms poorly ventilated and noisome with filth. You cannot forget the small room in which were confined the raving maniac, from whom long since reason had fled, never to return, and that interesting young woman, whose mind was so slightly obscured that it seemed as if, in a moment, even while we were looking on, the cloud would pass away. In two cages or pens constructed of plank, within the four stone walls of the same room, these two persons had spent several months. The whole prison echoed with the blasphemies of the poor old woman, while her young and gentle fellow in suffering, 
doomed to pass her days and nights in such close connection with her, seemed to shrink from her words as from blows. And well she might, for they were words not to be heard by any woman in whom reason had left any vestige of its former presence. It was a punishment by a cruel man in heathen days to tie the living to the dead. Hardly less horrid was this scene in the prison at Cambridge. Ever faithfully yours, Charles Sumner. End quote. Was the state of things in the East Cambridge jail an exception, or did it simply exemplify the rule throughout the whole commonwealth? This was the painful question now raised in the mind of Miss Dix to an unmistakable answer to which she resolutely devoted the next two years. Notebook in hand, she started out on her voyage of exploration, visiting every jail and almshouse from Berkshire on the west to Cape Cod on the east, steadily accumulating her statistics of outrage and misery she at last got together a mass of eye-witness testimony appalling in extent and detail with this she now determined to memorialize the legislature of massachusetts as this was the first memorial addressed by miss dix to a state legislature long as was the series of the like that was to follow full extracts from it are needful alike to reveal the patience energy and spirit of humanity with which she addressed herself to her work as well as the actual character of the evils she was now in arms against Quote, gentlemen about two years since Leisure afforded opportunity, and duty prompted me to visit several prisons and almshouses in the vicinity of this metropolis. Every investigation has given depth to the conviction that it is only by decided, prompt, and vigorous legislation that the evils to which I refer, and which I shall proceed more fully to illustrate, can be remedied. I shall be obliged to speak with great plainness, and to reveal many things revolting to the taste, and from which my woman's nature shrinks with peculiar sensitiveness. But truth is the highest consideration. I tell what I have seen, painful and shocking as the details often are, that from them you may feel more deeply the imperative obligation which lies upon you to prevent the possibility of a repetition or continuance of such outrages upon humanity. If my pictures are displeasing, coarse, and severe, my subjects, it must be recollected, offer no tranquil, refining, or composing features. The condition of human beings reduced to the extremest state of degradation and misery cannot be exhibited in softened language or adorn a polished page. I proceed, gentlemen, briefly, to call your attention to this present state of insane persons confined within this commonwealth, in cages, closets, cellars, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. End quote. Page after page, the memorial then goes on to recite the details of a long catalogue of horrors. They do not furnish pleasing reading, but if the life-work of Miss Dix is to be practically written out and duly appreciated, it is necessary to brace the nerves and go through with some of them. Quote, I give a few illustrations, the memorial then proceeds, but description fades before reality. Danvers, November, visited the almshouse, a large building, much out of repair. 
understand a new one is in contemplation. Here are from 56 to 60 inmates. One, idiotic. Three, insane. One of the latter in close confinement at all times. Long before reaching the house, wild shouts, snatches of rude songs, imprecations, and obscene language fell upon the ear. Proceeding from the occupant of a low building, rather remote from the principal building, to which my course was directed, found the mistress, and was conducted to the place which was called the home of the forlorn maniac, a young woman exhibiting a condition of neglect and misery, blotting out the faintest idea of comfort and outraging every sentiment of decency. She had been, I learnt, a respectable person, industrious and worthy. Disappointments and trials shook her mind and finally laid prostrate reason and self-control. She became a maniac for life. She had been at Worcester Hospital for a considerable time, and had been returned as incurable. The mistress told me she understood that, while there, she was comfortable and decent. Alas, what a change was here exhibited! She had passed from one degree of violence and degradation to another, in swift progress. There she stood, clinging to, or beating upon, the bars of her caged apartment, the contracted size of which afforded space only for increasing accumulations of filth, a foul spectacle. There she stood with naked arms and disheveled hair, the unwashed frame invested with fragments of unclean garments, the air so extremely offensive, though ventilation was afforded on all sides save one, that it was not possible to remain beyond a few moments without retreating for recovery to the outward air. Irritation of body, produced by utter filth and exposure, incited her to the horrid process of tearing off her skin by inches. Her face, neck, and person were thus disfigured to hideousness. Is the whole story told what was seen is, what is reported is not. These gross exposures are not for the pained sight of one alone. All, all coarse, brutal men, wandering, neglected children, old and young, each and all, witness this lowest, foulest state of miserable humanity. And who protects her? that worse than pariah outcast from other wrongs and blacker outrages. Some may say these things cannot be remedied. These furious maniacs are not to be raised from these base conditions. I know they are. Could give many examples. Let one suffice. A young woman, a pauper in a distant town, Sandisfield, was for years a raging maniac. A cage, chains, and the whip were the agents for controlling her, united with harsh tones and profane language. Annually, with others, the town's poor, she was put up at auction and bid off at the lowest price which was declared for her. One year not long passed, an old man came forward in the number of applicants for the poor wretch. He was taunted and ridiculed. What would he and his old wife do with such a mere beast? My wife says yes, replied he, and I shall take her. She was given to his charge. He conveyed her home. She was washed, neatly dressed, and placed in a decent bedroom, furnished for comfort and opening into the kitchen. How altered her condition! As yet the chains were not off, 
the first week she was somewhat restless, at times violent. But the quiet ways of the old people wrought a change. She received her food decently, forsook acts of violence, and no longer uttered blasphemous or indecent language. After a week, the chain was lengthened, and she was received as a companion into the kitchen. Soon she engaged in trivial employments. After a fortnight, said the old man, I knocked off the chains and made her a free woman. She is at times excited, but not violently. They are careful of her diet. They keep her very clean. She calls them father and mother. Go there now, and you will find her clothed, and though not perfectly in her right mind, so far restored as to be a safe and comfortable inmate. Groton a few rods removed from the poorhouse is a wooden building upon the roadside constructed of heavy board and plank. There is no window save an opening half the size of the sash and closed by a board shutter. In one corner is some brickwork surrounding an iron stove which in cold weather serves for warming the room. The occupant of this dreary abode is a young man who has been declared incurably insane. He can move a measured distance in his prison, that is, so far as a strong, heavy chain depending from an iron collar which invests his neck permits. In fine weather, and it was pleasant when I was there in June last, the door is thrown open, at once giving admission to light and air and affording some little variety to the solitary in watching the passers-by. But that portion of the year which allows of open doors is not the chiefest part, and it may be conceived, without drafting much on the imagination, what is the condition of one who for days and weeks and months sits in darkness and alone, without employment, without object. End quote. This unhappy being in Groton, with the chain round his neck, is alluded to again in the following conversation between Miss Dix and the keeper of the almshouse in Fitchburg. Quote, Why, she there asked, speaking of a poor lunatic, cannot you take this man abroad to work on the farm? He is harmless. Air and exercise will help to recover him. I have been talking with our overseers, was the answer, and I have proposed getting from the blacksmith an iron collar and chain. Then I can have him out by the house. An iron collar and chain? Yes. I had a cousin up in Vermont, crazy as a wild cat, and I got a collar made for him, and he liked it. Liked it? How did he manifest his pleasure? Why, he left off trying to run away. I kept the almshouse in Groton. There was a man there from the hospital. I built an outhouse for him, and the blacksmith made him an iron collar and chain, so we had him fast, and the overseers approved it. Shelburne. I had heard, before visiting this place, of the bad condition of a lunatic pauper. I desired to see him, and after some difficulties raised and set aside, was conducted into the yard, where was a small building of rough boards imperfectly joined. All was still, save now and then a low groan. The person who conducted me tried, with a stick, to rouse the inmate. I entreated her to desist. The twilight of the place making it difficult to discern anything within the cage. There at last I saw a human being, partially extended, cast upon his back 
amidst a mass of filth, the sole furnishing, whether for comfort or necessity, which the place afforded. There he lay, ghastly, with upturned glazed eyes and fixed gaze, heavy breathings, interrupted only by faint groans, which seemed symptomatic of an approaching termination of his sufferings. Not so, thought the mistress. He has all sorts of ways. He'll soon rouse up and be noisy enough. He'll scream and beat about the place like any wild beast half the time. And cannot you make him more comfortable? Can he not have some clean, dry place and a fire? As for clean, it will do no good. He's cleaned out now and then. But what's the use for such a creature? His own brother tried him once, but got sick enough of the bargain. But a fire. There is space, even here, for a small box stove. If he had a fire, he'd only pull off his clothes, so it's no use. I made no impression. It was plain that to keep him securely confined from escape was the chief object. How do you give him his food? I see no means of introducing anything here. Oh, pointing to the floor. One of the bars is cut shorter there. We push it through there. There? Impossible. You cannot do that. You would not treat your lowest dumb animals with that disregard to decency. As for what he eats or where he eats, it makes no difference to him. He'd as soon swallow one thing as another. Newton Opening into this room only was the second, which was occupied by a woman, not old, and furiously mad. It contained a wooden bunk filled with filthy straw, the room itself a counterpart to the lodging place. Inexpressibly disgusting and loathsome was all. But the inmate herself was even more horribly repelling. She rushed out as far as the chains would allow, almost in a state of nudity, exposed to a dozen persons and vociferating at the top of her voice, pouring forth such a flood of indecent language as might corrupt even Newgate. I entreated the man, who was still there, to go out and close the door. He refused. That was not his place. Sick, horror-struck, and almost incapable of retreating, I gained the outward air. Of the dangers and mischiefs sometimes following the location of insane persons in our almshouses, I will record but one more example. In Worcester has for several years resided a young woman, a lunatic pauper, of decent life and respectable family. I have seen her as she usually appeared, listless and silent, almost or quite sunk into a state of dementia, sitting one amidst the family, but not of them. A few weeks since, revisiting that almshouse, judge my horror and amazement to see her negligently bearing in her arms a young infant, of which, I was told, she was the unconscious parent. Who was the father none could or would declare? Disqualified for the performance of maternal cares and duties, regarding the helpless little creature with a perplexed or indifferent gaze, she sat a silent, but oh how eloquent, a pleader for the protection of others of her neglected and outraged sex. Details of that black story would not strengthen the cause. Needs it a weightier plea than the sight of that forlorn creature and her wailing infant? Poor little child, more than orphan from birth, in this unfriendly world, a demented mother, 
a father on whom the sun might blush or refuse to shine. End quote. Such are brief selections from some of the extreme instances of misery and barbarity to which Dorothea L. Dix now called public attention through her memorial to the legislature of Massachusetts. Perhaps even more pitiful was the situation of the long catalogue of those whose reason, less wholly overthrown, left them, like the poor young woman to whom Charles Sumner so pathetically alludes, more sensible of their forlorn condition. The memorial concluded with an impassioned appeal for adequate asylum provision against the continuance any longer of so foul a blot on the fair fame of the Commonwealth. Quote, Men of Massachusetts, I beg, I implore, I demand pity and protection for these of my suffering outraged sex. Fathers, husbands, brothers, I would supplicate you for this boon. But what do I say? I dishonor you, divest you at once of Christianity and humanity. Does this appeal imply distrust? Here you will put away the cold, calculating spirit of selfishness and self-seeking. Lay off the armor of local strife and political opposition. Here and now, for once, forgetful of the earthly and perishable, come up to these halls and consecrate them with one heart and one mind to works of righteousness and just judgment. Gentlemen, I commit to you this sacred cause. Your action upon this subject will affect the present and future condition of hundreds and thousands. In this legislation, as in all things, may you exercise that wisdom which is the breath of the power of God. Respectfully submitted, D. L. Dix, 85 Mount Vernon Street, Boston, January, 1843. End quote. End of chapter 8. Chapter 9 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Frances Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 success of the first memorial inevitably a memorial such as that now described struck and exploded like a bombshell it was carrying the war into africa it was the arraignment not of a local evil here and there but of the state of things prevailing more or less in every township throughout the commonwealth of massachusetts Incredible, incredible, was the first natural outcry of humane people. Sensational and slanderous lies was the swift and fiery rejoinder of selectmen, almshouse keepers, and private citizens in arms for the credit of their towns. Everywhere the newspapers bristled with angry articles. There are some... This was the tone too often adopted, and Miss Dix may be one of them, who are always on tiptoe, looking forward for something more marvelous than is to be discovered in real life, and because the things themselves will not come up to this pitch of the imagination, the imagination is brought down to them, and has a world of its own creating. All in vain had the memorialist sought to make it plain that it was a system, and not individuals, she arraigned, and that to put the pauper insane under the practically uncontrolled authority of ignorant and passionate persons, not only destitute of due knowledge, but destitute of any fit appliances for the treatment of the most terrible of human visitations, was the straight way to ensure a hell on earth. 
Carefully and circumstantially had she written to the sheriffs all over the state, and received from them detailed replies substantiating her position that nothing better could be looked for from such a system. But on those more immediately arraigned, all this made no impression. Such people felt themselves pilloried before the public gaze as fiends in human shape, and naturally made frantic efforts to declare the statements of the memorial a tissue of lies. Quote, Did you never, says in his Autocrat of the Breakfast Table, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, in words so picturesquely descriptive of the situation that the temptation to quote them is too strong to resist. Did you never, in walking in the fields, come across a large flat stone, which has lain, nobody knows how long, just where you found it, with the grass forming a little hedge, as it were, all round it, close to its edges, and have you not, in obedience to a kind of feeling that told you it had been lying there long enough, insinuated your stick or your foot or your fingers under its edge and turned it over, as a housewife turns a cake? What an odd revelation, and what an unforeseen and unpleasant surprise to a small community, the very existence of which you had not suspected, until the sudden dismay and scattering among its members was produced by your turning the old stone over. Blades of grass flattened down, colorless, matted together, as if they had been bleached and ironed. Hideous crawling creatures, some of them coleopterous or horny-shelled, black glossy crickets with their long filaments sticking out like the whips of four-horse stagecoaches, motionless slug-like creatures, young larvae, perhaps more horrible in their pulpy stillness than even in the infernal wriggle of maturity. But no sooner is the stone turned and the wholesome light of day let upon this compressed and blinded community of creeping things than all of them which enjoy the luxury of legs and some of them have a good many rush round wildly butting each other and everything in their way and end in a general stampede for underground retreats from the region poisoned by sunshine next year you will find the grass growing tall and green where the stone lay. The ground bird builds her nest where the beetle had his hole. The dandelion and the buttercup are growing there, and the broad fans of insect angels open and shut over their golden disks as the rhythmic waves of blissful consciousness pulsate through their glorified being. End quote. Very soon, however, was it to become clear to intelligent men and women that they were now called upon to deal with one who was at the last remove from a sensationalist, with one, on the contrary, endowed not merely with a sensitive heart, but with a statesmanlike grasp of mind. She had raised no wild, feminine shriek of horror when first the abyss of evil had opened up before her, but had patiently explored the depths of the inferno, sternly shutting her lips till she should come out again to the light of day, to report what her own eyes had seen. Exception might be taken to a particular shade of statement here or there, but to the main truth of her arraignment none. Soon there rallied to her side a band of able men, of whom such names as those of Dr. Samuel G. Howe, Dr. William E. Channing, Honorable Horace Mann, Reverend John G. Palfrey, and Dr. Luther V. Bell of the McLean Asylum proved a tower of strength. 
and so to the fierce and insulting comments of selectmen or almshouse keepers as of groton for example she needed no more conclusive reply than the quiet publication of letters like the following from dr luther v bell a man who for humanity science and sound practical judgment carried irresistible weight Quote, mclean asylum february fifteenth eighteen forty three my dear miss dix on recurring once more to your memorial for which i pray that you may have a reward higher than the applause of this world i thought i would make you a short statement touching a case of a young man in the poorhouse at groton referred to on page nineteen various coincidences led me to suppose this individual to be one james gilson such as the fact of having been at the hospital the peculiar blacksmith work for his restraint etc i extract a part of the history of his case as recorded at the time by my assistant of course with no expectation on his part of its being seen or published beyond the ordinary records of cases eighteen forty december fifteenth mr james gilson groton aged thirty single town pauper about nine months since whilst at work in lowell his derangement came on and soon after he was sent to the house of correction in east cambridge there he remained till last june eighteen forty when he was removed to the poorhouse in groton and confined in the following revolting manner a band of iron an inch wide went round his neck with a chain six feet long attached this was used for the purpose of securing him to any particular place his hands were restrained by means of a clavis and bolt of iron appropriated to each wrist and united by a padlock in this bondage this iron cruel bondage talking incoherently to be sure but without any exhibition of violence he was brought to the asylum in the morning after having been chained up the night before in a barn like a wild animal to spend its dreary hours his shackles were immediately knocked off in the presence of his keeper his swollen limbs chafed gently when the delighted maniac exclaimed my good man i must kiss you etc. So little was this man a subject for personal restraint during his residence with us that he never even injured his clothes, ate at a common table with knives and forks with a dozen others, slept in a common bedroom, and was considered as a pleasant patient filled with delusions. After a short interval, curative means were employed and, as we judged, with most obvious and encouraging advantage, until on the twenty-third day of April, that is, after a little over four months' trial, when the overseers of the poor, without previous notice, sent for him, while under the most energetic use of remedies which required a gradual discontinuance. My assistant's records closes with saying, reluctant to go, for fear they will chain him again. The occupant of this dreary abode is a young man, you observe in your memorial, who has been declared incurably insane. Alas, he may be so now. Two years of chaining, doubtless, has extinguished forever his hope of recovery, but when he was removed from this place i declare it as my opinion that he was not only not incurably insane but was on the path to recovery and every respect a promising case so fully was i impressed with this that i urged the messengers to return till i could advise the town of his prospects but this 
was declined. How much now, my dear madam, do you suppose the charge to the live and thriving town of Groton was for this poor man under the care of this department of the Massachusetts General Hospital? Precisely three dollars a week for every expense of support, care, and comfort. Perhaps a third or a half more than his present cost. Very truly yours, Luther V. Bell. End quote. Equally encouraging letters from other prominent men now came to Miss Dix. I have felt, wrote Horace Mann, in reading your memorial, as I used to feel when formerly I endeavored to do something for the welfare of the same class, as though all personal enjoyments were criminal until they were relieved. Dr. Channing, who had printed an eloquent notice of her memorial in the Christian world, wrote her of this notice. I only wish it were more worthy. Such as it is, I give it to you with my best thanks for your great work of humanity. Lucius Manlius Sargent sent word, I trust you will not suffer a moment's disquietude from the consideration that there is a morbid sensibility abroad which may question the propriety of such an investigation by one of your sex. At the present day of such pronounced ideas on the whole issue of woman's sphere and woman's work, such a letter as this last would only provoke a humorous smile. It is questionable, however, whether many of Miss Dix's letters gave her more real satisfaction. Lucius Manlius Sargent was himself a very knightly specimen of a man, and one whose chivalrous salute any woman would have taken pride in. While Miss Dix's own ideas of feminine propriety, rooted and grounded in a select young lady's boarding school, were of an exacting and old-fashioned order. No doubt she read the letter over several times, and rejoiced that in the eyes of so courtly a gentleman she had not unsexed herself in venturing to plead for her poor unsexed sisters. Very shortly after its first presentation to the Massachusetts legislature, the memorial was referred to a committee— of which Dr. S. G. Howe was appointed chairman. The committee made a report at once, strongly endorsing the truth of Miss Dix's statements, and fortifying them with other instances of like outrages on humanity, the report closing with an eloquent appeal for immediate legislative action. The entire provision for the insane in the state in the State Hospital at Worcester, in the McLean Asylum, and in the hospital at South Boston, was, it was asserted, not adequate to the care of quite 500 patients, while there were in the Commonwealth 958 pauper, insane, and idiotic persons, to say nothing of about 800 at private charge. A resolution was introduced recommending that the trustees of the State Lunatic Hospital at Worcester shall erect additional buildings adjoining or near the existing buildings of said hospital sufficiently large for the addition of 200 insane patients more. A capital piece of good fortune was it that at this juncture a man of the courage and indomitable humanity of Dr. S. G. Howe should have been in the legislature, ready and eager to engineer the bill through. All along had he stood by Miss Dix and encouraged her efforts. Now, as the debate went on, he continually sent her short, stimulating letters. Quote, I presented he says in one of these, your memorial this morning, endorsing it both as a memorial and a petition. 
Your work is nobly done, but not yet ended. I want you to select some newspaper as your cannon, from which you will discharge often red-hot shot into the very hearts of the people, so that, kindling, they shall warm up the clams and oysters of the house to deeds of charity. When I look back upon the time when you stood hesitating and doubting upon the brink of the enterprise you have so bravely and nobly accomplished, I cannot but be impressed with the lesson of courage and hope which you have taught even to the strongest men. You are pleased to overrate the importance of my efforts. I can only reply that if I touch off the piece, it will be you who furnish the ammunition. End quote. A little later on, as the inevitable delays to any work of reform presented themselves, Dr. Howe wrote less hopefully, quote, I do not like to indulge in feelings of distrust, but have been irritated by the cold, pecuniary policy of these men. A friend overheard one of those very men who talked so pathetically to you say, we must find some way to kill this devil of a hospital bill. Speaking about these traitors, another friend, and one versed in the wiles of politicians, said to me, Doctor, never mind. There is a hell. These fellows will find it. But God soften their hearts and enable them to realize the sad condition of the insane and turn and do otherwise. End quote. Happily, the feeling of discouragement expressed in this last letter proved needless. So profound had been the sensation throughout the Commonwealth awakened by the frightful details and impassioned eloquence of the memorial that the obstructions and delays of politicians were swept away before a steadily rising tide of public indignation. The bill for immediate relief was carried by a large majority, and the order passed for providing state accommodations at Worcester for 200 additional insane persons. At once, Dr. John G. Palfrey wrote congratulatingly to the happy woman, adding, I did not tell you what you will have understood, that Dr. Howe managed the business admirably. To say like an old stager would be doing him injustice. Like a man of humanity, energy, and abundant resources, as he is. Thus was ventured and won Miss Dix's first legislative victory, the precursor of such numbers to follow through the length and breadth of the United States, that their repetition year by year, the enormous sums of money they involved, the magnitude of the structures they led to the building of, the range of the field they opened out to advancing medical science, and the vast numbers of poor wretches transferred from stalls and chains to a comparative heaven of asylum comfort fairly startle the imagination. It was a legislative victory which illustrated the peculiar characteristics of her mind. Two years, as has been seen, of patient, concentrated work had preceded any word of appeal to the public. In these two years she had gained the training of accurate observation and indomitable will so indispensable to anyone who will probe to the bottom great evils and then resolutely steer the way through the obstruction, deceit, and wrath always aroused by insistence on radical reform. Sternly repressing the native intensity of an emotional nature, instinctively on fire at the sight of wrong and cruelty, she had acquired at last a dignity and repose of manner that carried with them the peculiar power always exercised by restrained emotion jailer or almshouse keeper no man however cunning or however brutal 
could henceforth think to wave her aside or refuse her entrance. Something formidable was there now about her, to which inferior natures irresistibly submitted. But the presence, as of a higher power, thus manifested, came not in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but in a still, small voice. Indeed, to this day, the oldest living friends of Miss Dix never weary of speaking of the wonderful quality of her voice. It was sweet, rich, and low, perfect in enunciation, and its every tone pervaded with blended love and power. Quiet but always tasteful in the style of her dress, her rich, wavy, dark brown hair brought down over the cheek and carried back behind the ears, her face lit with alternately soft and brilliant blue-gray eyes, their pupils so large and dilating as to cause them often to be taken for black, a bright, almost hectic glow of color on her cheeks, with her shapely head set on a neck so long, flexile, and graceful as to impart an air of distinction to her carriage, all the accounts which have come down from this period of her career call up a personality preeminently fitted to sway those brought into contact with her in her higher moods of inspiration. Apart, moreover, from this training in self-control and power, to set aside a like wile or violence in the attempt to block her way, Miss Dix had learned another lesson through this, her first experience in dealing with a legislative body. It was the lesson of concentrating effort on the work of leading the leaders. Personally, she never cared to appear in public, it was thoroughly distasteful to her to do so. She made no addresses, she gathered no meetings. To come to close quarters of eye, conscience, and heart with impressionable and influential minds, to deliver her burden as from the Lord to them, and let it work on their sensibility and reason, this was her invariable method. Dr. Howe had hit the center when he said, If I touch off the piece, it will be you who furnish the ammunition. For the public éclat of the explosion she cared little. For the quality and quantity of the gunpowder and the penetrating power of the ball, everything. Practical relief brought to the outcast and miserable, the enlisting in their behalf every possible order of ability, philanthropic, political, judicial, religious. This was her grand object. One farther lesson, however, the greatest and most far-reaching of all, had Miss Dix learned from her experience in Massachusetts. While there pursuing her investigations, she had again and again crossed the border into other states, notably into Connecticut and Rhode Island. The conviction thus steadily and irresistibly forced on her was that all over the United States, from Maine to Florida, from the Atlantic to the Mississippi, the same appalling story held true of the wretched fate of the pauper insane. Everywhere, insane persons confined in cages, closets, cellars, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. The piteous words of her own memorial came back to her, echoed and re-echoed from every side. But, God be praised, not to depress or daunt her, not to make her cry in despair. What, in the way of relief, is one little drop in such an ocean of misery? No, but only to challenge the heroic temper of her mind and start the thrilling thought, if one legislature can thus be besieged and carried by storm, 
why not another and another and another now first broke upon her the length and breadth of the mission to which she felt herself divinely called resolutely and untiringly state by state would she take up the work first exhaustively accumulating the facts and preparing the ammunition and then investing and besieging the various legislatures till they should capitulate to the cry of the perishing within their borders in deliberate planning as she did thus early in her career so vast a campaign was revealed the greatness and compass of her mind the splendors and audacities of moral genius now flashed out in her far more than simply a good and merciful woman was here here was a woman with the grasp of intellect the fertility of resources and the indomitable force of will that go to the make-up of a great statesman or a great military commander end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Frances Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Rhode Island Next. It was during the two years, 1841 to 43, in which Miss Dix was diligently pursuing her investigations in Massachusetts that her leisure time was first systematically devoted to the study of the most advanced methods in the humane and scientific treatment of insanity dr woodward of the worcester asylum dr luther v bell of the mclean and dr john s butler of the newly erected lunatic hospital of boston were her chief teachers with dr butler in especial she was brought into very intimate relations himself a man of great natural benevolence he had in eighteen thirty three when beginning the practice of medicine in worcester come in contact with that remarkable pioneer in the american history of insanity dr woodward and witnessed at his hands what seemed to him such miraculous triumphs in the restoration to sanity of violent madmen as to feel that a new and brighter day was dawning on the world. Doctor, if Llewellyn can be cured, he said of a seemingly desperate case brought under his observation, and which later on was cured, it will be next to a revelation in medicine to me. The strong attraction always exerted over original and experimental minds by demonstrations of a new positive force to deal with now took such hold on Dr. Butler as to convince him that this was the true field for him to enter. Appointed in 1839 superintendent of the Lunatic Hospital of Boston, he very soon brought to bear such tact and skill, such courage and patience, such power of sympathy and personal magnetism, as to work changes in the condition of his patients as marked as those wrought by Pennell, Tuke, and Connolly. Speaking of this institution in 1842, the North American Review says, in an article on insanity in Massachusetts, quote, Its patients are wholly of the pauper class. Its inmates are of the worst and most hopeless class of cases. They are the raving madman and the gibbering idiot, whom, in the language of the inspectors of prisons, hospitals, etc., for Suffolk County, we had formerly seen tearing their clothes amid cold, lacerating their bodies, contracting most filthy habits without self-control, unable to restrain the worst feelings, endeavoring to injure those that approach them, 
giving vent to their irritation in the most passionate, profane, and filthy language, fearing and feared, hating and almost hated. Now they are all neatly clad by day and comfortably lodged in separate rooms by night. They walk quietly, with self-respect, along their spacious and airy halls, or sit in listening groups around the daily paper, or dig in the garden, or handle edged tools, or stroll around the neighborhood with kind and careful attendants. They attend daily and reverently upon religious exercises and make glad music with their united voices. End quote. Eminently fortunate, then, was it for Miss Dix that she was thus enabled to become the pupil of Dr. Butler and to witness with her own eyes the actual transformation of the raging madhouse of the past into the humane retreat of the present, a transformation which is unquestionably the most marvelous triumph ever won by the moral reason of man over brute chaos. Look on this picture and on this. Thus became the more than hamlet cry of her heart. Already has it been stated that, while engaged in her special investigations in Massachusetts, Miss Dix had frequently crossed the border into other states. In Rhode Island had she struck upon scenes of misery to which she made haste to call the attention of benevolent minds. Prominent among these friends of humanity was Thomas G. Hazard, who wrote at this time to a friend, quote, In the course of her investigations, she has ferreted out some cases of human suffering almost beyond conception or belief. One case in a neighboring town to this, of which I was yesterday an eyewitness, which went beyond anything I supposed to exist in the civilized world, and which, without exaggeration, I believe was seldom equaled in the Dark Ages, the particulars of which she will describe to you." End quote. The case to which Thomas G. Hazard alluded was that of Abram Simmons, confined in a dungeon in Little Compton, Rhode Island. To it, Miss Dix later called public attention in the Providence Journal of April 10, 1844, in an article entitled, Astonishing Tenacity of Life. The article illustrates the intensity of feeling and the vigor of style characteristic of her efforts at this period to shake the apathy of the public mind. It is not written over her own signature. When possible, she always preferred to keep herself in the background, and to refer to the testimony of others, in this instance to that of Thomas G. Hazard. Quote, Astonishing Tenacity of Life It is said that grains of wheat, taken from within the envelope of Egyptian mummies some thousands of years old, have been found to germinate and grow, in a number of instances. Even toads and other reptiles have been found alive in situations where it is evident that they must have been encased for many hundreds, if not thousands, of years. It may, however, be doubted whether any instance has ever occurred in the history of the race where the vital principle has adhered so tenaciously to the human body under such a load and complication of sufferings and tortures as in the case of Abram Simmons, an insane man who has been confined for several years in a dungeon in the town of Little Compton in this state. The writer accidentally met a gentleman this morning from that town, who recounted the following facts, with leave to publish them, and there can be no doubt that they are correct. He stated that he visited the cell of Abram Simmons during the past winter, 
His prison was from six to eight feet square, built entirely of stone, sides, roof, and floor, and entered through two iron doors, excluding both light and fresh air, and entirely without accommodation of any description for warming and ventilating. At that time, the internal surface of the walls was covered with a thick frost, adhering to the stone in some places to the thickness of half an inch, as ascertained by actual measurement. The only bed was a small sacking stuffed with straw, lying on a narrow iron bedstead, with two comfortables for a cover. The bed itself was wet, and the outside comfortable was completely saturated with the drippings from the walls, and stiffly frozen. Thus, in utter darkness, encased on every side by walls of frost, his garments constantly more or less wet, with only wet straw to lie upon, and a sheet of ice for his covering, has this most dreadfully abused man existed through the past inclement weather. His teeth must have been worn out by constant and violent chattering for such a length of time, night and day. Poor Tom's a cold. Should any persons in this philanthropic age be disposed from motives of curiosity to visit the place, they may rest assured that traveling is considered quite safe in that part of the country, however improbable it may seem. The people of that region profess the Christian religion, and it is even said that they have adopted some forms and ceremonies which they call worship. It is not probable, however, that they address themselves to poor Simmons' God. Their worship, mingling with the prayers of agony which he shrieks forth from his dreary abode, would make strange discord in the ear of that almighty being, in whose keeping sleeps the vengeance due to all his wrongs. End quote. Later on, in a public document of her own, Miss Dix gives the narrative of her first visit to Little Compton. As it throws farther light alike on the courageous mercy with which she went about her work, and on the character of the persons in whose charge such poor wretches were placed, it seems needful to give it. After investigating carefully the condition of two or three miserable beings confined there, and being warned not to attempt to go into the cell of Simmons, as he would surely kill her, she proceeds as follows with her narrative. Quote, Your other patient, where is he? You shall see, but stay outside till I get a lantern. Accustomed to exploring cells and dungeons in the basements and cellars of poor houses and prisons, I concluded that the insane man spoken of was confined in some dark, damp retreat. Weary and oppressed, I leaned against an iron door which closed the sole entrance to the singular stone structure, much resembling a tomb, yet its use in the courtyard of the poorhouse was not apparent. Soon, low, smothered groans and moans reached me, as if from the buried alive. At this moment the mistress advanced, with keys and a lantern. "'He's here,' said she, unlocking the strong, solid iron door. A step down, and short turn through a narrow passage to the right, brought us, after a few steps, to a second iron door, parallel to the first, and equally solid. In like manner, this was unlocked and opened. But so terribly noxious was the poisonous air that immediately pervaded the passage, that a considerable time elapsed before I was able to return and remain long enough to investigate this horrible den. Language is too weak to convey an idea of the scene presented. 
The candle was remote from the scene, and the flickering rays partly illuminated a spectacle never to be forgotten. The place, when closed, had no source of light or ventilation. It was about seven feet by seven and six and a half high. All, even the roof, was of stone. An iron frame interlaced with rope was the sole furniture. The place was filthy, damp, and noisome. And the inmate, the crazy man, the helpless and dependent creature, cast by the will of providence on the cares and sympathies of his fellow man, there he stood, near the door, motionless and silent. His tangled hair fell about his shoulders. His bare feet pressed the filthy, wet stone floor. He was emaciated to a shadow, etiolated, and more resembled a disinterred corpse than any living creature. Never have I looked upon an object so pitiable, so woe-struck, so imaging despair. I took his hands and endeavored to warm them by gentle friction. I spoke to him of release, of liberty, of care and kindness. Notwithstanding the assertions of the mistress that he would kill me, I persevered. A tear stole over the hollow cheek, but no words answered to my importunities. No other movement indicated consciousness of perception or of sensibility. In moving a little forward, I struck against something which returned a sharp metallic sound. It was a length of ox chain connected to an iron ring which encircled the leg of the insane man. At one extremity, it was joined to what is termed a solid chain, namely bars of iron 18 inches or 2 feet long, linked together and at one end connected by a staple to the rock overhead. My husband, said the mistress, in winter rakes out sometimes of a morning half a bushel of frost, and yet he never freezes referring to the oppressed and life-stricken maniac before us. Sometimes he screams dreadfully, she added, and that is the reason we have the double wall and two doors in place of one. His cries disturbed us in the house. How long has he been here? Oh, above three years, but then he was kept a long while in a cage first but once he broke his chains and the bars and escaped. So we had this built, where he can't get off. Get off? No, indeed. As well might be the buried dead break through the sealed gates of the tomb. End quote. What was the first practicable step toward providing fit accommodation and care for the miserable creatures she had found all over the state of Rhode Island? There already existed a small asylum in the city of Providence, conducted on wise and humane principles, but it was totally inadequate to the demands made on it. Still, it furnished a good foundation and an appeal to the wealthy and humane for means towards its immediate enlargement seemed the wisest present course. In this juncture was it, that the extraordinary power of Miss Dix to reach the heart and purse of those whom everyone else failed to move showed its first proof. Among the list of persons to whom she had resolved to make appeal was Mr. Cyrus Butler, a man of large business capacity, who ultimately left an estate of four million dollars but who, like so many men absorbed in the pursuit of wealth, had contracted a passion for accumulation that rendered it well-nigh impossible to persuade him to give a dollar away. People smiled significantly when Miss Dix announced her intention of calling upon him and expressed the usual sentiment about getting milk out of a stone. But none of these things moved her. 
her faith in human nature, if only strongly and wisely enough appealed to, was invincible. Accompanied, therefore, to the house of Mr. Butler by Reverend Edward B. Hall, D.D. of Providence, who left her at the door, she made the momentous visit. It was a singular interview. For some time, through sheer force of lifelong habit, Mr. Butler sought to put her off by diverting the conversation to the familiar but rather unprofitable topic of the weather. So great is the variety of weather in Rhode Island, as well as in her sister state of Massachusetts, that whole days might thus have been spent without exhausting the subject. Preserving her temper and self-control, Miss Dix pleasantly adjusted herself to the humor of the scene, until finally, feeling that the thing had gone far enough, she rose with commanding dignity and said, Mr. Butler, I wish you to hear what I have to say. I want to bring before you certain facts involving terrible suffering of your fellow creatures all around you, suffering you can relieve. My duty will end when I have done this, and with you will then rest all further responsibility. Then quietly, clearly, and with suppressed emotion, she told the pathetic story of what she had seen with her own eyes. She told it as though, there in that parlor, were standing for judgment two accountable beings before the tribunal of poor Simmons avenging God. Mr. Butler listened spellbound till she was through, and then abruptly said, Miss Dix, what do you want me to do? Sir, I want you to give $40,000 toward the enlargement of the insane hospital in this city. Madam, I'll do it, was his answer. While a signal spiritual triumph to Miss Dix, such an interview reflects honor on both parties. Underneath the hard crust induced by a life of ceaseless addiction to accumulation, it showed the beating of a genuine human heart, prompt to respond to the pleading of such an angel of mercy. The parting with $40,000 by a purely businessman, to whom it might mean a prospective million, involves a mental wrench of which few can appreciate the intensity. Probably there was not another woman in the land who could have commanded such combined power of cogent statement and impassioned fervor as thus, in an hour, to reverse all the deeply rooted habit of a lifetime. The feat attracted great attention at the time in Providence, and afterwards gave rise to many exaggerated stories which went the rounds of the newspapers stories some of which miss dix was at pains publicly to contradict in the press indeed she always spoke of mr butler with sincere respect and felt most gratefully his service to the cause she had so close to heart the name of the asylum was now changed to that of the butler hospital the hospital in which for long years Dr. Isaac Ray proved so invaluable a helper to every shape of mental disease. Later on, farther handsome endowments were made to it by Mr. Alexander Duncan, who had married the niece of Mr. Butler, the heiress to his great fortune. Thus was secured Miss Dix's second asylum victory. In two states already, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, had she been the instrument of prospectively transferring from loathsome dungeons and inhuman treatment to fresh air, freedom from chains, and wise and kindly supervision, several hundred wretched creatures, and in awakening a public sentiment that was the pledge of a better order of things in the future. The look on this picture and on this was taking tangible shape 
in a way to gladden her benevolent heart. Little time did she now waste in denouncing the inhumanity of jailers and almshouse keepers in their treatment of the insane. That average human nature should finally grow exasperated over such shapes of perversity, that ordinary and ignorant men and women, rendered sleepless by midnight yells of profanity and indecency, or kept in terror of fire or violence, should finally give way thoroughly to the wild beast theory, and feel that cellars, outhouses, and iron cages were the only safe places in which to chain up the more desperate cases was no more than what was rationally to be expected. The only relief lay, she clearly saw, in multiplying institutions, presided over by men of the science, elevation of character, and exceptional endowment of patient insight requisite for exercising such seeming demoniacal possession. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 My Firstborn Child Successful, however, as Miss Dix had been in providing for the immediate exigency in Rhode Island through an appeal to private charity, she soon saw with increasing clearness the utter inadequacy of such measures to afford relief on the scale that was imperatively demanded. The farther she pushed her investigations, the vaster and more widespread was discovered to be the evil to be coped with. Comparatively few of the states of the Union had as yet any state asylums. The power of public taxation, on a scale adequate to the work to be accomplished, must now, she felt, be evoked. More even than this, the people of the states must be wrought to a pitch of enlightenment and mercy at which they would feel willing and glad to be taxed. It was in the state of New Jersey, and with the foundation of the asylum at Trenton, that Miss Dix began this, her far larger and more characteristic work, the work no longer of supplementing the deficiencies of institutions already existing, but of creating institutions de novo and out of nothing. There in Trenton was it that she went through the travail of bearing beneath her heart what she ever after characterized as her first-born child, owing its whole life to her as mother. There, forty-five years later, was she herself worn out with toil, age, and disease to die and apartments gratefully tendered for her free use by the trustees of the institution. And there, in those last days of weariness and pain, was it that, when one morning her faithful friend and physician, Dr. John W. Ward, the superintendent of the asylum, came into her room with the joyful intelligence that he was father of his firstborn child, she broke out, yes, and born under the roof of my firstborn child. As the work of Miss Dix, in first breaking ground in the state of New Jersey, in creating there a new and effective public sentiment, and in finally getting this sentiment embodied in positive legislative action, was alike in its tactics, its courage, its persistence, and its power of moral ascendancy, the same which she repeated so marvelously in a whole round of states. It seems best to treat this as a typical instance of her constant rule of action, 
and to go somewhat circumstantially into the story of the nature of the helps and hindrances she there, as everywhere, encountered. To attempt the same of all the great public institutions of which she was single-handed the founder would be to fill many volumes. One example, vividly conceived, will suffice the reader for all. First and foremost, she went forth quietly and alone. No trumpet announced that a distinguished philanthropist was about to probe to the bottom the moral condition of the state, to champion the oppressed, and to prove a terror to evildoers. Here was no excitable novice in hunting, noisily scaring up the game before the piece was charged and the finger on the trigger ready to shoot. In truth, few knew, or so much as suspected, the fact that a quietly dressed woman was moving about from county to county, taking notes of the condition of every jail and almshouse. Thus, foul secrets that would have been carefully hidden away from regularly appointed committees, stopping first tumultuously to dine and wine at the public tavern, were contemptuously exposed to this unheralded, supposedly uninfluential woman. Meanwhile, nothing escaped her trained eye and before people dreamed what she was doing she had gathered her statistics and was master of the position she now had her fulcrum and her archimedes lever through which she felt she could lift a world of moral apathy this preliminary work done and thoroughly done the second resort of miss dix was always to her power of direct personal influence over the leaders of the social and political world. A born leader herself, her instinct for detecting the gift of leadership in others was well nigh infallible. Her insight into character, says of her Dr. P. Bryce, superintendent of the asylum at Tuscaloosa, Alabama, was truly marvelous, and I have never met any one, man or woman, who bore more distinctly the mark of intellectuality. For large numbers of self-supposed men of weight and influence, she entertained a quiet, well-disguised contempt. Well-disguised, however, it always was. They never found it out. She was careful to make no enemies whenever she could help it, for so thoroughly did she identify herself with her cause as to feel that enmity to her would mean enmity to it many and many the humble country member of the legislature a man of few words but those words rocks who was recognized by her if for no other quality but honest stubbornness in maintaining a position once taken as in reality a more important factor to be reckoned with than a score of noisy, bustling politicians. Especially among the plain Quakers of New Jersey, men and women did she recruit stanch supporters, who once enlisted never deserted the ranks. From the moment, however, when it became the question of practically engineering a bill through the legislature, then it was another matter, and she imperatively insisted on putting the full management into the hands of men of first-rate political ability, men humane, indeed, and sincerely interested, but men abreast with every device and trick of the enemy. Her memorial once written, charged to the cannon's mouth with grape and canister, and behind it the explosive fulminate of her own latent passion, then the question of who should touch off the piece, to recur to Dr. Howe's apt figure of speech, whether someone who would aim at nothing and hit nothing, 
or someone who should discharge it straight into the thickest ranks, was to her an issue, as all important as, with Napoleon or Nelson, that of who should handle his artillery or point his broadsides. Just here, in the profound influence she exercised over many of these leaders, and in her consequent power to secure from them the most chivalrous service, lay one marked secret of Miss Dix's unexampled success. By a sure instinct of compassion, she speedily found her way into the heart of every household where affliction was on hand. There was, it might be, an invalid wife in the home, or a young daughter wasting away with disease, or a promising son blighted on the threshold of life by threatened or actual insanity. Into these households she stole, an angel of consolation, her sustaining power in all hours of darkness and pain a marvel to those uplifted by it. At last came the day when this was remembered in some memorable act. Let a single example of how remembered suffice. The especial case here instanced was communicated to the writer of this biography by Dr. Eugene Grissom, superintendent of the Insane Asylum at Raleigh, North Carolina, and though occurring in another state than New Jersey, still illustrates a frequently repeated experience in Miss Dix's efforts at passing her hospital bills. Quote, the first appropriation bill, looking to the erection of an asylum in North Carolina, was defeated. Mrs. Dobbin, wife of Honorable James C. Dobbin of Fayetteville, afterwards Secretary of the Navy, was very sick at Raleigh. Her husband was a member of the house. On her deathbed, she expressed to Miss Dix her deep gratitude for the tender care that noble woman had given her in her own illness, and almost with her dying breath, begged her gifted husband to repay her own debt of gratitude to Miss Dix by another effort to pass the asylum bill. Almost as soon as the last sad services of interment were ended, Mr. Dobbin entered the house, clad in the deepest mourning and broken with sorrow. He entered at once on the fulfillment of the duty he owed to the pious dead and the afflicted living. Feeling keenly his own bereavement and cherishing sympathy for the woes of others, Sustained by the profound sympathy that moved every bosom, he redeemed nobly his last promise to a dying wife by a speech which made a great impression at the time, and the tradition of which has descended to this generation. All was favorable to the orator. His own nature was moved to its very depths. His heart was softened and made tender, by a distressing bereavement. Gratitude to Miss Dix, deep sympathy for the smitten of God, a yearning desire to help the unfortunate, all moved the gifted and generous North Carolinian, and he rose to the great demands of the occasion and the height of the argument, producing an oration rarely equaled. All opposition disappeared under the power of the eloquent and pathetic pleader, and the bill passed by an overwhelming vote. End quote. Almost from the start of Miss Dix's career in her work of carrying the state legislatures, so profound was the impression made by her exceptional personality that in a special room, or separate alcove in the library, was habitually set apart for her, in which to be visited by the members. There she studied with eager scrutiny the list of the representatives in the assembly, endeavoring to find out, as far as possible, the character of each for humanity or self-seeking, courage or servility to public opinion. 
Before very long, she knew them thoroughly, many of them far more thoroughly than they ever knew themselves. She did not, however, herself enter the halls of legislation, nor seek interviews of the members in their homes or in the lobbies. Always she laid great stress on preserving her womanly dignity and saw plainly how easy it was to vulgarize alike a cause and its representative by a pushing and teasing demeanor. Members of either house were brought in by influential friends to her own room or alcove, and there she wrought on them in every way of cogent argument and eloquent entreaty. The only exception to this, of a slightly more public nature, was her habit of inviting into the parlor of her boarding-house from fifteen to twenty gentlemen at a time for conversation and discussion. When once her memorial had been read to the legislature, and then, through the medium of the newspapers, had been brought before the general public, she next worked with energy the instrumentality of the press writing for it innumerable articles herself, and enlisting in the same service all who wielded eloquent pens. To rouse all over the state a powerful public opinion was an aim she never lost sight of, no one knowing more clearly the subserviency to it of politicians. To return now, from these more general statements of Miss Dix's methods to the immediate case of the passage of the New Jersey Bill, which ushered into the world her first-born asylum child. It was first on January 23, 1845, that her memorial to the legislature of New Jersey was presented to the Senate by Miss Dix's stanch supporter, Honorable Joseph S. Dodd. Like all her public papers, it was written with great ability and embodied a judicious blending of pathetic appeal with strong rational argument. Less nakedly terrible than the Massachusetts Memorial, it was more tender in its spirit, fuller, indeed, of the comforting hope of the redeeming purgatorio than of the despair of the rayless inferno. Gleams of light are thrown on the gratitude in the hearts of the poor sufferers for the smallest attempts to alleviate their miseries, as will be seen in the following extracts. Quote, One whom I was so fortunate as to have removed to a situation of greater comfort and to supply with some of the common necessaries of common life, said, raising his trembling arms reverently, God's Spirit bids this message to you, saying it is his work you are doing. Lo, it shall prosper in your hands. Another, a female, whose scarred limbs bore marks of the cankering iron war for many weary years, said, I could curse those who chain me like a brute beast, and I do, too, but sometimes the soft voice says, Pray for thine enemy, and this it sings often, while the sun shines on the poor mind. But darkness comes, and then the thoughts are evil continually, and the soul is black. End quote. How farther all classes, rich as well as poor, highly intellectual as well as feeble minded, are exposed alike to the visitation of this fearful scourge was strikingly illustrated by instances of which the following gives a touching example. Quote, On a level with the cellar in a basement room, which was tolerably decent but bare enough of comforts, lay, upon a small bed, a feeble aged man, whose few gray locks fell tangled about his pillow. As we entered, he addressed one present, saying, I am all broken up, all broken up. Do you feel much weaker then, Judge? The mind, the mind is going, 
almost gone, responded he, in tones of touching sadness. Yes, he continued, murmuring to himself, the mind is going. This feeble, depressed old man, a pauper, helpless, lonely, and yet conscious of surrounding circumstances, and not now wholly oblivious of the past, this feeble old man, who was he? I answer as I was answered, but he is not unknown to many of you. In his young and vigorous years, he filled various places of honor and trust among you. His ability as a lawyer raised him to the bench. As a jurist, he was distinguished for uprightness, clearness, and impartiality. He also was judge of the orphan's court. He was for many years a member of the legislature. His habits were correct, and I could learn from those who had known him for many years nothing to his discredit, but much that commends men to honor and respect. The meridian of an active and useful life was passed. The property, honestly acquired, on which he relied for comfortable support during his declining years, was lost through some of those fluctuations which so often produce reverses for thousands. He became insane, and his insanity assumed the form of frenzy. He was chained for safety. End quote. The memorial, once presented to the Senate, as above stated, by Honorable Joseph S. Dodd, was followed by him with the immediate preamble and resolution, quote, Whereas the expediency of erecting a state lunatic asylum having been at various times under the consideration of the legislature of this state, and it appearing by the facts now before us in relation to this subject that we greatly need such an establishment, therefore resolved by the Senate and General Assembly of the State of New Jersey that the time has now arrived when it is the duty of the State to enter upon the execution of this work by the adoption of the necessary measures for that purpose during the present session of the legislature. End quote. This was read and ordered to lie on the table for the present. The next day, Mr. Dodd saw it to be necessary to modify the previous resolution by calling for a joint committee of both houses for farther consideration of the subject. The resolution was passed, and Messrs. Dodd, Wirtz, and Willits were appointed on the part of the Senate, and later on, Messrs. Evans, Bond, Pearson, and Fort on the part of the House of Assembly. By February 25th, the Joint Committee made their report. They declared it unnecessary for them to occupy farther time as they could only repeat what is better said in the Memorial of Mystics, which presents the whole subject in so lucid a manner as to supersede the necessity of farther remark from us. The report concluded with the following fervid appeal. Quote, is then our path any longer doubtful? Have we not every indication by the facts in our possession that the time has now arrived for entering at once upon this enterprise so dear to the philanthropist, the Christian, and the patriot, and inseparably connected with the welfare of those for whom it is designed, an enterprise whose beneficent operation will be felt not only by this, but by generations to come after us, and, as we hope, through all future time, an enterprise that will reflect more lasting honor on the state and tell more upon human happiness than all our legislation for the last half century. We are behind the movements of the age and the spirit of the times. Let us be up and doing. We are behind our sister states. 
many of them have already moved forward in this field of humane exertion with a zeal and liberality that do them honor. And shall we, Jersey men, who are proud of the name, be left far in the distance, or not move at all, sitting still, with our arms folded in inglorious sloth, satisfied if we can reap, though partially, the benefit of their labors, rather than provide for ourselves those privileges for which we are now dependent on them? End quote. In Miss Dix's habitual experience, in dealing with state legislatures, so thoroughly had at this stage of the proceedings the preliminary work been done that, as a rule, the higher-minded members of both houses and the more enlightened portion of the community might now be relied on as genuine converts to the measure. Just at this point, however, usually began the real tug-of-war with another class of minds. After the first outburst of generous enthusiasm, a reaction was sure to set in. However pitiful the hearts of constituents, still every bill involving inevitable increase of taxation is sure to search those acutely sensitive nerves that have their terminal peripheries in the pocket. Now comes the chance of the demagogue, eager to make capital out of his championship of the interests of an already overburdened public, now the day of fear and quaking to the timid member who feels his chance of re-election at stake should he venture to vote for the proposed measure. By the way, said at a later date to Miss Dix, a friend with whom she was talking, a gentleman of the house told me that the biggest gun that was leveled to defeat his re-election was the fact of having voted to publish your memorial. What did he answer? Why, that he would have been proud of such a defeat. But large numbers were of a more lowly frame of mind, and felt no such lofty pride in the prospect of political martyrdom. Here, then, was the crisis in which mystics always found the severest and most unremitting work imposed upon her. She was up every morning before sunrise, writing letters and editorials. Through all the hours of the session she was holding private interviews with members. In the evenings, as often as possible, she was arguing with and entreating a company of fifteen to twenty specially invited to her parlor, generally the most obstinate cases to deal with. Only at midnight did she seek her pillow. It was exhausting work, for on her individual power to ray out light enough to illuminate ignorant minds and to radiate heat and glow enough to kindle the apathetic turned the whole issue. A glimpse into her own hours, alike of depression and of joy, is caught in the following letter of this date to her friend Mrs. Hare of Philadelphia. Quote, I must write to you. I must have your sympathy. How I long for your heart-charming smile. Just now I need calmness. I am exhausted under this perpetual effort and exercise of fortitude. At Trenton, thus far, all is prosperous. But you cannot imagine the labor of conversing and convincing some evenings I had at once twenty gentlemen for three hours' steady conversation. The last evening, a rough country member, who had announced in the house that the wants of the insane in New Jersey were all humbug, and who came to overwhelm me with his arguments, after listening an hour and a half with wonderful patience to my details and to principles of treatment, suddenly moved into the middle of the parlor and thus delivered himself. Ma'am, I bid you good night. I do not want, for my part, to hear anything more. The others can stay if they want to. I am convinced. 
you've conquered me out and out. I shall vote for the hospital. If you'll come to the house and talk there, as you've done here, no man that isn't a brute can stand you. And so, when a man's convinced, that's enough. The Lord bless you. And thereupon he departed. End quote. No doubt Miss Dix went to bed that night in a happy and grateful frame of mind. In these individual victories, constantly repeated, lay the hiding place of her power. But there remained always a plenty of material needing conversion, and, quite as likely as not, she would wake up the following morning only to read in the newspaper report of the debate of the preceding day a speech from an unterrified member like the following. Quote, Sir, I shall not trust the estimate of these commissioners who have devised the plan of this Egyptian Coliseum. New Jersey has hitherto acted well. She has kept clear of a national debt, which some folks call a national blessing. Let us husband our resources. I had rather spend the money in educating the children of the state, qualifying them to act their part well in life, and preparing them for eternity. There'll be a day of account, and it's not far ahead. I have seldom prophesied on this floor, but it turned out correct. True, I missed it last year. I do believe that if that Miss Dix had been paid five hundred or six hundred dollars and escorted over the Delaware or to Philadelphia, or even one thousand dollars and taken to Washington City, and, if you choose, enshrined in the White House, it would have been money well laid out. Now I should like the whys and wherefores for a building 487 feet long and 80 feet wide for maybe 20 lunatics. I believe that the best thing we could do would be to appropriate 200 or 300 dollars to fill up the cellars and sow them over with grass seed so that the spot may not be seen hereafter. You couldn't do a more popular act. End quote. Unquestionably, the report of a speech like this was read with as lively satisfaction by an elect class of its author's constituents, and was as highly applauded for its combination of a soaring imagination with a strict eye to business, as the honorable member could himself have desired. But this was not the kind of oratory nor was this the type of man of whom Miss Dick stood in any sort of fear. A few solid words from the plain country member, who the night before had said, Ma'am, you've conquered me out and out, I'll vote for the hospital, would, she knew, dispose effectually of a full hour of such spread-eagle eloquence. The man, however, of whom she did always stand in dread, was the man of great natural flux of sentimental speech, who from the outset insinuated himself into the minds of his audience as the friend and champion of all the world's disinherited ones, never failing likewise to make effusive allusion to herself as that heaven-sent angel of mercy— and yet who forthwith proceeded to insist that now, alas, the exigency had arrived when it was the stern dictate of duty to control such sensibilities, even though with bleeding hearts they should feel obliged to vote against the bill before them. It may be well, therefore, in commenting on these various legislative experiences to which Miss Dix had to adjust herself, to give a specimen of the kind of speech and the kind of man she always felt to be most dangerous. The speech in question was not delivered before the New Jersey legislature, but at another period and in another state. Still, it is one of those clear-cut, 
polished gems of eloquence which perfectly illustrates the case in hand. Quote, Senators, the liberal man, saith Solomon, deviseth liberal things, and by liberal things shall he prosper. To this sentiment I respond, and hold it to be true no less of states than individuals. None, sir, is a firmer friend than myself to this charity, but, sir, my experience, limited as it is, has taught me that the same law governs in the moral as in the physical world, and that premature development is attended by premature decay. It becomes us, therefore, to be borne away by no childlike sensibility, no generous enthusiasm, no overzeal, nor haste to accomplish an acknowledged good. Under these views and feelings, therefore, I am constrained, Mr. President, at this time, to oppose this project under every aspect it may now assume before us. In conclusion, I should do injustice to my feelings if I omitted this occasion to express my unlimited admiration of the distinguished zeal and ability with which this measure has been prosecuted by the remarkable lady who, it is but due to her to say, has been its chief promoter and friend. Woman, Mr. President, is ever lovely, and when she assumes the rare and sacred office of disinterested philanthropy, she becomes indeed an angel. End quote. To be called an angel, and in the same breath have her bill for the relief of the outcasts of the earth voted down, was a strain of celestial compliment for which Miss Dix never manifested a trace of feminine relish. Much more delicately did she appreciate the testimonial of a rough-and-ready proposition to raise five hundred or six hundred dollars to escort her over the Delaware or to Philadelphia or even one thousand dollars to enshrine her in the White House. For this proved demonstratively that she was making so strong an impression that low-minded men felt it was worth thirty pieces of silver to get rid of affording her any further chance to deceive the people. To conclude now this full and detailed account of the passage of the bill for the establishment of the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, an account which, as before stated, must serve for a typical instance of the helps and hindrances encountered by mystics in all her widespread and marvelously successful legislative work. By March 14, 1845, the act of authorization was taken up and read for the last time, and the proposition to postpone farther action till the next session of the legislature voted down in the Senate eyes two, nays sixteen. Upon the question, shall this bill now pass? Eyes eighteen, nays none. March twentieth, certain amendments were proposed by the House of Assembly, to which, March twenty-fourth, the Senate agreed. Then, March twenty-fifth, the reengrossed bill passed. Eighteen eyes, nays, none. The victory was absolute. The state had covered itself with glory. Immediately, Honorable Joseph S. Dodd sent in word to Miss Dix, anxiously yet confidently awaiting intelligence in her room, quote, Senate Chamber, New Jersey. I am happy to announce to you the passage unanimously of the bill for the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. End quote. It was in her mind's eye alone that Miss Dix could as yet see the full meaning of this vote. So far, only a castle in the air was it at whose ideal foundations and superstructure she had thus been working. The stately buildings, the ample and beautiful grounds, with their grass slopes, 
trees, flowers, and sparkling fountains, the quiet, homelike wards, the wise and tender care that were to take home to their arms so many of the friendless and wretched, all these benedictions, which were to spring from the victory she had won, had as yet neither a local habitation nor a name. But she was one of those highly favored ones who believe without seeing, nay, one of that exceptional class of consecrated workers for humanity who are permitted to behold their most high-wrought visionary ideals finally materialized before their eyes in a corresponding real and actual. The day was drawing on when, in twenty different states, she was to see with the bodily eye such an outward and tangible witness of the power of her own inner life as is rarely given to a mortal to behold. Verily, Thou wast a mighty builder before the Lord, is the exclamation involuntarily wrung from the mind of any one who, following her footsteps from state to state, enters, one after another, the beautiful parks, and traverses the halls and wards of the immense structures she, with the Aladdin's lamp of her own moral genius, summoned into being. Very easy is it, then, to appreciate the enthusiasm with which her friend, Dr. S. G. Howe, wrote to her from Boston on July 15th of this year, 1845. Quote, As for you, my friend, what shall I say to you to express my feelings respecting your course since I have seen you personally? Nothing, for words would fail me. And besides, you want not words of human praise. I look back at the time when the whisperings of maiden delicacy made you hesitate about obeying the stern voice of conscience. I recollect what you were then. I think of your noble career since, and I say, God grant me to look back upon some three years of my life with a part of the self-approval you must feel. I ask no higher fortune. No one need say to you, go on, for you have heard a higher than any human voice, and you will follow whither it calleth. God give you as much strength as you have courage for your mission. End, quote. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. In Journeyings Often. In the letter of Dr. S. G. Howe, quoted at the conclusion of the last chapter, wondering allusion was made by him to the range and multiplicity of Miss Dix's labors during the previous three years. Of the actual extent of these labors, no due notice has as yet been taken, as it seemed wiser for the time to concentrate attention wholly on her work in New Jersey, and to emphasize it as an illustration of the methods she habitually adopted. In reality, only a portion of the years 1843 to 45 had been spent by her in New Jersey, either while engaged in collecting from county to county her statistics or while laboring with members of the legislature. Often the legislature was not in session. Often it was engaged on other business— Often matters were in such promising train that she could safely leave them in the hands of able friends. Meanwhile, she was at work with equal zeal in the neighboring state of Pennsylvania, conducting at Harrisburg, the capital, quite as arduous a campaign and one destined to prove as successful. Thus it happened that the date of the passage of a bill for founding an entirely new state institution at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 
corresponded very closely with the passage of the bill for the foundation of that at Trenton, New Jersey. Two equally great trophies of humanity, one in a single year. Only constructively, therefore, as in the parallel human case of the birth of twins into the family, can the term first-born child, the term always so dear to the heart of its fostering mother, be applied to the Trenton Asylum. Indeed, so rapidly did these asylum children now begin to follow one another into existence all over the land as to drive a bewildered biographer to the conviction that, unless distinguishing marks in the way of red, green, or blue ribbons shall be tied around their infant wrists, hopeless confusion will ere long ensue as to natal hours. One capital sign of a mind capable of accomplishing great results had now become evident in Miss Dix. She knew when she had done enough in a given place or at a given period, and was haunted with no misgivings that, unless her own hand were perpetually on the wheel, in the immediate act of steering, the ship would surely be run onto a reef. There was a time for her to be taking her observations, working her reckoning, studying her charts, and laying out the course of the whole broad India voyage. No less a subject than the immensity of the work called for by the condition of the insane in a large majority of the states of the Union, as well as in the British Dominion of Canada, had now taken full possession of her. Accordingly, in these actual two years in which she achieved her great successes in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, she is to be found making long and arduous journeys all along the wide stretch from Nova Scotia to New Orleans and mastering the conditions of the problem before her. A letter or two of widely differing dates will serve to bring before the mind the extent of these circumnavigations of charity. The letters were written to her friend, Miss Heath. Quote, Lexington, Kentucky, December 22, 1843. I left Boston in September, as you know, visited en route the prisons on Long Island and in the city of New York, also those of New Jersey, and duly reached Philadelphia. There, and at Harrisburg, I was detained a fortnight. Proceeding to Baltimore, I visited prisons there, and so on as far as Pittsburgh West, thence to Cincinnati, where I arrived the last of October. The first of November I came to Kentucky, and have been laboriously traveling through the counties, collecting facts and information ever since, except a week which I took in Tennessee. The legislature being in session in Nashville, I desired to do something for the state prison. This effected, I crossed the country by a rapid journey to Louisville, traveling by stage two days and nights. I proceed tomorrow to the northeast counties, if well enough. I have engaged lodgings in Frankfort, Kentucky, for January and February, and shall probably go to the southern prisons after the legislature rises in this state. End quote. Quote, At sea, steamer Charleston, from Savannah to Charleston, a storm, lying to. March 31st, 1845. A temporary quiet, induces me to use the only writing materials I have now at hand. I designed using the spring and summer chiefly in examining the jails and poorhouses of Indiana and Illinois. Having successfully completed my mission in Kentucky, I learned that traveling in the states referred to would be difficult, if not impossible for some weeks to come, on account of mud and rains. This decided me to go down the Mississippi to examine the prisons and hospitals of New Orleans, 
and returning to see the state prisons of Louisiana at Baton Rouge, of Mississippi at Jackson, of Arkansas at Little Rock, of Missouri at Jefferson City, and of Illinois at Alton. I have seen incomparably more to approve than to censure in New Orleans. I took the resolution, being so far on the way, of seeing the state institutions of Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina. Though this has proved excessively fatiguing, I rejoice that I have carried out the purpose." End quote. It is by a vigorous exercise of the imagination alone that even a faint idea can be conceived of the difference between the fatigue and peril involved in journeying such thousands of miles as far back as 1845, and the speed, ease, and luxury with which the same distances can be accomplished today. Comparatively nothing then existed of the enormous network of railways which, at this date, enables the traveler to penetrate at will every nook and corner of the immense area of the United States. Steamboats on the rivers, and by land, a few lines of coaches and the hire of private conveyances were then the main dependence. The craziest of vehicles, the most deplorable roads, and taverns whose regulation diet of cornbread and bacon and greens would have undermined the digestion of an ostrich, were, in the South and West, the rule, and not the exception. Those, too, were the reckless racing times on the Ohio, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers, the exuberant days of the earlier national effervescence when, to fall back on the picturesque expressions of the period, the moment a rival steamboat hove in sight, the heaviest man on board was commissioned to sit on the safety valve, while the excited planters flocked round the captain, eager to dedicate their last ham on the freight bills, or a side of greasy bacon to feeding the fury of the rival furnace fires. Death by explosion counted little against the glory of victory. Safe escaped to land, however, discomfort or positive peril merely assumed a different shape. From the setting in of the autumn rains to the heat and dryness of the ensuing spring, the endless stretches of the clay lands of the south and west became a continent of seemingly bottomless mud. Few bridges spanned the creeks and rivers, which were passable only at certain fords, often swollen by rains and by the force of the current rendered dangerous to the last degree. Frequent inundations submerged the country for miles back of the watercourses, and where the actual roads were not pure and unadulterated mud, axle-deep and as tenacious as India rubber, they were largely a corduroy of logs, alternately rotted out, over which the vehicle thumped and then bounded into the air with a force which left every bone and muscle bruised and sore. The drivers, as a rule, were careless, happy-go-lucky Negroes, or poor whites, fortified with whiskey enough to lift them into a realm of serene unconsciousness of risks. Malarious fevers were widely prevalent, and in years of cholera or other epidemics, the lack of medical skill and the general recklessness in the habits of life ensured their rapid spread. Now, the very nature of the work Miss Dix was thus opening up involved that she, a lone and unprotected woman, should penetrate every quarter where an almshouse was to be inspected or an abuse ferreted out. When not stopping over at any state capital during a session of the legislature, she must keep herself indefatigably at her task of massing an amount of eye-witness evidence, at once so exact 
that none could gainsay it, and so moving in its appeal for redress that the most hardened and selfish alone could resist it. Of the large number of memorials she was to write and bring before various legislatures, memorials to the ability, eloquence, and judgment of which no less a man than the celebrated Chancellor Kent paid the highest tribute of praise, each had to be a separate work with its own local coloring. Kentucky did not concern itself with the state of things in Tennessee, nor Tennessee with that in Kentucky. The states were sovereign. Thus, in the presence of each new legislative David, must she stand up with the commanding authority of a fresh Nathan to point the finger and cry, Thou art the man. Of course, the amount of labor, physical, mental, and emotional, involved in conducting these campaigns, and no other word but campaigns can adequately characterize them, was enormous. And so the question of her habits and manner of economizing her forces becomes a highly interesting one, as always in the case of those who accomplish great results. Miss Dix was one more illustration of the so common saying that the work of the world is done by its invalids. Like all such sayings, this especial one has truth enough in it to make it worthy of serious thought. Again and again in the world's history has it turned out that it is the general wolf, consumed with the hectic fever of the last stages of consumption, who scales the heights of Abraham and takes Quebec, the doctor Elijah Kent Kane, who, sentenced to death by his physicians, but resolved to die in harness, goes farther than any of his day toward penetrating the ice barriers of the North Pole. The Darwin, economizing his intervals of ten minutes relief from suffering, who leads the van of the naturalists of Europe, and solving the problem of the origin of the species. Nor is the reason, a high endowment of ability once allowed for, so far to seek. It is as simple, in fact, as the question why an engine of ten horsepower, its piston rod packed tight and its valves fitting with precision, is capable of as much work as an engine of twenty horsepower, its draft choked with soot, and its cylinders leaking steam at every joint. The superb dower of physical life, nine-tenths of which a giant, like Daniel Webster, uses up in digesting enormous dinners, washed down by copious draughts of wine, and in the excessive amount of outdoor exercise requisite to enabling him to accomplish the feat, is found in the end to yield no more available working force than these careful invalids, consecrated to arms, science, or humanity, manage to rest from the wreck of their lungs, nerves, or digestion. This lesson of the wise economy of her strength Miss Dix has now mastered, as far as it ever is mastered by natures consumed by such passion of self-sacrifice. She suffered no social engagements to divert her from her chosen object. Her business habits were prompt and accurate, and no arrears of correspondence were allowed to accumulate. Relief from overstrain of sympathy and such constant familiarity with misery and degradation she sought in an unfailing delight in nature, in the keen interest she always kept up in botanical study, as well as through that habitual devout communion with God, which was to her perpetual invigoration and peace. Thus, while her friends were in constant fear of her succumbing in some lonely place, she always contrived to go to the very verge of self-destruction, without falling over the edge, 
illustrating in her own peculiar way the words of St. Paul, as dying, and behold, we live. Somewhere in her constitution, there must have been a most tenacious fiber. Again and again in those days, she was attacked with hemorrhage, again and again prostrated with malarial fever. Indeed, as her lifelong friend, Dr. Charles H. Nichols, of the Bloomingdale Asylum of New York, said of her, her system became actually saturated with malaria. And yet her brain never yielded. Throughout her long life, she never knew the meaning of a headache. Meanwhile, she exercised a certain prudence of her own. Whenever, in the midst of her most exacting labors, she found herself in a position where the force of flood or washout proved too much even for her indomitable resolve to press forward, she would take continuously to her bed and store up sleep enough, sometimes thirteen to sixteen hours on a stretch, to tide her over the next two or three nights of jolting in wretched vehicles over corduroy roads. Indeed, these chance opportunities of indulging in protracted sleep she seems always to have regarded in the same light in which devout Roman Catholics look upon the superfluous merits of the saints, namely, as a sacred storehouse on which to draw for the benefit of the shortcomings of many an evil day and night. The excellent military practice of always carrying along with each piece of artillery an extra wheel, together with a due store of subsidiary traces, linchpins, rammers, and repairing tools, was, moreover, one which, as far as was possible in the case of a lone woman with a limited supply of hand baggage, Miss Dix now sedulously adopted on all her journeys. Southern roads were then well nigh as destructive to wheels and harness as the average fire of an enemy's battery in time of war. Many the occasion of wrench or break befalling her wagon, on which she was forced to dismount into deep mud and under a drenching rain, only to find that her shiftless negro driver was without the simplest means of repairing the damage. Extra wheels and axles, indeed, it was beyond her power to supply from her private stores. But one or two such experiences encountered and laid to heart, she ever after made a practice of carrying with her an outfit of hammer, wrench, nails, screws, a coil of rope, and straps of stout leather, which under many a mishap sufficed to put things to rights and enable her to pursue her journey. It could be wished that more incidents illustrative of these ventures by flood and field had been preserved for record. An invincible reticence on the part of Miss Dix prevented her talking about herself, and she was, moreover, too constantly worn out with her work to have freshness enough left for picturesque narration. Her letters of this period to friends are largely simple itineraries to acquaint them with her whereabouts, and are written by snatches on steamboats and trains, in stations and post offices, or while sitting on a stump awaiting repairs on a broken carriage, with tools furnished out of her own workshop. Here there is a brief record. Cholera on board. Here, a letter headed, Stuck fast on a mud bar ten miles below Vicksburg. Here another, Up again from malarial fever, Off for Jackson, Mississippi, tonight. At times, perhaps, she will condescend To enlarge more fully on a river ford, a natural phenomenon for which, no doubt on sufficient grounds of chills and fever, she seems to have entertained an especial aversion, as in the following extract. Quote, 
I have encountered nothing so dangerous as river fords. I crossed the Yadkin, where it was three-fourths of a mile wide, rough bottom, often in places rapid currents, the water always up to the bed of the carriage and sometimes flowing in. The horses rested twice on sandbars. A few miles beyond the river, having just crossed a deep branch two hundred yards wide, the axle-tree of the carriage broke and away rolled one of the back wheels. One highly interesting incident, however, has been preserved, which would no doubt serve as an example of many another experience, not in all probability alike in kind, but still quite as illustrative of her courageous character. The version of it here, given first, appeared in print in the Greenville, South Carolina Patriot, and, as it was sent, in slip, by Miss Dix to her bosom friend, Miss Anne E. Heath, has thus her own endorsement. The date of the occurrence was unquestionably several years later than the period of her career we are now engaged on, but while describing the nature of her lonely and exposed journeyings, this seems the most appropriate place in which to introduce it. Quote, An Interesting Incident The other day, in conversation with Miss Dix, the philanthropist, during her visit to Greenville, a lady said to her, Are you not afraid to travel all over the country alone? And have you not encountered dangers and been in perilous situations? I am naturally timid, said Miss Dix, and diffident like all my sex. But in order to carry out my purposes, I know that it is necessary to make sacrifices and encounter dangers. It is true I have been, in my travels through the different states, in perilous situations. I will mention one which occurred in the state of Michigan. I had hired a carriage and driver to convey me some distance through an uninhabited portion of the country. In starting, I discovered that the driver, a young lad, had a pair of pistols with him. Inquiring what he was doing with arms, he said he carried them to protect us, as he had heard that robberies had been committed on our road. I said to him, Give me the pistols. I will take care of them. He did so reluctantly. In pursuing our journey through a dismal-looking forest, a man rushed into the road, caught the horse by the bridle, and demanded my purse. I said to him, with as much self-possession as I could command, Are you not ashamed to rob a woman? I have but little money, and that I want to defray my expenses in visiting prisons and poorhouses, and occasionally in giving to objects of charity. If you have been unfortunate, are in distress, and in want of money, I will give you some. While thus speaking to him, I discovered his countenance changing, and he became deathly pale. My God! he exclaimed. That voice! And immediately told me that he had been in the Philadelphia penitentiary and had heard me lecturing to some of the prisoners in an adjoining cell, and that he now recognized my voice. He then desired me to pass on, and expressed deep sorrow at the outrage he had committed. But I drew out my purse and said to him, I will give you something to support you, until you can get into honest employment. He declined at first, taking anything, until I insisted on his doing so, for fear he might be tempted to rob someone else before he could get into honest employment. Had not Miss Dix taken possession of the pistols, in all probability they would have been used by her driver, and perhaps both of them murdered. That voice was more powerful in subduing the heart of a robber than the sight of a brace of pistols. End quote. 
when it is recalled that no farther back than march eighteen forty one miss dix's friend rev john t g nichols had expressed serious fears of a person in such feeble health so much as taking charge of a sunday school class in the east cambridge jail the results accomplished before the close of 1845 seem well nigh miraculous. In a letter to Mrs. Rathbone of Liverpool, they were summed up by her in the following words, quote, I have traveled more than 10,000 miles in the last three years, have visited 18 state penitentiaries, 300 county jails and houses of correction, more than five hundred almshouses and other institutions besides hospitals and houses of refuge i have been so happy as to promote and secure the establishment of six hospitals for the insane several county poorhouses and several jails on a reformed plan footnote the six insane asylums to which Miss Dix refers were the Worcester Mass Asylum, greatly enlarged, the Butler Asylum in Providence, Rhode Island, practically refounded, the Trenton and the Harrisburg Asylums, her own outright creation, the Utica, New York Asylum, doubled in size. To these is to be added the name of another, outside the territory of the United States, in Toronto, Canada West. As early as 1843, she had memorialized the Provincial Parliament of Canada East and West assembled, and had enlisted the energetic interest of the governor and other leading authorities in her scheme. Sir Charles Metcalfe wrote her that, but for her efforts and labors there, Canada West would still have long needed a hospital for the insane. Of her work also, in procuring the reformation of jails and almshouses, Horace Mann said that it would make as wonderful a record as her more especial work in behalf of the insane. End footnote. It seems only natural, then, that her happiness should find such expression as in the following extract from a letter written on board a steamboat on the Ohio River to her friend, Mrs. Hare of Philadelphia. Quote, I have had some of the most delightful evidences of good accomplishing and to be done the past week. I am very happy and wonder while such holy rewards reach me for effort and sacrifice. I should ever find myself faltering or sighing for the life of repose, which, in the distance, seems to me so attractive. End quote. And yet, as this narrative proceeds, it will be seen that this was as yet but the day of small things with her. End chapter 12. Chapter 13 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Vini Vidi Vici. The campaign, or rather series of campaigns, which for the next nine years were to engage Miss Dix promised to call for all her resources. They involved nothing less than carrying the legislatures of Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Maryland, besides the establishment of two entirely new asylums in the British provinces, the one at Halifax, Nova Scotia, the other at St. John, Newfoundland. Fortunately, 
there have been preserved letters of various dates during those nine years which will help to illustrate the spirit and success of her undertakings. Nothing, it is said, tends to develop so swiftly in reluctant minds a sense of personal responsibility as boldly and suddenly thrusting responsibility on them. Certainly, of this kind of tactics, a striking instance is given in the ensuing letter of Miss Dix to Mrs. Hare of Philadelphia. Quote, Raleigh, North Carolina, November 27, 1848. They say nothing can be done here. I reply, I know no such word in the vocabulary I adopt. It is declared that no word will be uttered in opposition to my claims, but that the Democrats, having banded as a party to vote for nothing that involves expense, will unite and silently vote down the bill. A motion was made to order lighting the lamps in the portico of the Capitol and voted down by the Democrats. Ye love darkness because your deeds are evil, said a Whig in great ire. And a voice from the gallery responded piously, For ye are of your father the devil. This morning after breakfast, several gentlemen called, all Whigs, talked of the hospital, and said the most discouraging things possible. I sent for the leading Democrats, went to my room, and brought my memorial, written under the exhaustion of ten weeks' most fatiguing journeys and labors. Gentlemen, I said, here is the document I have prepared for your assembly. I desire you, sir, to present it, handing it to a Democrat popular with his party. And you, gentlemen, I said, turning to the astonished delegation, you, I expect, will sustain the motion this gentleman will make to print the same. They took leave, I do sincerely think, fully believing in a failure, but I thought I could not have canvassed the state for nothing. So the result proved. The memorial was presented. The motion to print twelve extra copies for each member was offered and passed without one dissenting vote. These steps are, then, safely and successfully made. The deep waters are yet to pass, but my heart is fixed and fixed my eye, and I am girded for the race. The Lord is strong, and I rely on his assisting grace. End quote. Deep waters were there always to pass before bills, demanding such large appropriations, present and prospective, could be carried triumphantly through. To persuade a party so bent on illustrating its tender sympathy with its constituents' hatred of tax bills as to forbid so much as lighting the lamps in the portico of the state capitol, to persuade such a party of the wisdom and mercy of the act of lighting and feeding forever after with costly oil, a lamp of sacrifice which has ever since burned with such beneficent ray as the Raleigh Insane Asylum, was no task to be accomplished without a world of anxiety and toil. Towards this great feat, she was effectively helped by the eloquent plea of Honorable James C. Dobbin, made as has already been stated, in response to the entreaty of his dying wife that he would champion the cause of the woman who had so tenderly cared for her. By the close, therefore, of December 1848, Miss Dix could enthusiastically write to her friend Mrs. Hare, quote, Rejoice, rejoice with me. Through toil, anxiety, and tribulation, my bill has passed, one hundred and one eyes, ten nays. I am not well, though perfectly happy. 
I leave North Carolina compensated a thousandfold for all labors by this great success. End quote. The following autumn and winter of 1849 found Miss Dix in Montgomery, Alabama, arduously engaged in trying to carry the state legislature. There, after a beginning made under the most favorable auspices, a series of delays and disappointments set in, finally brought to a climax by the conflagration of the state capitol. A panic in favor of retrenchment at once ensued, and the year's work seemed lost. Sadly, but courageously, she was forced to write to her friend Miss Heath, quote, my affairs were in full tide of prosperous action when the disastrous conflagration of the state capital threw everything into indescribable confusion. I have determined, as an adjournment is had till New Year, to save time by going at once to fulfill some objects at Selma, Mobile, New Orleans, and Jackson, Mississippi. I have recollected amidst these perplexities that God requires no more to be accomplished than he gives time for performing, and I turn now more quietly to my work up the hill difficulty. The summit is cloud-capped, but I have passed amidst dark and rough ways before, and shall not now give out." End quote. By the opening of the new session, however, January 1st, 1850, she was back again at her post in Montgomery. Once again was the hill difficulty to prove insurmountable. The state was in no mood for increased appropriations, and though stanch friends stood by her, the conflagration had given an impulse to the cry for retrenchment which even her energy could not make head against. In a weary hour she wrote her friend Mrs. Hare, quote, I think, after this year, I shall certainly not suffer myself to engage in any legislative affairs for a year. I can conceive the state of mind which this induces to be like nothing save the influences of the gambling table, or any games of chance, on such unlooked-for and often trivial balances do the issues depend. There is just one chance in a hundred that my bill will pass. End quote. And yet, spite of her feeling of disappointment, Miss Dix's faithful and untiring work had really carried the day in Alabama. Not during the session of 1850 was her bill to triumph, but in that of 1851 to 52 it went successfully through. Touched with her devotion, the Alabama State Medical Association now came to the rescue appointing a special committee to follow up the strong impressions already made, and placing at the head of this committee Dr. Lopez, a man after her own heart, who labored with such earnestness through the ensuing session that an appropriation of $100,000 was finally secured, and after this was exhausted, one of $150,000 more. Scarcely a month, however, after the weary and baffled letter in which Miss Dix had compared the anxieties and vicissitudes of legislative affairs with the influences of the gambling table, there came a happy turn in the wheel of fortune through the course of events in the neighboring state of Mississippi, which called out the following rejoicing letter to Miss Heath, quote, Twenty-four majority in the Senate and eighty-one in the House was something of a conquest over prejudice and the positive declaration and determination not to give a dime. Therefore, to give fifty thousand dollars and three million brick, besides the farm and foundations of the structure, is no small matter. 
great was my surprise at the really beautiful vote of thanks, first by the legislature, then by the commissioners, and finally by the citizens. Legislature, commissioners, and citizens alike insisted on naming the hospital after me. End quote. This last tribute of honor to her name, however, Miss Dix, on this, as on so many other occasions, positively refused. The speaker, in reply, informed her that, in deference to her views, the legislature had agreed to suspend immediate action, but added that that was all Mississippians would concede on this point to one who belonged to the country and was honored by all. The letter, written from some unnamed point on the Mississippi, from which the last extract is made, contains likewise a picturesque sketch illustrative of the peculiar exposures to which travelers on river boats were in those days subjected. Quote, we have on our boat, she says, both cholera and malignant scarlet fever. To add to our various incidents, a quantity of gunpowder was left in charge of a raw Irishman, who was directed at a given time and place to load the cannon and fire a salute. One hundred miles away from the point to be so honored, Pat, thinking the bore of the cannon as good a place of deposit for the powder as he could find, rammed it down. Then, discovering that the rain had wet the bore, he ran with alacrity to the furnace and returned with a burning stick, thrusting it in after the powder to dry up the water. This it effected, but not this alone, for of course the powder exploded, and certain portions of Pat's arm and hand were sent in advance toward the distant city. End quote. Who took care of poor Pat and dressed his wounds, the letter does not say. Ten to one, it was Miss Dix herself. The last thing with truth that could have been urged in her case was the so common reproach brought against philanthropists that, while full of tenderness for humanity in the mass, they are indifferent towards individuals. Or, as Dean Swift wittily puts it, that while loving the race, they do not care a haypenny for Tom, Dick, and Harry. Indeed, there exists an amusing letter from her lifelong friend, Dr. William G. Elliot of St. Louis, in which he comments on the unerring instinct with which, on boarding a train or a steamboat, she was sure, by a kind of freemasonry, to detect any case of illness poverty, or bereavement, and before long to be found ministering to it. The letter, though written at a later date, and at the time when Dr. Elliot was himself engrossed in completing the endowment of Washington University, St. Louis, that monument to his own persistency and self-sacrifice, certainly lights up the subject in hand by an individual contribution to New Testament interpretation, not to be found in any of the standard commentaries. Quote, I often think, he says, of your thoughtful care of that forlorn woman in the cars. It was a rebuke to me. I can spend or be spent for an institution or for humanity. But if I had seen the certain man between Jerusalem and Jericho, I should have been the priest or Levite. Perhaps they were at work for something on a large scale and could not see the small, or perhaps they had no relish for charity and detail. End quote. In fact, while on this especial subject, it may be well enough to note here that so numerous were the instances Miss Dix encountered on trains and steamboats, 
not merely of the sufferings, but of the follies and perversities of human beings, that, dignified and reticent as was her habitual demeanor, she at times would speak her mind with a freedom that created a marked sensation. Once, for example, three young ladies, dressed in the extreme of fashion, boarded the train. It was at that especial epoch in the natural history of woman which may be accurately enough described as the wasp waist period, when in humble imitation of that selected insect, to reduce to the last degree of tenuity the slight film of connection needful for self-preservation between the thoracic and the abdominal regions of the human body seemed to many young maidens the chief end of man. The fashion was one Miss Dix held in peculiar abhorrence, her own studies in physiology having apparently inspired her with an intellectual respect so profound for the functions of hearts, lungs, liver, and digestive organs, that she could no more tolerate the thought of their cruel imprisonment in the steel cage of a binding corset than that of the outraged insane in their own cages. Now it so happened that on a seat not far from the part of the car in which the three fashionably dressed young ladies had placed themselves was a fourth young woman whose ideas on the subject of the human waste evidently coincided more nearly with the antiquated and exploded notions of the Venus of Milo. She became at once an object of ridicule to her more advanced sisters, who talked her over with an unrestrained freedom which excited indignation on all sides. "'Better be dead than out of fashion,' finally exclaimed one of the three. Miss Dix could endure their insolence no longer, and suddenly rising, interposed with her rich, impressive voice, "'My dear, if you lace as tight as you do now, you will not long have the privilege of the choice. You will be both dead and out of fashion.' To return, however, from this digression to the series of campaigns Miss Dix was through those nine years engaged with, principally in the southern and middle states of the Union. It had become her habit to work from the late autumn till advancing spring in the south, and when the heat grew too overpowering, to transfer her field of activity to more northern regions. As far to the northeast as Halifax, Nova Scotia, and St. John, Newfoundland, do we accordingly in these times find her. In Halifax especially is she now, year by year, bending all her energies toward the foundation of a cruelly needed asylum. While zealously seconded in her efforts by the Bishop of Nova Scotia, it was, however, to the untiring courage and devotion of Honorable Hugh Bell that final success was chiefly due. Among the correspondence left behind at the death of mystics, the letters of this humble-minded but, in every fiber, noble man afforded a beautiful picture of a true friendship in the spirit. Of great practical ability and thoroughly versed in political matters, a tendency, nonetheless, to despondency was a marked characteristic of the man, and to Miss Dix, and the sacred work she had put into his hands, he felt he owed a happier trust in God and faith in human nature. His moral admiration for her was unbounded. Again and again he attests how her inspiration had made life worth living to him, through lifting it to a disinterested aim. She, he said, was Minerva, he, Telemachus. As, therefore, one sure test of the vitality of any mind is its power to raise up a host of co-workers, infused with its own faith and will, 
it is here to the point to present a few extracts from these letters of Honorable Hugh Bell. Only through the medium of such living records can any fit idea be gained alike of the discouragements attendant on such work as Miss Dix was engaged on, in communities as yet insensible to its real import, and of the nature of the happy spiritual relations established between lofty minds made one by a common humane aim. Quote, Halifax, Nova Scotia, April 3rd, 1850. I am sorry to have to inform you that the result of your efforts and of our high expectations of the action of our legislature has ended in a mere compliment to you. However just and however sincere, the one thing needful would, I am sure, have been much more satisfactory to you. I fear that even the thunders of Demosthenes would scarcely disturb our apathy and insensibility respecting such subjects. End quote. Quote, Halifax, Nova Scotia, August 10th, 1850. As to the final accomplishment of our object, although I must approve of the purpose never to abandon a post undertaken in a good cause, I am almost like the Quaker who said to his traveling companion, when in circumstances of danger, I must go by thy faith, for mine is gone. If there be a final triumph, I shall, if I live, rejoice to join in the song of victory and to aid in weaving the chaplet around your brows. Ridiculous as this may sound now, who can tell what may yet be done? Impossible seems to be now an obsolete term. We live in an age of wonders. End quote. Quote, Halifax, Nova Scotia, July 5th, 1853. I thank you, my noble-minded and generous friend, for your kind, encouraging letter. Your vigorous, unwavering faith and your firm, unflinching resolution shame away doubt and inspire confidence. With you by my side, like Minerva, in the shape of mentor, by the side of Telemachus, even I would become courageous. We shall conquer yet. Do you not inwardly chuckle as I say we? Is it something like the bellows blowers and the organists didn't we do well? Never mind, if the well only comes, no matter about the we. End quote. Quote. Halifax, Nova Scotia, August 4th, 1853. I called on the Admiral, or rather at the Admiralty House, to leave my card for the Earl of Ellsmore, as in duty bound. The old Admiral met me at the door very cordially, shook hands, and then said, Where is Miss Dix? I replied, She left for home yesterday. She has been to Sable Island and back. He exclaimed in true sailor style, She's a gallant woman. End quote. Quote, Halifax, Nova Scotia, 1853. The session of our legislature closed yesterday, and I hasten to inform you that something has been done for the object of our long and earnest effort. Fifteen thousand pounds, equal to sixty thousand dollars, has been appropriated, with the condition that five thousand pounds more be subscribed. They have made me, officially, the acting and chief commissioner. How strangely and unexpectedly are things brought about. I am bound in gratitude to be thankful that Providence has blessed my humble efforts in behalf of our afflicted fellow beings. But I feel myself so totally inadequate as to knowledge of the right and best way of proceeding 
that I shrink from it, and wish it were in abler hands. You see how much I need your aid. May I expect to have it? I cannot but think how much stronger your faith was than mine. You always said it would be done. I confess that I had given up hope during my life. End quote. A few instances like these will suffice in the attempt to record the series of moral successes achieved by Miss Dix during these nine memorable years. Tedious to the reader would it be to enlarge on them separately. Suffice it to say that each succeeding year witnessed the original foundation of one or more state asylums and was marked by public votes of thanks from fresh legislatures and by letters of congratulation of the tenor of that in which Dr. R. S. Stewart of Baltimore wrote her after the passage of her bill in Maryland, quote, Most cordially do I congratulate you on your success, because I am well convinced that no other means than yours could have produced this result. I am glad you have one more leaf added to the chaplet that so honorably adorns your brow. End quote. Of a like tenor, letters by the score from governors, members of legislatures, and associations of physicians were now continually pouring in upon her from all quarters of the Union. We can do nothing without you, was the universal cry. Her vitalized personality withdrawn, every movement languished, while, as soon as she was again upon the spot, the stragglers hurried back, the ranks closed up, the leaders headed the columns, and victory ensued. Confidently may it be asserted that on no other page of the annals of purely merciful reform can be read such a series of moral triumphs over apathy, ignorance, and cruel neglect, as were in that space of time won by Miss Dix. Besides the memorable list of previous successes, there might now have been emblazoned on her battle flag of humanity the names of Lexington, Kentucky, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, Indianapolis, Indiana, Jacksonville, Illinois, Fulton, Missouri, Nashville, Tennessee, Jackson, Louisiana, Raleigh, North Carolina, Jackson, Mississippi, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, District of Columbia, Halifax, Nova Scotia. It is easy to repeat these names, harder to make each one of them summon before the mind's eye the buildings, farms, pleasure grounds, skilled and humane supervision of a great institution, taking into its protecting arms of mercy such numbers of the most wretched and abandoned of earth's creatures. Still, even in the case of the most sluggish imagination, it cannot be difficult to rise in partial sympathy, at least, with the enthusiasm with which, on the occasion of still another success in South Carolina, that profound and noble-minded scholar, Dr. Francis Lieber, wrote to Miss Dix from Columbia, South Carolina, quote, Te deum laudamus. How do you feel? Like a general after victory? Oh, no, much better. Like people feel after a shipwreck? You are saving thousands, and not by one act, but by planting institutions and institutions of love. And when man does that, he comes nearest to his God of love and mercy. Duis tibi lux, F.L. Indeed, at this period, Miss Dix herself looked with a not unnatural wonder, mingled with devout humility, on the unexampled success of her career. She rarely spoke of her own achievements, but in a letter of June 1850 to her friend, Mrs. Rathbone of Liverpool, England, 
there occur a few sentences which lift the veil of her habitual reserve and admit one within the sanctuary of her inmost feeling. Quote, Shall I not say to you, dear friend, that my uniform success and influence are evidence to my mind that I am called by providence to the vocation to which life, talents, and fortune have been surrendered these many years? I cannot say, Behold now this great Babylon which I have builded, but, Lo, O Lord, the work which thou gavest thy servant, she does it, and God in his benignity blesses and advances the cause by the instrument he has fitted for the labor. End quote. After the record of such a series of achievements, and before farther proceeding with the story of the still more remarkable triumphs which awaited the subject of this biography in the future, it seems natural to pause here a moment to try in some way to grasp the secret of her power. Notwithstanding all her virile forces of intellect and will, the ideas entertained by Miss Dix on the subject of woman's work or woman's sphere of influence in the world were at this period, and indeed remain to the end of her life, of a character that would in these days be regarded by many superior women as decidedly conservative and of the old school, and yet in them lay the hiding place of the peculiar power she exerted in the southern and southwestern states, then ruled by an ideal of womanhood which had in it many elements handed down from the days of chivalry. Distinctly and emphatically, Miss Dix believed in woman's keeping herself aloof and apart from anything savoring of ordinary political action, as equally from every desire of material reward, whether in the way of money, place, or personal distinction. She must be the incarnation of a purely disinterested idea appealing to universal humanity irrespective of party or sect. At once a voice of tender supplication for the outcasts of the earth and their impassioned champion, capable of flaming with sacred fire. From large numbers of the politicians with whom she was necessarily brought into close contact, carefully as she hid the feeling from them, she yet shrank with a distinct moral repulsion. They are, she declared, the meanest and lowest party demagogues, shocking to say, the basest characters. By nature, she herself was, as one of her truest and most admiring friends said of her, aristocratic in every fiber. That is, in the original and more literal signification of the word as emphasizing faith in the divine hierarchy of intellect, heart, and conscience. Instinctively she craved and enjoyed intercourse with the finer and higher types of humanity, and drew back in sensitive aversion from every shape of ugliness, vulgarity, and self-seeking. Anthophila, the flower lover, was the Greek name with which, in those days, the eminent publicist, Dr. Francis Lieber, usually addressed her, and the name held true not merely of her love of flowers, but of everything characterized by social grace and refinement, by intellectual distinction, or by beauty of manners, spirit, and character. This side of her nature she had literally to crucify in a great part of her work, the Christ-like sense of compassion for human misery and of fiery indignation at the infliction of pain, an intense intellectual revolt from the brute irrational chaos of society which, under the light that had now broken, permitted such evils longer to exist, these, together with a daily yearning supplication, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven, 
were the only powers that nerved her to tolerate perpetual contact with degraded forms of misery and with a class of public characters many of whom were offensive to her through and through the natural result of this position early adopted and inflexibly adhered to by mystics was that especially among the ardent and impulsive peoples of the southern and southwestern states she gradually came to be regarded as a being apart from ordinary humanity very striking is it to turn over old files of tennessee georgia alabama and other southern newspapers, and read the glowing language in which they speak of the arrival within their borders of that gracious lady, that crown of human nature, that chosen daughter of the republic, that angel of mercy. On issues aside from her own self-consuming passion, she was careful to antagonize no one. Even on the slavery question, then becoming ever more hotly agitated, and awakening the fiercest hatred against all who belonged to the North, she persistently held her peace. What her view and action on the subject would have been, had she been left to the natural impulses of her own merciful heart, may be readily enough inferred. But she entered the South under bonds to keep the peace. Bonds not personal and selfish, but disinterested and sympathetic. One word from her lips in the way of the mildest reproval even, and every state south of the Susquehanna would have been sealed to her. Her word would have affected nothing, but it would have left thousands of forlorn wretches to languish without a champion in cells and chains, in filth and misery. No, she felt she had her own God-appointed work, so vast and far-reaching in its consequences that her feeble hands could but grasp its outermost skirts. In a very literal sense, poor Simmons' God had become passionately identified with her own God, and the prayers of agony shrieked from his dreary abode now filled her ears till she could hear no other cry. A letter of Dr. Francis Lieber, written as far back as November 5, 1846, from Columbia, South Carolina, gives expression to his own sense of the unique, moral, and imaginative position occupied by Miss Dix in the work to which she had consecrated her life. Quote, you as a woman, he said, have a great advantage over us, for with the firmness, courage, and strength of a male mind, you unite the advantage of a woman. Savarin, at the head of the French police, told Napoleon, with reference to Madame de Cuyler, that he could not master the woman. This was in a bad cause, but the same holds good in a good. You do not excite the same opposition, no one can suspect you of ambitious party views, and you can dare more because people do not dare to refuse you many a thing they would not feel ashamed of refusing to any one of our sex. Therefore, take care of yourself. End quote. How strong indeed was the impression at this period exerted by her personality on a mind of the range of Dr. Lieber's is manifest in the language, one of his own letters to George S. Hillard of Boston. Quote, Miss Dix has been with us again and leaves us tomorrow. She is greatly exhausted, and I always fear to hear that she has succumbed somewhere in a lonely place. What a heroine she is. May God protect her. Over the whole breadth and length of the land are her footsteps, and where she steps, flowers of the richest odor of humanity are sprouting and blooming as on an angel's path. I have the highest veneration for her heart and will and head. End, quote. End of chapter 13.
Chapter 14 of Life of Dorothea Lynde Dix by Francis Tiffany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The Burden Growing Heavier. Among the inevitable burdens now precipitated on the shoulders of a woman as frail in body as Miss Dix, no slight additional and one grew out of the fact that so great was the confidence reposed in her practical ability that again and again, after having, at a great tax on her strength, carried a bill through a legislature, she was farther urged to shoulder the responsibility of selecting a fit site for the projected asylum, and of deciding on the character of the buildings to be erected. It was a task she was unwilling to decline, for in the widespread ignorance prevailing in those days, she clearly saw how easily the successful working of a hospital might be made or marred by the nature of its location or its plan of construction. In fact, a hundred questions had to be raised and wisely answered. Was the soil wet or dry? Was it adapted to furnish the patients with fit outdoor work? Was there an abundant supply of pure water? Was there due variety of sunshine and shade? Was the location easily accessible by rail or water for the delivery of fuel and provisions? Finally, were the surroundings attractive and the scenery of a character to minister through its charm to a mind diseased. All these were problems demanding careful observation, and to the end of wisely solving them, Miss Dix kept herself in constant touch with the class of exceptionally able experts who, as superintendents, were now steadily evolving the plans for which a period of many years were to make the American insane asylums the model asylums of the civilized world. As early as the date in 1845 of her success in securing the foundation of a hospital at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Mr. James Leslie had written her, quote, you may rest assured that to Mr. Trago, as to all the other commissioners, your wishes on the subject of site and buildings will be law. He declared that no man nor woman other than yourself, from Maine to Louisiana, could have passed the bill under the discouraging circumstances with which you had to contend. End quote. Of the delight indeed she at first took in the additional labor thus imposed on her, she writes in a spirit of fairly girlish exuberance to her friend, Miss Heath, quote, My farm is much liked, and it would not be surprising if I should throw up a tabernacle inwoven with green branches and count the bricks as they are placed one upon another till the fabric be complete, End quote. To the dew and freshness of the early morning, however, there inevitably succeeds the heat and burden of the day, and this contrasting experience Miss Dix was destined to encounter in many trying ways as time wore on. A site once judiciously chosen for the real end in view, then too often began the worst tug of war. As a rule, Real estate transactions react hardly more feliciously in bringing out the higher attributes of human nature than, as is traditionally asserted, does the trading of horses. Miss Dix naturally wanted the best procurable site for the benefit of the patients. The owner of the site wanted the best procurable price for his own benefit. Miss Dix did her best to ignore all local questions of the town or county that was to be pecuniarily helped by the establishment of an asylum within its borders. 
the town or county, on the contrary, did its best to have this made the first consideration. Nor was this all. Rich proprietors of country seats, with stronger prejudices against madhouses than even against pauper burial fields, banded together with all the power of wealth and influence to keep every such institution out of their neighborhoods. Thus continually was she brought into sharp collision with some of the most distasteful features in human nature. In the state of Maryland, for example, she, on this last especial score, found herself subjected to very rude and offensive treatment at the hands of certain wealthy landowners. So high, however, was the respect in which she was held, and so dignified, even while immovable as a rock, was her demeanor, that here, as elsewhere, a reaction set in when it was seen how disinterestedly she stood for the cause of mercy while her opponents stood solely for considerations of personal selfishness. Thus, from Annapolis, Maryland, her stanch friend, Honorable Thomas Donaldson, was soon able to write her, quote, There is a soul of goodness in things evil, and you have reason to thank the malice of your opponents for the substantial aid which they have given to the cause you advocate. The attack of blank, coming from a masked battery too, has raised you up friends that before were opponents, and has added the impulse of indignation to the cool convictions of your friends. The hospital never was so strong in the legislature of Maryland. The letter of Tickle Wallace printed in the appendix of the report, is really admirable, and it tells with great effect here. Every sentence cuts as cleverly and as cleanly as the Saladin's sword. End quote. At times, nonetheless, there grew out of these selfish and sordid complications incidents so honorable to human nature and so strikingly illustrative of the persuasive moral eloquence of the subject of this biography that it is a delight to record them. Such a one is the following. No one who has ever visited the hospital for the insane of the Army and Navy at Washington, D.C., could have set foot within its grounds without exclaiming, this is the ideal site for an asylum. Situated at the junction of two broad and noble rivers, the Potomac and the East Branch, commanding a superb view by land and water, gently sloping on all sides from its highest elevation so as to secure perfect drainage, and embracing within its bounds the most varied charm of wood and pasture, it seems to unite every conceivable advantage. Now, at the date of the passage by Congress, in 1852, of an appropriation for founding an asylum for the insane of the Army and Navy, this beautiful domain was the private property of Mr. Thomas Blagden, and in carefully examining the whole country surrounding Washington, Dr. John H. Nichols, who had labored indefatigably toward the passage of the bill, had made up his mind that there was no other site at all comparable with it. Mr. Blagden, however, turned a deaf ear to every proposition on the part of Dr. Nichols to buy it. The estate had become endeared to him through the exceptional beauty of its situation, and was, moreover, the especial pride of his wife and daughters. Besides, the full amount appropriated by Congress for the purchase of a site was but $25,000, and on no consideration, Mr. Blagden insisted 
would he part with the property at less than forty thousand dollars one day after having exhausted every personal effort and thoroughly depressed in spirits dr nichols went in to see miss dix there is nothing more to be done he exclaimed we shall have to give the matter up and it is the finest sight for a hospital in the world miss dix listened without excitement and then replied in her usual quiet tone we must try what can be done seeking a personal interview with mr blagden so earnestly and movingly did she reason with him to surrender for the future good of thousands of his suffering fellow creatures what was so precious indeed to him and his family but to one household only, that the appeal proved irresistible, and he gave her his promise of the estate at the amount appropriated by Congress. Nonetheless, the parting with it cost him a fearful wrench, for on Dr. Nichols calling on him the next day, with the requisite papers to sign, Mr. Blagden was found walking the room to and fro, weeping and wringing his hands in a half-hysteric condition. I don't want to part with it, he kept reiterating. It is dear to me and dear to my family, but I won't break my word to Miss Dix. I won't break my word. I told her she should have it and she shall have it. Such scenes as this do honor to human nature. Indeed, it would be hard to instance a more beautiful tribute to the power of consecrated womanhood than is embodied in the following letter, so simple, hushed, and awestruck in its tone, sent to Miss Dix by Mr. Blagden, the evening of the day on which she had thus closed in, in Jacob's angel wrestle with his deepest nature. Quote, Washington, November 13th, 1852. Dear Madam, Since seeing you today, I have had no other opinion, and Mrs. B. also, than that I must not stand between you and the beloved farm, regarding you as I do, as the instrument in the hands of God to secure this very spot for the unfortunates whose best earthly friend you are, and believing sincerely that the Almighty's blessing will not rest on nor abide with those who may place obstacles in your way. With Mrs. Blagden's and my own most friendly regards, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Thomas Blagden. End quote. Onerous and exacting as were the responsibilities thus imposed on Miss Dix through the appeals now constantly made to her by officials of the many states in which she had secured appropriations for asylums, to assume the further task of advising with the commissioners on all matters of selection of sites and plans of construction, still even these grave burdens were perhaps exceeded in weight by another class of duties soon inevitably thrust upon her what had she really been bringing about through this series of unexampled legislative successes nothing less than the actual creation within the United States of the conditions for the foundations and development of a great school of trained experts in the treatment of insanity. Before those ten or twelve years of rapid Napoleonic victories, there had existed, except in a few scattered places, neither the call nor the opportunity for practically enlisting and deploying this especial order of medical talent. Now fast grew up a wide demand for it, a great school of practice in which to acquire and exercise the requisite knowledge and skill. The attention of large numbers of able medical minds was thus turned in a new direction 
and solicited to a new field. Who should be superintendents, assistant physicians, stewards, attendants, and nurses in all these fast springing up asylums? On wise and judicious appointments hung the whole success of the new undertaking. What more natural, then, than that in these as yet inexperienced states, governors and legislatures should turn for counsel to the woman whose commanding moral genius had summoned into being so many new institutions. Steadily, the amount of patronage placed in her hands grew in volume, and here her remarkable judgment of character and capacity revealed itself in its full strength. It is the responsible privilege of a biographer to go through an immense mass of papers, the contents of which are of too private a character to be made known to the public. Perfectly allowable, however, is it to say here that a list so large could be drawn up of men later on achieving a national reputation as authorities on insanity who in these and subsequent years owed their appointments solely to the recommendation of Miss Dix, that the number and character of the names on it would awaken widespread surprise. Very rich was life now becoming to Miss Dix in human relationships, which in a measure relieved the strain put upon her by the more arduous and painful side of her work. Her range of acquaintance with the best men and women in all parts of the land had grown to be immense, and homeless herself, she was everywhere welcomed under their roofs. She had filled life with new zest to many, who but for her leadership would have found no avenue of usefulness open to them. And as the nature of her work involved the enlistment of the largest possible number of co-workers, to help add attraction to the at first bare and unhomelike asylum wards, she suffered no chance to pass of stimulating them to contributions of all kinds. Even on the children of the various homes she visited, she never failed to impress the idea of how much they could do in aid of the blessed cause old toys, puzzles, music boxes, nodding Chinese mandarins, collections of minerals, seaweeds, pressed flowers, butterflies, eggs, bird's nests. Nothing she showed them would come amiss in the way of amusing poor demented patients and turning their minds away from their melancholy broodings numberless the prized collections that under the spell of her persuasive eloquence were thus surrendered by little boys and girls as equally numberless the juvenile tears that were shed after the spell of that eloquence was withdrawn and the instincts of the sweetness of private ownership revived in their little breasts amusing stories are to this day told by persons now well advanced in years of the miserly eagerness with which as boys and girls they secreted days ahead their precious treasures on the alarming news being revealed to them that miss dix was expected in the house indeed it may be seriously questioned whether sometimes a deep-rooted repugnance to charity and all its works was not thus lodged in certain of their minds through demands for a pitch of self-sacrifice beyond the immaturity of view as to the sacred claims of insanity usually prevalent at the age of six or eight. A simple impossibility was it that a character of the steady intensity and force of will, which alone rendered possible such a career as that of Miss Dix, should not at times have inspired a certain sense of awe. 
The pace at which great souls go takes away the breath of average mortals, and they cry out at the strain that is put on their feebler powers. And yet, in the way of illustration of how completely closer intercourse with her served to dispel this fear, the following letter from Mrs. Louisa J. Hall, widow of the late Reverend Edward B. Hall, D.D., of Providence, Rhode Island, gives a charming picture. The letter was written in answer to a request for any recollections she might feel inclined to furnish of the far-away days when she was brought into personal contact with Miss Dix. Quote, Cambridge, Mass., May 17, 1889. I think it was in 1844 that my husband came to me in the nursery and said Miss Dix was below. I declined going down, thinking she had merely called to consult him. No, she had come to stay all night and would like to see me in the nursery. I thought it an unceremonious proceeding, did not like a woman that went about a self-appointed critic, had heard that she was cross when she kept school, and I was a prejudiced woman, shame to me. She made her appearance, and one look at that calm, gentle face had its effect. Then only a word of ladylike apology in a sweet, low voice, and I began to feel the gift she had. I was mending my boy's socks, and she quietly took up one and began darning with a skillful hand, talking most pleasantly of the beautiful city of Providence and of some Boston minister we both knew. For two hours we sat together, and not one word about the insane or her mission, when I had anticipated that she would talk of nothing else. This foolish, obstinate conservative was conquered by the force of that beautiful, strong nature shining through a genuine womanhood. After dinner, she said to my husband, Now I am at your service and he immediately took her to see some persons interested in her work. She stayed some days with us, never introducing the subject, but ready to give information and tell us of facts that made us bless the day she was born and the day when she found what work the Lord had had for her. As I am a thorough woman, you must let me speak of her dress. She traveled all over the country with a moderate valise in her hand and wearing a plain gray traveling dress with snow-white collar and cuffs. Her trunk was sent a week ahead with the necessary changes of linen, etc., and one plain black silk dress for special occasions. Neatness in everything indicated her well-directed mind and my acquaintance with her helped me on the upward way from extreme conservatism. End quote. These opposing sides of the impression made on others by Miss Dix, the impression on the one hand of a certain rigid inflexibility, a certain self-withdrawn and awe-inspiring element in her nature, and on the other, of a winning sweetness when the fountains of feeling were broken up from within, were inevitably felt by all who came in contact with her, and were never to the end of life thoroughly harmonized in her nature. Sometimes the one, sometimes the other, stood out separate. On other occasions they were fused in a strong and gracious unity. Her moral will aroused, and at the forefront, she was adamant. To have Miss Dix suddenly arrive at your asylum, said the eminent Dr. Isaac Ray of Providence, and find anything neglected or amiss, was considerably worse than an earthquake. Not that she said anything on the spot, 
but one felt something ominous suspended in the very air. Then again, her sensibilities touched. She was overflowing with tenderness and compassion. Lifelong invalids testified to a power of uplifting sympathy in her, as of one over whom all the waves and billows had likewise gone, possessed by the rarest few. On the great occasions, however, when these opposing characteristics were molten together in the furnace of the sacred cause for which she alternately pled and flamed at the bar of public bodies, then truly she was irresistible. Thus one seems to be dealing with so many distinct personalities. Those who met her silent and uncommunicative, after the exhaustion of one of her legislative campaigns, passed judgment on her as self-centered and unsocial. Those who felt her soothing touch in the sick room called her a ministering angel. Those who beheld her organizing victory and riding triumphant over obstacles that would have disheartened the bravest hailed in her a modern Joan of Arc. This diversity of judgment, and one of the natural reasons for it, find striking expression in the following extract from a beautiful memorial tribute written for the Home Journal of New York by Mrs. S. C. P. Miller of Princeton, New Jersey, and first printed September 11, 1889. Quote, it was a long time before I could realize that she was indeed a woman having much in common with the rest of us. I saw her only when she was strong and self-collected, and believed that to be her normal condition. But there came a day when I got a new insight into her nature. I was in Richmond, and she, on a mission farther south, halted there, and sent a note for me to come and see her. I went to the hotel immediately, was ushered into her room, and there found such a Miss Dix as I had never dreamed of. Overstrain of mind and body, destroying her calm exterior and bearing away the support of her high purpose, had left her stretched upon a sofa, utterly weak, nervous, and tearful. Not a bit of the heroism was left. Only the tried woman of a type I knew full well. Amazed at her condition, I bent over her with a tenderness before unknown, and a new bond of sympathy was established between us. So strange is it, yet so true, that tears bring all women to the same level. End quote. And yet, when at the lowest point of physical prostration, Miss Dix could herself write to a friend, I shall be well enough when I get to Kentucky or Alabama. The tonic I need is the tonic of opposition. That always sets me on my feet. Among the many persons of distinction with whom, at this period of her career, Miss Dix came in intimate contact, was the once famous Swedish novelist, Frederica Bremer, then on a visit to the United States. Her self-suffering from exhaustion brought on by overwork and on the edge of utter collapse, Miss Bremer felt strongly drawn to the especial type of ministering angel whose life had been consecrated to the victims of nervous wreck. Of the various letters she addressed from point to point to her American friend, there are two or three which throw such light both on the impression made on her by the personality of mystics and on the nature of the far-reaching schemes of benevolent action outside of her own country, already engaging the ardent mind of the latter as to be well worthy of introduction here. Quote, Coney Island, near New York, August, 1850. 
There now she comes, heaping, burning, not coals, but flowers on my guilty head. Alas, dear Miss Dix, not so guilty as poor in carrying out by the hand what the heart and thought dictate. I am now about to start for my western journey, and am full of gratitude for the delightful memories that I have gathered both in the north and south from both man and nature. Not the least delightful of these is that of a moonlight evening on the shores of the Patapsco and the Chesapeake Bay, where I heard the story of a simple life beginning as the river before me from a little stream born of a heavenly fountain and widening, widening as it ran forth through the valleys and fields and cities to a large, rich water opening to mingle with the waters of the ocean and blessing and bearing fruit to every shore as it went along in the still night, looked upon alone by the clear light of heaven. That life and the river in the moonlight have become one image in my soul, and a bright and blessed spot it remains there, to be looked upon, to be enjoyed, many a time during the flying and trying years of life. End quote. In a second letter, however, written by Miss Brummer, November 2, 1850, from Cincinnati, Ohio, a cloud has come across the fair sky, and the writer is found taking decided stand against a project already shaping itself in Miss Dix's mind. The project, namely, that when she should have finished her immediate work in America through the successful foundation of asylums in the various states, she would seek a new field of labor in Europe and especially in those parts of it where the treatment of insanity was in the most backward condition. To Frederica Brummer, the idea of any good being affected in the way of awakening the people of Sweden to a sense of their duties toward any class of their own population by a foreigner, and above all, a foreigner entirely ignorant of the language, seemed wholly romantic. Her national pride took offense at the bare proposition, as equally did that of the Swedish nightingale Jenny Lind. Feebly, however, did she measure the heroic spirit and range of mind of the woman whose later career was so marvelously to illustrate the truth that God has made of one blood all the dwellers on the earth and that faith and love find easy flight over every barrier of sea, mountain, language, race, or religious creed. Still, Frederica Bremer's sensitiveness was natural enough to average restricted humanity. Only she forgot that the Chinese wall, to which she will be found alluding, dated back to an antiquated order of military defenses, regarded by her invincible friend as only fit to keep out Tartars. Quote, Cincinnati, Ohio, November 2, 1850. Sweden lacks neither goodwill nor means. What is wanted there is energy and impulse of will, and that, a foreigner unknown in the country, and herself not knowing its language and forms of government, could not give. Jenny Lind is right in that opinion. As things now stand, it would be easier for you to climb the Chinese wall than to work any good personally for the unfortunate insane in Sweden. But believe me, dear Miss Dix, what you have done what you are doing in America will, when properly disclosed, as it ought to be, and must be to Sweden, work more for a bettering of the insane asylums there than a gift of ten millions could in their behalf. The power of the idea, 
and the power of example are the great movers of our time and go from heart to heart, from land to land with electric shock. Most thankful am I, dear Miss Dix, for the interest you express for me and my health. Thank God, I am very well now. You certainly need more to take care of your health than I now of mine. But you are as a general on a battlefield and cannot care for life till the battle is over and victory won. May it be soon for you. End quote. In Miss Bremer's third letter, written the following year from the island of Cuba, she makes ample amends. All wounds of aggrieved national pride are now healed, and in a realm of free imagination, from which all prosaic obstacles of alien languages and forms of government are eliminated, she creates for Miss Dix an ideal utopia over which she shall be installed as queen. St. Amelia Estate, Cuba, March 17, 1851. If I had rule on earth, Cuba, this beautiful Antilles, should be transformed into a great maison de saint, a home for the sickly and feeble. There they should sit in their rocking chairs, under the palms and tamarinds, and breathe the delightful air of this island, which I cannot think was better in paradise, be caressed by the soft loving breeze, and drink in it, as in Olympian nectar, new health, new life. And you should be the queen here, and have a cabinet of ladies, kind and beautiful, such as I know several in the United States, who should chiefly officiate as nurses for the sick, as noble Valkyrias and healing goddesses for those slain or wounded in the battle of life. End quote. Not unlikely the majority of readers of this last letter would set down Frederica Bremer as a far more imaginative woman than Dorothea Lynde Dix. So widely is genuine constructive power of imagination confused with the activity of a mere dreamy fancy, that the number is legion who think a more vigorous exercise of the faculty divine demanded for the creation of an airy ideal utopia like this, than for first summoning before the mind's eye, and then substantializing and massive buildings and wide-ranging farms, parks, and gardens, the actual retreats from a harsh and cruel world which Miss Dix provided for such hosts of sufferers. In reality, the noble Valkyrius, of whom Frederica Bremer speaks, healing goddesses for those slain or wounded in the battle of life, were far more profoundly conceived than by herself, by the heroic woman to whom she wrote. She knew, out of stern experience, that the true Valkyries are fateful and awful powers, who must first stride the blast and sweep to the rescue through the din and shrieks of the battlefield, before they can think to reach and bear off in their arms to the Valhalla of rest, the fallen warriors trampled in dust and blood. End of chapter 14